Welcome to the June 23rd meeting of the Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board of Education. Superintendent, will you take the roll? Yes, Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Hoover? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Mr. Short? Here. Mr. Huey? Here. All are here, thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments for closed session items only? Seeing none, um, we will be adjourning to closed session to discuss student matters pursuant to section 48912 of the Education Code, Employer Employee Relations, pursuant to Section 54957.6 of the Government Code, Conference with Legal Counsel, pursuant to Government Code uh, uh, 54956.9, Conference with Real Property Negotiators, pursuant to Section 54956.8. Personnel matters pursuant to section 54957 of the government code. And finally, personnel matters related to um, uh, the, the annual performance evaluation of the superintendent pursuant to section 54957. Uh, I anticipate we will be back at six o'clock sharp. Uh, so we'll see you then. Thank you. We're adjourned.
right, welcome back from closed session. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you please stand and join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, and or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Public comments during board meetings are an important component of board engagement and transparency, and all written comments submitted to the board by 3 p.m. Day today uh, have been read. Per the Brown Act, the board is not allowed to enter into a two-way discussion on any matter that's not on the agenda. The superintendent will call roll for the board to acknowledge receipt of the electronic comments submitted by 3 p.m. today as it pertains to today's board meeting. Superintendent, please call the roll. Yes, Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Hoover. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Short. Here. Mr. Huey. Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is reporting out of closed session. Superintendent? Yes, the board took action in closed session. Uh, the board voted unanimously to approve a resignation and disciplinary settlement agreement for a district teacher. Pursuant to the agreement, the teacher will remain in paid status through October 14, 2022 for a total cost of approximately 25000 That's it. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to the adoption of the agenda. Um, before anybody motions it, um, I would request that the, when adopting the agenda that we move agenda item 11A to after agenda item 11C. So I'll move it. Okay. I'll second. That's noted. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Short and second by Mr. Clark, uh, superintendent. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to special presentations. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, this is really an, an honor and privilege for our board and our staff to be um, uh, granting this honorary diploma for Lieutenant Colonel Bob Burns, who is with us and joining us this evening. I do have a biography that I'd like to share. And then we're going to ask uh, Lieutenant Colonel Burns to come forward and we're going to grant him with an honorary diploma from Cordova High School. Robert George Thomas Burns, born January 2nd, 1926 in, in Scantron, Pen Scranton, Pennsylvania, feeling compelled to assist in the war effort December 16th, 1943, at 17 years old, Bob left high school and joined the United States Army. He found himself in the European theater of World War II. In 1946, at an American Red Cross dance, Bob met a young Estonian lady, Holga. She spoke five languages and served the U.S. Army as an interpreter, supporting the war effort. She'd been held as a POW by the Germans for three years. A short time later, in 1946, they married. With no honeymoon time available, they made do. After a one-hour honeymoon in an Army field ambulance, Bob had to ship out. In 1947, Bob Jr. was born. <laughs> <laughs> the Korean War started, and Bob was now a warrant officer. In 1952, with a stellar service record, the squared-away soldier without a high school diploma was given a battlefield commission. Second Lieutenant Bob Burns fulfills his duties and leads his troops into another conflict. As the Korean War comes to and ends, he finds himself at the Presidio in San Francisco, then a few years at Fort Greeley in Delta Junction, Alaska. In 1964, the Army needed Bob in Vietnam. 
After the Vietnam War, it was time for Bob's final duty station, Fort Ord in California. After serving in World War II, Korea and Vietnam, receiving countless medals, citations, and two bronze stars, it's time to start a new chapter. In 1972, Bob is now a lieutenant colonel, and it was his time to retire. That completes his bio, but it doesn't complete an important piece of Bob's history, and that's that he was a Cordova Lancer. And at the time that he um, uh, signed on with uh, to fight in, in his first uh, war effort, he left before he received his diploma at Cordova High School. So it really is an honor and a privilege for our board to grant Lieutenant Colonel Robert Burns with an honorary diploma from Cordova High School. And we would like to have all of our board come down and um, grant this and bestow this honor upon you. It's really our privilege to be able to honor you today. So with that, a round of applause and... Thing. We're all here. We're not going anywhere. Okay. We're going to talk. I apologize for this today. No, no apologies. It don't happen. But it does. <laughs> Give me a clean this. I'm going to wipe my shoe off there. Here. I did already. Oh. Yeah, I did. Okay. I got your shoe already. All right. Then. Thank you. Are you I'm sorry. Oh, you're welcome to come on up to. You want me to get up there? <laughs> It was uh, a very special honor for us to be able to uh, award you the, the Cordova High School uh, graduation diploma. Thank you for appreciated very much too, Ransom. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Do we have any uh, any remarks? Anybody else wants to? No, no. I, okay. I I think I said enough. I mean, I've known uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, Burns for I think about seven years you've been giving me trouble ever since I showed up to that veterans celebration especially with me being an Air Force vet you always gave us Air Force guys a, a hard time but I just appreciate I appreciate all you do too I thank you very much well I mean just you know doing what you did and a sacrifice for our country and um, being an example uh, for all of us enlisted servicemen, I just really appreciate everything that you've done for our country, and I appreciate you, sir. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, 
Uh, any additional special presentations? Not this evening. Thank okay. You. All right. Uh, we will be moving on to public comment. Um, public comment uh, is the period of time where anything that is not agendized on uh, today's uh, agenda, maybe uh, uh, individuals may come up and speak. Uh, we will be enforcing a two-minute time limit uh, today. Uh, we have a very lengthy uh, board agenda, uh, so we'll have to keep it to two minutes. Um, uh, for individuals who are here to speak on um, agendized items, you will have an opportunity to speak when we get to that agenda item. So, uh, let's see here. All right, uh, we will start uh, with uh, Dan uh, McCrossan, uh, and followed uh, Dan will be uh, Lorette uh, Gaberman. I gotta follow that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did write out my comments. I'm a professional trumpet player, not a jazzer, so we like stuff written out. Uh, President Reed, uh, board members and Dr. Kaligian. Uh, my name is Dan McCross and I'm the music teacher at Mitchell Middle School and I have been for the past 20 years. I will begin my 21st year with FCUSD in August, but I've been looking around to see what my options are this year as I enter my 25th year of teaching. Just yesterday, I just found out that I could change districts and make considerably more money from at least two other districts in my area, one of which is much closer to my home in Rockland. See, I've been driving from Rockland to Rancho every day for the past 20 years, and with the price of gas being what it is, and I'm kind of weighing my options and looking to save money where I can. My wife is uh, retired and on a fixed income, so the price of everything goes up. I have to carefully budget. Looking at these other districts, the question arises, what's keeping me from doing this? Why do I not go to other districts? What's keeping me here in Folsom, Cordova? The answer, of course, is my students. I've spent 20 years building a successful music program at Mitchell, and I'm looking forward to a few more before I retire. I love my students, and I love the fact that I can share my passion for teaching and music with them. I'm sure if I went to another district, I could build another program with amazing students who are able to glean my passion for teaching, but it sure would be nice to finish my career with Folsom Cordova. What is missing is feeling valued from FCUSD. While I appreciate the sentiments that Dr. Kligan shares in her emails, when it comes to bargaining salary, it has always been a fight. Every year since I've been in this district, always a fight. I remember blue shirts, I remember green shirts. This shirt's red shirts. We've held signs out in front. We've held signs in our cars at the schools. And quite frankly, it's, it's exhausting. We're asking for a COLA, a substantial COLA, for all the years we didn't receive one, a substantial COLA to offset the exorbitant healthcare cons, costs, a substantial COLA to help with gas, groceries, housing, and everything else that has gone up last year. But mostly we're asking to be valued, to be valued not just with words. Please show us teachers we are valued and you will retain us for years. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Lorette Gaberman, followed by Stacy Alpe. Um, I'll take I your time. With my leg on top of everything else. Uh, I, just so the, the public's aware, um, I will, uh, 15 seconds after the last buzzer rings, I will start gently reminding folks to wrap it up. Thank you. Well, tonight, I would like to ask you to please indulge me as I put my teacher hat on and read a riddle to you that Abraham Lincoln once presented to his advisors. Quote, how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? Well, obviously, the answer is still four. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg, does it? 
President Lincoln knew something about false proclamations. He also knew that saying something emphatically with conviction, conviction and proclaiming it as truth doesn't make it truth. It's still a tale, no matter how you spin it. So here's the problem. Telling everyone that we don't have the funds capable of finally bringing salary and compensation up to a competitive rate with surrounding districts, it's just another tale. No matter how forcefully you proclaim it, it is so easy to research the true facts of all the windfalls of money the California districts are getting, and in particular, FCUSD. It is not an inability. The research has been done. It is your choice what to do with the monies. We know how many legs a dog has. I've got one right here. <laughs> I want to remind you also that teachers are responsible for everything that you have, for you even being on this board. Okay, your ability to have a place to live and the food on your table is because of teachers, because teachers truly do create every job in the world, even yours. I will end now with another quote. This one from Mark Twain. If you pick a dog up and make him prosperous, he will not bite you. It is the principal difference between a dog and a man. Stop biting the hand that feeds you before there's no one left and this district starves. I can teach it to you, but I can't learn it for you. Please do the right thing. I love Mark Twain quotes. He's, he's actually buried in my hometown, so. Uh, let's see, the next speaker is uh, St Stacy Albay, uh, followed by um, Uh, followed by Keaton Patel. Good evening. Um, at a previous meeting, I listened to Dr. Pease talk about the importance of representation in the classroom. I didn't really understand what she meant until my son had Miss G during summer session this year. His experience has been so positive and uplifting, much different from that of the last few school years, that I have to wonder if it's because he has a teacher who looks like him, who looks like me. You cannot continue to pay teachers less and expect the best. They'll leave. They'll pass up opportunities to teach here. They won't even apply. Here are some neighboring districts' cost of living adjustments going into the upcoming school years. Roseville Secondary Education Association, 8% plus benefits. Western Placer Teachers Association, 8.6%. West Sacramento Teachers Association, 7% over the next two school years plus benefits. Reminder that Rockland and Roseville districts already compensate their educators better than FCUSD does now. That didn't stop these districts from letting their teachers know before they left for summer how much they're appreciated and valued by their district and community. FCUSD teachers ended the year with a water bottle and several missing achievement pins. Could you imagine what giving a 12% raise to teachers in this district would do? That would be an 8% COLA and a 4% raise, a raise for FCUSD teachers. The first actual raise in over 20 years, we would make the news. <laughs> if you cannot find money in the budget for salary, consider giving teachers stipends for things like gas, classroom supplies, because remember, if it's pretty, if it has color, if it makes the room look nice, it was purchased with teacher salary, not by the school district, or even for snacks, because like the pretty classroom, the teacher is often purchasing snacks for students with salary money. FCUSD must put people ahead of programs. Programs will not entice teachers of color or teachers at all to seek employment here. Compensation and competitive benefits will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Keaton Patel followed by Casey Shingera. Keaton. I am pronouncing that correct, right? Keaton. Katan. Yeah, Katan. Katan. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Casey Shingera uh, followed by um, Marina uh, Gabel. Gable. Excuse me. Okay. Hello. 
why are we fighting for what should be common sense and a communication through action of who, not what, FCUSD values? Currently, inflation is at 8.5%, CPI is at 83 but we're only being offered 6.56. That alone is not sufficient. It's tantamount to a pay cut because we are losing purchasing power next year. When the value of the dollar changes, so too should compensation. We're not even asking for a raise. We're asking for an adjustment based on what, what purchasing power is. If the value of the dollar changes and it's weaker, we're going to need more to have the same purchasing power, and that's also what CPI gets into. If we can't do this, you're going to continue to lose excellent teachers. We just lost one of my colleagues this week, um, five years in. It's not worth it for her to stay here. It's not financially responsible. At present, we have 164 temps who are hired with many more vacancies of 320 current, high, current new hires. We have 35 retirements, 94 resignations, with more to come because we have until June 30th to make up our minds. We have to be competitive to our similar districts in pay and benefits, or we will continue to lose the very people who make FCUSD strong to these neighboring districts. Show us you value the people, the people behind the innovative instruction, behind the continued education, behind the pathways, behind the program, because people make the programs. People make the programs. And without our people feeling valued, this district has nothing. We are asking for an appropriate change to be competitive, to have our pay reflect the changing value of the dollar. That's all we're asking for at this point. It's not even a raise. So how is it not common sense? Thank you. Um, Marina uh, Gable followed by Alyssa Doyle. Hello. As a union steward, I'm happy to be here representing the classified staff of the Transportation Department. We are here in support of each other, teachers, aides, etc. Inflation is out of control. Cost of living is eating up our savings accounts. We are all essential and deserving of a wage raise. Thank you. Um, now I'm switching hats. I was told I can't be uh, representing the union when I'm talking as a parent slash community member um, and as staff. As a bus driver, my concerns are you know, what's happening in the news. Biden's latest um, <clears throat> announcement of the second pandemic is coming. Um, the continuation of masks, testing, and vax pressure, as well as COVID clinics on school campuses are issues. We fell for it once, never again. Science says the masks don't work. If masks are brought back by choice, it should be choice, an option, not a job requirement. Testing needs to stop for staff if vaxxed can get COVID and spread it, yet they do not get tested. Why? It is also a form of medical segregation when unvaxxed are forced to test as a job requirement when vaxxed people do not have to, to deal with the testing or the possible loss of employment. This is a reminder if legislation for employees and students to get the vax, the, the jab um, happens July of 2023. I'm hoping by then our district will lead and say no to the jab before it becomes an issue. From 2020 to 2022, 2 million children have left public schools in the U.S. Let's not f cause a force mass exodus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Alyssa Doyle, followed by Chelsea Bogan. Hi again. Welcome. <laughs> I'm Alyssa Doyle. I work at Cordova High School. I just hit my fifth pay step in our pay scale, which before taxes would have me making about $2,700 before taxes. I've been helping someone try and find some place to rent, so I've been looking at a lot of options. The lowest amount that I found was a one bedroom, one bath for $1,500. 
For an applicant, they wanted them to make three times the rent, have good credit, <coughs> sorry, and a good renter's history. Me, by myself, I could not make that. I don't even make two times the amount for that rent. In this situation, I could never qualify. Even if my credit score was perfect, they would never accept me. I'm grateful to have her in my life. She lets me stay at her house with my husband and child. I live in your school district. My child has to be on homeless services. That's not okay. I seen Chris Clark just this Christmas because I had to go to a Christmas pickup just so my child could have Christmas presents. And that's not okay. My mother-in-law offered me just last week to move to Nevada, which means I would have to put in my resignation. I don't want to leave, but with the pay like it is right now, it's a serious consideration. So I ask you, for me and everyone else in this room, for your classified and certified staff, please take this serious with the pay increases. Don't look at us and be like, no, please. Keep your staff that wants to be here. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Chelsea Bogan, followed by Mary Johnston. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Cleghan. Sorry for the disruptions tonight. This is the only way I could come and speak. My husband's working. Uh, I am here tonight to talk about the current negotiations, specifically regarding compensation. I'm a teacher in the district as well as a mother of a fourth grader and a community member. Six years as a teacher, I enjoy working in the community where I live, getting to know the students and families who are my neighbors. Coming into the district as a new employee six years ago, the salary even seemed impressive to me, although I did take a salary decrease coming from Twin Rivers to FCUSD in order to work close to home. But what is sad is that as impressive as our salary schedule is that reflects what I should earn, it's not what I actually bring home. If you counter in how much I pay out of each paycheck for my health benefits, my salary drops on the schedule by five steps. Instead of making the salary that a step 10 should make, what I actually see in my bank, what I actually have to spend on groceries, medicine, clothing, and mortgage for my family of five is what a step five teacher makes. It's like I'm paying a second mortgage out of each paycheck. That's seriously how high it is. And only the, the only benefit of that is that it's taken out before taxes. And this is even being all the way to the right on the schedule. There is no other way to maximize what I can earn within this district as a teacher beyond being recognized by the district for the hard work that we do, along with increasing responsibilities each year and compensating us not just through salary alone, but also by increasing the family benefits cap for our medical insurance. I guess I can sign up for worse health insurance that won't cover my children's needs in order to save money, but that's not really a benefit to me. A moment ago, I sarcastically said impressive salary schedule because if one compares our district to other districts in the area regarding salary compensation only, as well as salary plus medical compensation combined, we are far below other districts in this area who receive, receive the same exact funding that we do. Our medical premiums are higher, our salaries are lower. Why are they able to provide more for their teachers but FCUSD is not? Do they care more about their teachers? If that's not the case, then I feel like the right thing needs to be done as so many districts are doing around us and have been doing better compensation. Thank you for your time. All right. Um, yeah, that was tough. Yeah. Uh, Mary Johnson followed by Sean Copavi Cop Copavilla. Copavilla. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Good evening, board members. My name is Mary Johnston. I've been a math teacher at Folsom High for the last seven years. Thank you to Mr. Hoover for acknowledging that you received the email that I sent you all a few weeks ago regarding teacher salaries. I would like to recap what I said to ensure that all of you heard it, and I'm adding a bit to update it as well. 
Salary negotiations with the teachers union have been ongoing for the past few weeks, and while the district is more directly bargaining with the teachers, they do so at your explicit direction. I'm urging you to consider directing the district to increase their current offer beyond that of the budgetary COLA increase of 6.56%. The funding allocation for our district from the state will increase beyond the COLA amount from additional state funding, and I believe that teachers should receive a proportional amount of that additional funding as well, and even possibly a reallocation of current dollars in the budget in order to stay competitive with neighboring school districts. I know you all have seen some numbers, but I would like to share with you a comparison that I did for myself on how much extra I personally would earn from working in a neighboring district if I were to apply. On the higher end, there is Roseville, which already had a higher salary schedule and benefits package than Folsom Cordova, but who recently passed an 8% increase for next year with additional benefit funding as well. If I were to apply for their open math position that they have posted at West Park High School, I'd make an additional $9,217 next year, even after taking into account the current proposed FCSD increase of 6.5% and subtracting their two extra working days. I also would receive an extra $275 a month towards health benefit premiums, which amounts to another $3,300 annually. So by choosing it to work in our district next year, I'm missing out on a potential $12,517. This would similarly happen for the year after that and the year after that, and in the span of the next 27 years, if I continue to teach into this district until I am 60, which I hope to, that amounts to $910,529 if I were to invest that extra money in a retirement fund earning a conservative 6% annually, although not adjust adjusting for additional federal and state income taxes. This also would not take into account that higher ending salaries on the salary schedule increase pension calculations at retirement, which would increase my lifetime earnings even further. I had more to say, but I didn't realize it was gonna be three minutes, so Sean, Kevin Villa next. He's going to continue my letter. That's okay. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. I work with Mary at Folsom High School. She's the reason why I work at Folsom High School because of colleagues like her. To match Roseville in salary and benefits, FCSD would not just have to barely keep up with inflation, but give a true raise to the sound of a 22.9% increase to my salary this past year. I realize that the number is a huge stretch to our district's budget, and so I do not expect that amount, and I don't really think any of the other teachers here do either, but I urge you to look at balancing priorities to value your teachers more than the districts currently offer. Teachers are in high demand, and for employees who are struggling financially with their current salary, it is not too hard to find positions at other schools that pay better even districts like San Juan, where I personally would end up making about 100 less a month would be a financially better choice because for family health benefits, they contribute an additional 1,300 per month towards health care premiums or an, addi an additional 15,000 a year. <clears throat> there is money available in our budget to allocate towards increasing teacher and classified staff salaries. After a few weeks of negotiations, the district has not budged on their starting offer, besides adding on a one-time bonus payment of 2%. You can afford to make that extra 2%, an ongoing salary increase to at least match real inflation of 8.5% instead of the current 6.5% proposal. According to the district's own predictions, the unrestricted ending fund balance for the next three years is expected to increase even further from 45 to 53, and then $66 million, a portion of which is definitely available to be allocated as you see fit. While of course there are always concerns about the future of the economy and being conservative with the money is usually wise, there are also times when being too cautious can lead you to not making wise investments. I urge you to invest in your employees, which is essential to investing in the quality education and services for the students and families that you represent. Sorry, I went over your time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Just gonna go back one uh, more time. Is there a, a Katan Patel in the room? No, okay. All right, uh, next speaker is Patricia Hughes. Hello everyone, my name is Patricia and I've been an educator for seven years now at a local preschool and I wanted to discuss my concerns for FCUSD. First of all, as an educator, it is my job to protect children and it concerns me that there could be a potential return of a mass mandate in schools for the fall. 
as well as a continuation of COVID testing requirements for both staff and children. If our children have a 99.997% survival rate and masks do more harm than good, then there's no reason as to why these mandates should be enforced, but should be made optional. Secondly, there are some serious concerns we are having with the change in curriculum throughout California. Some of the things I hear and see being taught to our children makes me lose faith in our public school system. Why are teachers encouraged to teach their agendas besides their curriculum class? What happened to teaching children to love their classmates regardless of immutable characteristics? If we give our children the necessary tools and proper modeling of how to treat others while sticking to the curriculum and leave the rest of the parents, I would have more faith in the public school system. Thirdly, all children do not learn the same, so I urge you to be in support of school choice. Please stop thinking about losing money, but please support charter schools such as Design Tech High School and New Pacific School to be established. Lastly, I have lived in Rancho Cordova my whole life and have been through the public school system of Peter J. Shields, Mills Middle School, and Cordova High School. During my education as a young child, I loved it, and I was hoping that I would be able to have my future children in the FCUSD school district. But sadly, that is no longer an option, as long as the unnecessary mandates and teaching of agendas continue. This comes from my heart of fighting for the same cause as you, which is for the children. Please do better and always provide a choice for parents. Let's unite instead of divide. I'll leave you with this. First Corinthians 13, six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Uh, do we have anybody online? Okay. First Zoom speaker is Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Good evening. Um, first of all, I want to say shout out to all the Lancers. Once a Lancer, always a Lancer. That presentation was awesome. Um, so let me start. Good evening. My name is Sarah David, and I'm a teacher at Cordova Villa Elementary School. Another shout out to Mr. McCrossin. You're an amazing music teacher. Thank you for teaching myself and my brother. Um, over the past few meetings, I've discussed the importance of music for our younger students and the value it has brought our students this past year. Here's what one teacher, Elisa Yi at Oak Chan, had to say about the weekly TK lessons, or TK to third grade lessons. We have done every lesson this year, and my students and I love it. In addition to basic music skills, it has taught my students to listen and follow directions. It has improved their fine and gross motor skills, and it has shown them in a quick and tangible way that practice really does help build skills. We often will play some of the more difficult movement pieces several times, like the Nutcracker one or the Apple Pie Rhythm one. And note how much we improve after a few times. Then we relate that to math, reading, sports, etc. We've had some great discussions on perseverance. These lessons have also added a wonderful SEL component to my classroom, as they have sparked several conversations about kids' interests and given them a reason to connect. Please, please continue this program next year and beyond. We schedule it every Wednesday afternoon and never miss a lesson. It is one of the best new things we have incorporated this year. Thank you so much for all the work you have done. If you or anyone ever want to observe kids participating in the TK3 lessons, we do them every Wednesday at 2 p.m. in room 14 at Oak Chan. You are always welcome to pop by anytime. This is just one teacher's account of the program, and there are many more who have participated and given positive feedback. My friend and colleague, Stephanie Cantu, has put together a presentation for you to view. She will email this presentation to all of you. This has research and the importance of music for our students. Now, thank you, Chris Clark, for all that you did this summer um, to support our students in Rancho Cordova. Thank you, Chris Clark, Josh Hoover, and Tim Huey for your emails and your follow-up for the summer school breakfast. That all right. Thank you. Next, we have Natalie. Welcome, Natalie. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I'm a teacher in the district. Um, recently, I was looking over my family's monthly budget, and I was reminded that we're paying like $300 a month for our cable internet provider. Um, and as the cost of living is increasing, our priorities are shifting, so I decided to call in and cancel or change the service to something that makes more sense for our family. After being placed on hold for 15 minutes, optimistically, <laughs> and speaking to a representative, I was transferred to their retention department where I was offered an outrageous discount and some free channels to keep our business with the company. 
Now, as a matter of fact, I used to work at a service provider in my pre-teaching days, and I understand exactly why they fight so hard to keep their customers. It's so much easier and cheaper to maintain current customers than to recruit new ones. New customers need a sales pitch, a technician to install the service, some training to understand that new service. And current customers might, customers might call in with questions or concerns occasionally, but they don't need much hands-on maintenance. Um, while providing a discount to a current customer might decrease the profit margin slightly, it's ultimately much more beneficial to keep a long-time customer than to recruit a new one. And this feels especially relevant to the current state of the teacher's pay in Folsom, Cordova. Um, I am a relatively new teacher in the district, and I know that the district has invested a lot of money in me. They paid for my two-year induction process, including monthly meetings and mentorship, and I've also been sent to additional trainings that I'm very grateful to have attended. Like a new customer, there's been a significant investment on the part of the district for me to be here. However, as much as I appreciate that and love my students and respect my colleagues, I'm starting to pay more attention to what other districts are offering their teachers. With the cost of living going up, my priorities have to shift by necessity. My cable provider makes it a real hassle to quit them, and I'm relatively happy with them, but eventually the financial benefits are going to outweigh the inconvenience, and I will leave. It's much less of a hassle to leave my job in Folsom, Cordova, and the impact on my family will be greater. So please consider. Next, we have Courtney. Okay. Uh, uh, just a reminder for those who are on um, line who are calling in. Um, the system turns off the, the mic at the two minute mark. Um, so try to, if you can, uh, to get your comments in prior to that. Uh, Courtney, you said? Yes. Uh, welcome, Courtney. Hi, um, I yield my time to Sarah David so she can finish hers. Thank you. Okay. Would you like me to call Sarah? Yeah, yeah, like that's fine. Let me find her. Sarah, are you there? I'm here. Please proceed. Thank you, Courtney. Also, thank you, Chris, for taking the time out of your day to come see our students during summer school. You came during their SEL art time. They really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to see you interact with our students. You truly know the community you serve, both Folsom and Rancho Cordova. I hope other members make a point to visit not only schools in your area, but Rancho Cordova schools as well, especially some Title I sites. Spend some time interacting with students and not just the campus tour. We'd love to have you for a visit. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Emmerich from Williamson Elementary. Jamie, could um, you speak up a little? It's hard I, to hear you. I can speak up. Can you hear me now? Um, barely barely yeah. barely can hear me okay i'll shout as loud as i can okay. <laughs> that's better thank you jamie okay um i'm jamie emmerich i am from williamson elementary and i teach first grade i have been there 28 years um i would like to um say what um continue what sarah david said um mimic the music program 100 percent and the shout out to Chris Clark, um, who came by today. Thank you very much. Um, three years ago, society said, more than ever, teachers are underpaid and disrespected. Districts all over responded with, well, then they should just quit. Now, there are currently 567,000 fewer educators in America today than there were in 2019. At this rate, who will fill the current vacancies, the new positions, and what can Folsom Cordova do to change these statistics? Employees stay when they are paid well, mentored, challenged, promoted, involved, appreciated, valued, empowered, on a mission, and trusted. <clears throat> Educators are employees. As a governing board, would you stay in Folsom Cordova compared to other surrounding districts if you were an educator? What from this list does FCUSD do well? Where do you fall short? I encourage you to think about the employees in this district who have other options, 
who have influence over incoming educators when it comes to applying to districts or your own experiences in the job force when looking at fair and reasonable compensation, when deciding fair and reasonable schedules and educational practices and compensation packages for future educators. Thank you. Next we have Jennifer. Welcome Jennifer. Jamie, are you there? Yes, I'm please, still here. Please proceed. Um, just to, to finish, I just in, I encourage the board to look at compensation for all of your employees, classified, certificated. You want to retain people like me. I have given you 28 years. I intend to give you that, but new employees, I can't promise you that. I can't promise you that I am telling people to stay in Folsom Cordova and I want them to. Our children deserve that. And you know our children deserve that. Come to Rancho, as Sarah David said, you are welcome in room E18 and Williamson anytime. Chris Clark knows the address. Get it from him, please. Thank you. Thanks, Jen Jones. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, the rest of the cards we have are identified for New Pacific and Design Tech, so we'll get to those when we get to those agenda items. So we'll move on to agenda item nine, reports of district organizations. So we'll start, uh, I guess we don't have a student advisory board report tonight. Uh, so we'll go to the California School Employees Association. Anybody from CSEA? Is, is, is it Rob? Um, yeah, why don't you check? Rob, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, President Reed, Dr. Kaligian, board members. Uh, CSEA appreciates the district's uh, latest uh, compensation offer, and we hope that we can soon reach agreement. However, with inflation at 8.5%, we all need help with rent, gas, food, with all of our increasing expenses. Um, and CSEA needs to do everything we can to, uh, to take care of our, our folks and they need to take care of their families. Um, CSEA has a responsibility um, to protect their interest. Um, if there is a medical cap increase, we need it. If there's one-time money, your classified employees need it. We love serving our students and are ready for a great 22-23 school year. Uh, please do all you can to support us. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next is the Folsom Cordova Education Association. Debbie. That raised your hand. Um, good evening, board. Um, tonight, Tracy Suter is giving the report. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let me just start by saying, when I was here on May 19th, I personally expressed doubts as to whether or not you could bring a, a tolerable something to the negotiating table. So it's only fair I do recognize that you did make a good faith offer at 6.56%. And, and we did see that. Um, but there were questions that you raised and we have additional concerns that we'd like to address. So if you would like to, um, we'll go through these too quickly. As others have spoken, uh, in real dollars, we're losing money. 
please note this chart ends at 2021. It doesn't even include this year. But if you look at the raises we have received offset by the increasing costs, we, we aren't making more money. <laughs> it may look like it, but the net effect is not positive. Next slide. We also saw this last time. Just to recap, the blue dot at the top is your LCFF funding, our percent change over time. The orange is the cumulative COLA, both of which are outpacing the FCEA cumulative salary change. So it just echoes what we said <laughs> in the last one. We are going in the right direction. It is up, but it is lagging where your funding is. And the gray bar, again, doesn't even include the last few months, uh, is certainly above that as well. So we're losing ground. But Mr. Hoover brought up a really a smart point, a valid point, and that is that our funding for unduplicated pupils is different from some of our neighboring districts. So Deb Kerkorian took a deep dive back in the data for you, and she pulled up districts with similar unduplicated pupil counts because that's where our funding comes from. We're going to pay particular attention to San Marcos and Saddleback because their per pupil unduplicated pupil counts are virtually identical to ours at 35%. So we went back through. I'm going to focus on the right. On the chart on the right, we have the cap for a single person in addition to compensation. If you notice on the right-hand side, Saddleback Valley would be the green bar that is the highest. Um, just slightly below average is San Marcos Unified. And in red, that would be Folsom Cordova working with comparable dollars. And this would be starting um, teachers. Next slide. If we look at someone sort of in the middle, they've been here 10 years, they may have kids, they're clearly listening to the people speaking tonight, looking at their other options. Um, Saddleback Valley is second, right next to San Marcos, both above average, uh, looking on the right side is where I am reading. And then there's Folsom Cordova. And we are slightly ahead of Rockland Unified, but please note Rockland Unified's unduplicated pupil count is 20%. We are at 35%. So they are working with a lot less funding than we are to do that. And they are pretty darn close. If we look at the highest salaries, uh, that would once again be Folsom Cordova on the right. Uh, Saddleback, um, a little bit above average. San Marcos, about par with average. Um, but please note that Rockland, with their 20% unduplicated pupil count, significantly ahead of Folsom Cordova. They would be to our left by about three boxes there. So. When you look at likely like funded districts, we're still not exactly shining. Next slide. We've talked about this before. Please note that those rollover amounts include paid um, funded positions that haven't been filled. They include sub days for special education teachers who can't take them and haven't been able to utilize them. There is padding in that in addition to the enormous amounts that are rolling over. So we ask you, how is it that comparably funded districts are able to pay and compensate better? Rockland at 20% versus our 35% is able to compensate better is because the choices that they're making. We can talk about how we choose to spend our money. And certainly we've seen an awful lot of tools and programs and professional development. But without the people to implement those tools, without the people to implement those programs, you're not spending your money wisely. And right now, you're paying an awful lot of money for professional development that then goes with that teacher to their next school district when they leave. So we need to make wiser choices as to how we're doing this. We need to put people first. So back to the immediate compensation. As you heard behind me, an awful lot of people are considering whether they want to keep working here. And if you have a house, and if you've got kids, and you have a life, then you're looking at San Juan and Elk Grove, because everyone knows they have really good benefits. You're looking at Rockland, who with considerably less funding is doing better than we are. Uh, you're probably not looking at us, to be honest. And the slide you'll note has an additional 5,000 medical. We actually bumped that down a bit in the interest of negotiations. Please note none of these monies and uh, amounts reflect any settlements that may have been taking place. This is prior to any of that happening. And even if we had stuck with that 5,000 for families, it really doesn't take us that far. Certainly not when everyone else settles too. So a couple of related areas we wanted to look at. Next slide, please. Benefit caps. Now, please note, we are talking about the um, high deductible HMOs. 
If you are a single player, and I'm gonna go with the 10 monthly payments, partly because that's what I do too. The amount that we schedule for the single coverage does for the most part cover the high deductible plans. If however, you have a family, we're running at least $500 short. And that is for having coverage of a high deductible plan where you then get to pay considerable amounts out of pocket before you ever actually get coverage. So the insult and injury is a concern and it is busting people's budgets. We are proposing that we add a fairly minimal and then really very minimal $500 a month at least to start with to offset and maybe have a few people stay with us. At least would bring them close to being on par with those high deductible plans, at least the upfront costs before they actually get into the high deductible part. Next slide. Another problem that you're having is keeping your special ed teachers. Special ed teachers are like <laughs> unicorns and everyone wants them. And our teachers are getting these flyers in their email boxes. Trin Rivers is offering $2,000 annual stipend. Now we've made efforts to try to retain and respect our special ed teachers who not only have to teach, but they also have enormous amounts of paperwork that come with it. So we offered four days of sub time so they could do their paperwork. Subs are not widely available. We've had way too many teachers who've done enormous amount of time writing uh, lesson plans only to be called back so now you spent your time writing lesson plans that you can't use unless you're the one implementing them. And you still have all the work that you thought you were going to do that day when you took off in the first place that didn't get done because you were teaching your own sub plans. So that really was not working. So in a good faith effort, we offered this year to allow people to simply get compensated for working on their own time. Weekends, holidays, it was going to happen anyway. You have 129,000. Uh, budgeted for that and a very small proportion of that got used. I don't know if it was exhaustion because the work got done and or just people were too tired to put in the paperwork or to deal with the process, but we're not really doing the same thing as Twin Rivers who's just giving people $2,000 up front. Uh, next slide. Here is the big problem. When I was here back on my, um, May 19th, I said, that you had a problem when you had 29 retirements, especially since we've been front-lighting retirements a few years ago to get people off the books. You had 258 hires, which is a pretty substantial number, and you had 61 resignations. That now is still not accurate. That was as of June 7th. More people are leaving. They're coming to the board meeting to read their resignation letters to you. There are more people I think are just gonna let the clock run out and just not show up and just not tell you why. So we have just over a thousand teachers in our unit. You have easily 10% between retirements and resignations, more than that, probably just resignations, honestly, when the dust settles, who are choosing to leave this district. That's not okay. You are trustees. Yes, you have a responsibility to spend money wisely, but you also have an even more important responsibility to offer students, the children in this district and their families, quality education. Tonight, you're gonna to be adopting your LCAP goal. The first goal says all students will receive uh, instruction from highly qualified teachers. Long-term subs filling an open position is I don't think meeting that LCAP goal. Teachers who quit and then other teachers have to use their prep periods to teach those classes is not meeting those goals. What you're doing is burning out the teachers who have stayed and increasing your resignation numbers. And in addition to creating a, you have a snowball that's rolling downhill, burning out more teachers, more teachers quit. Now you have more newbie teachers, more newbie teachers need support from their colleagues, burning out their colleagues, they leave. And they, you have this rotating situation. I am an old head. I've been here 33 years. I am not on Instagram, I'm not on Facebook, but the people you are hiring are. And the reputation this district is getting is not positive. It was already, it was bad about benefits when I first started here. There were people leaving Cordova High School when I started teaching for Elk Grove. It has always been thus. But we're gaining other parts of our reputation and the resignations are really tangible data that you ought to be looking at. Looking at. So I hope that Dr. Kaliki and his school board as we continue negotiations, I don't think we're being greedy. I don't think we're being unreasonable. 
Um, I think we're offering you some suggestions on how you might actually retain your teaching base and turn around the reputation of this district before it gets even worse. And I don't wanna be here this time next year with the next line on that chart and have it continuing in the same trend. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. We don't have a report tonight. Okay. And then uh, the District English Learner Advisory Committee. Good evening, President Reed, members of the board, and, super, and Dr. Su Superintendent <laughs> Kaligan, excuse me. There is no report tonight. Sometimes I feel silly walking here, but no report this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that finishes the reports from district organizations. That moves us to agenda item 10, agenda consent. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll move it. Second. All right, motion by Mr. Clark, second by Mr. Short. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And I hear we have some announcements. We do. Part of the consent agenda, the board just approved, also approved uh, three new leadership positions, and we have those folks joining us this evening. So I'm honored to introduce, and we'll start with Ms. Suzanne Borth, our new assistant principal for Kenny High School and Prospect Community Day School. <laughs> Ms. Borth is a familiar face in our district for the last 20 years and the last two years as a curriculum and instruction specialist supporting TK through 12 instruction as well as professional learning communities. A data-driven leader, she has worked collaboratively with multiple departments that oversee equity, social emotional learning and mental health to integrate these priorities into the instructional culture of school sites. Congratulations, Suzanne, and welcome on board in your new position. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Dr. Kaligian, President Reed and the board, and our superintendent, assistant superintendents. I really um, appreciate this opportunity to put on this new hat and continue to support FCUSD in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, it's my privilege to congratulate um, Amanda Turks, our new coordinator of health and wellness. Congratulations, Amanda. Let's give her a round of applause. Good evening. And Amanda is a registered nurse and she's um, under the direction of, she will be under the direction of our district's director of health programs and services. She'll support our student health and wellness programs. She is experienced as a registered nurse in hospitals. She has spent the last six years in school districts working with health staff and with advanced health technology to provide school-based health services. Very excited to have you join the team and welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Reed, Dr. Kaligian, and the members of board. I'm thrilled to be back with this wonderful program. It's a great community we have in Folsom Cordova and health staff. It feels like I'm getting to come home, so thank you. And we are also privileged to introduce our new Director of Special Education, Ms. Christina Royer. Christina is joining, joining us as our second director of special education. Um, she began her career as a school psychologist over 21 years ago and has had extensive experience serving students with special needs at school districts throughout the region in a variety of leadership roles. Her skill sets include facilitating constructive communication between members of district leadership and community, community teams and guiding educational teams in the development and delivery of programs to help students reach success. Congratulations, Christina. We're excited to have you on board and joining the team. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Kaligian and President Reed, members of the board, assistant superintendents. Um, I'm so grateful to be here in Folsom Cordova Unified. I'm really looking forward to spending time getting to know each of you, visiting the schools, learning about our special education programs and, and all the schools in the district. Um, I live close by, and so I'm really grateful to have a short commute here mm -hmm. and um, spend more time in this beautiful community. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right, that moves us into our public hearings. Um, <laughs> as we mentioned at the beginning, we are moving uh, item A to after C. Item A is the uh, item, the public hearing on Design Tech High School. So we will start with item B which is uh, the charter petition to establish New Pacific uh, School in Rancho Cordova. And before we uh, gavel in, I just want to uh, indicate uh, to the public uh, and the presenters um, the process we're going to be uh, taking on this, app, on this uh, item. Uh, we're going to, after gaveling in, um, we're going to invite district staff to make a presentation. Following the presentation by district staff, we will invite um, representatives from New Pacific uh, to make a presentation. Uh, following that, we will be taking board questions uh, for both the district staff as well as uh, representatives from New Pacific. Um, after the board questions, we will be taking public comment, uh, and then um, uh, we will close the public hearing. So. Evelyn. All right, this is a public hearing on a charter school petition to establish New Pacific School, Rancho Cordova. Um, superintendent. Yes, uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Paul Kiefer to come to the podium. He is the petitioner that is presenting us with New Pacific School, Rancho Cordova petition that we received on June 2nd, 2022. Thank you. Which one? And I believe he has a presentation he'll be sharing with us this evening. Oh, Welcome. There, and there is no staff presentation tonight, correct? Correct. This okay. is the first public hearing. My apologies. Okay. My apologies. Okay. Good. I think I'm, I'm being uploaded. No problem. Hey, Paul, it's a hot one out there, isn't it? It's hot out there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sean. Small, small talk. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, good evening. Uh, President Reed, trustees, and Dr. Kaligian. Uh, my name is Paul Kiefer, and I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity to reintroduce ourselves. It seems like just six months ago we were together, and uh, I don't think it's quite Groundhog Day, but it is, uh, it is uh, very good to be here. Uh, We'll start by reminding you about the Pacific Charter Institute tonight. We'll describe what makes New Pacific School unique, and we'll talk about the differences this time around from the last time that we met. And so first, a little bit about myself. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, I'm the Executive Director of Pacific Charter Institute. My wife and I live in Carmichael. We have three children, and I'm very involved in uh, Rotary, I happen to be on the president, uh, president of, or not president, but on the board of the uh, Sacramento Rotary Club, uh, uh, as uh, Chris Clark knows. Uh, Boy Scouts of America, I also serve on the Sacramento County Board, where I was uh, recently reelected. Pacific Charter Institute, uh, I was part of the founding with the vision developing self-motivated, educated individuals who will spread the wealth of knowledge worldwide in a meaningful way. Today, we serve thousands of students in 15 counties. We offer 11 different academic programs across 15 counties. What unites us is the belief that students succeed when learning is personalized to their individualized interests and abilities. Our teachers, staff, and systems are designed to meet each student right where they are and move them forward. This approach to learning is transformative, especially for kids who don't quite fit into the traditional public school. 90% of PCI students feel that their teacher cares about them and their learning and the graduation rates of all four of our existing K-12 schools exceed the statewide average. I'm really proud of the impact we've been able to have. Last time we were here, we introduced you to our administrative staff, academics, wellness, and student service teams. Today, I want to highlight our governing board. 
We have an incredible board of directors that steward, stewards PCI through their considerable experiences and depths of knowledge in the areas of curriculum, instruction, finance, operations, and strategy. Dr. Rex Fortune is our board chair and founder who served as the superintendent of Inglewood Unified and Center Unified, and as, as well as deputy superintendent for the State Board of Education. Jean-Paul Prentice, who lives in Rancho Cordova with three children in Sutter, is with Sutter Peak, which is one of our schools. He's also lead accredited professional through the US Green Building Association. Josh Maudlin is the director of learning and learn and earn at the Foundation for Community Colleges with a background in CTE and post-secondary success. Judy Miller serves as the director of fiscal services, served as the director of fiscal services at Covina Valley Unified School District and on the board of a credit union in Southern California and currently is on an advisory board. Martha Melendez Cuadros, the English Learning Program Manager at San Juan Unified District, where she retired, was also the founder and principal of the Language Academy of Sacramento, a successful dual language charter school in Sac City Unified. Alpena Carey brings her own educational experience as a science teacher at Aspire, as a science teacher at Spire Public Schools and now is a dean at Delta Charter High School down in Tracy. John Brennan is a certified public accountant with his own firm, Brennan Properties, who formerly worked with Deloitte and Touche. And his properties that he uh, oversees are all over Sacramento County and in the region. This incredible group of leaders ensure that we're staying focused on students and staying true to our mission and vision. These folks hold me accountable and will ensure that New Pacific School is a success here <laughs> in Ranch Cordova. Speaking of success, I'd like to now turn this over to our founding principal, Nancy Bean, who will introduce herself and talk about the educational program for New Pacific School. Nancy. Oh, perfect. Here's the clicker and just fix it. I'll do that there. Good evening. I'm Nancy Bean, a founding principal for New Pacific School. My current role with PCI is I am the program leader for the Homeschool Guild. We have over 330 students, um, diverse group, Title I folks um, that come to us for homeschooling. I live in Sacramento. I have for more than 20 years. I have three kids. Um, I have homeschooled them all at one point or another. I have a 15-year-old who still is homeschooling. I realize that homeschooling is a privilege that not everybody can do because it requires an adult to be home with the kids, and that is a financial strain for lots of folks. So I am super excited that New Pacific School will offer some of the benefits that I've seen kids experience in homeschooling, the individualized learning, and they will be able to attend a site. This picture that you see of me is me and three high school students from our program. I took them out to the El Dorado Forest where they participated in a forestry challenge. The kids had never met. I picked them up literally in the dark of morning and to, we went out to this forest challenge and they were able to do a big hands-on project where they experienced what it is that foresters do. And it was a project where they learned all the tools and they had to come up with a plan how to prevent a wildfire in the area that we were in. How is New Pacific School unique? New Pacific School will be a small TK through 12 program that will be different than any other program in this district. The foundation of the program will be social emotional learning project-based learning, individual learning plans for every student, and foreign language instruction at every grade level. No other school in this district offers all of these approaches in one place. How does learning best occur? So my background for the last 18 years has been as a homeschool parent, a teacher, supporting homeschoolers, and an administrator. I've seen students who are struggling in a regular classroom come to our program and thrive due to the power of individualized learning and a strong teacher and family relationship. I'm excited that New Pacific will provide what I believe will be the best benefits of homeschooling while also provide daily interaction with the learning community and highly qualified teachers. I'll talk about each of the components that you see here on the following slides. First and foremost, we have, we'll have a school culture of connectedness. 
These will form the foundation for New Pacific School. At the core will be the Leader in Me program, which teaches students how to self-regulate and direct their educational experience. In addition, we'll make heavy use of that academic triangle, the, the team relationship between the student, their family, and the teacher that is so powerful. We'll utilize the MTSS model, multi-tiered systems of support, and we'll have that small school size that encourages relationships, interaction, and interpersonal accountability. Next, we have evidence-based pedagogical strategies. At New Pacific School, these will include those individual learning plans for every student. When you come into the New, New Pacific School, you will not see students doing the same thing at the same time. Instead, you will see each student working on activities according to their needs and interests. We'll use multidisciplinary standard-based curriculum and project-based learning. Students will be tackling projects across subject areas. We'll have data-driven instruction. And what will be unique is that students will learn to use their own data to develop their learning goals. Teachers will also use the data to meet in professional learning communities to analyze the data and plan instruction. This will include both one-to-one -one and small group instruction. Lastly, every student will have one-to-one -one access to computing devices. This will allow them to access online programs during the school day as well as at home. New Pacific School will strive to provide integration of community learning. This will include field trips, such as that forestry challenge, as well as visits from speakers for students in all grades. And our high school students will be supported in taking community college courses. And this is something we've been very successful with already at PCI. And in spe specifically in my homeschool program, we have lots of kids who do the advanced education. They continue with it. They are successful in community college. They are able to transfer to a four-year school. This is what I'm planning for my own son. I've seen this work beautifully. In addition to community college, we'll help our high school students participate in internships. The last component to our school's success will be resourceful, highly qualified, and supported teachers. This program is going to be very different from anything that most teachers have ever participated in. So we want our teachers to have the knowledge um, that they need and the training that they need to do this well. To support our teachers, we'll provide time for collaboration and professional development. Teachers will be in, largely in a guide on the side role, and there will be a paraprofessional in each classroom. Teachers will also have access to mental health and wellness support. We know it's extra challenging to be a teacher these days, and we want to take care of our teachers as well as our students. Now I'll turn the presentation back to Dr. Kiefer, who will address the question, What's different this time? Thank you. Well done. What's different this time? I'm out of memory. <laughs> that's, that's different. I can, uh, I won't wait for it. First, we successfully uh, worked with Roseville Joint Union High School District and have New Pacific Roseville approved in February of this year. Our Roseville team has been busy hiring, training, and preparing to open in August as we hire our principal, business manager, teachers, paraprofessionals, and office assistant in the last two months. In fact, we have some ranch, we have some Rancho Cordova parents here tonight who will be commuting to our Roseville campus. I feel it's important to also mention and clearly demonstrate what we were able to do in six months from concept to launch. In February, we were approved, and we're opening doors in August. After approval these, during these inflationary times and recessionary times, we're very proud of the fact that PCI has a grounded human resources team and a budget that allows us to be competitive with the community, charter schools, other school districts. And we feel that's going to be our advantage when it comes to making sure that we're successful, which I'm sure that's what everyone in the room wants if the school is approved. Our team has been listening to Rancho Cordova parents and the community. Through community engagement events in Rancho Cordova, like the International Festival, focus groups, 
and coffee with the principal Zooms, we've been listening to the families and Rich Cordova, and here's what they've said. Their frustration with the perceived difference in quality between the Folsom and Rancho Cordova schools. Frustration with the perceived lack of high quality public school alternatives in Rancho Cordova. Seeking smaller class sizes and smaller schools. Seeking inclusive options for students with disabilities. Seeking inclusive options for students with disabilities. Seeking a middle school and a high school option that's closer to home. Interested in the whole child approach and inquiry based learning. Interested in dual enrollment, early college, and career technical education. Excited about foreign language and arts in all grades. Excitement about hands-on project-based learning. Interested in, in Riverview STEM, but unable to get on because of wait lists. Willingness to drive up to 20 minutes to access a great school. Needs for safety and before and after school care. Families outside of Folsom Cordova Unified, specifically Rosemont and the Elk Grove attendance areas are also interested in, in another option. You'll hear from some of the parents directly today. We've been listening to the district as well. Certainly it was important that we, we heard what you said and we made the uh, changes that we know we are capable of making that still fit with our mission. First, we updated the charter and the appendices to reflect the new charter term, term of 22-23 to 22-2028 and conform with laws enacted this January. <coughs> We've heard the concerns from the district. We've added more detail in response to the staff report and questions received the first time around. Based on district feedback, we've broadened the focus beyond addressing chronic absenteeism to serving all students in need in this small hands-on school. We've tightened our focus to serving families south of Highway 50 and Rancho Cordova. We've identified two potential sites in southwest end of the district near the border of Sacramento City Unified. And something that we're very proud of, we are working with the city and we'll be meeting with the City of Rancho Cordova Design Success Team next week to review our plans and hear their feedback. We'll provide more information at the next public hearing. I know it's a long night and I do appreciate your time. I uh, appreciate the fact that we're in front of you and, and, uh, and a lot of heavy decisions are being made, both what was presented today and, and also what we know is coming in the future. But I do wanna thank you and your team for reviewing the petition. Uh, we look forward to continue to work with you and answer your questions as they come up. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Short, any questions? Yeah, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kiefer. Um, you mentioned the location. Last time we talked, it wasn't a kind of a general location. Do you have a specific location? You said you're meeting the city a staff and do you already have like a tentative lease together and a plan together to get a permit? Because I understand you want to open up in August or when? When do you want to open up? Uh, 23. 23, oh, 24. So 23. Okay, yeah, so, so you, um, okay. when we were approved in February by Roseville Joint Union High School District in the city of Roseville, we did not have a location. Right. And, uh, and now we have a location. And so it's not by law. We don't have to have a location prior to opening. We just need to, uh, because at that point we're dealing with the city and, uh, and their planning and regulations. It's no longer a district a district uh, requirement to make sure that we are doing that work. But, we don't open if we don't have a location. Right, but so you said you're meeting next week, so you do have a location. Can we have two locations. I don't have the addresses Can with you me. share those with the board? I don't have them now. I think one, I don't have them with me now. Okay, uh, Okay. I'll move on then. Um, <clears throat> you, had, you said you applied to uh, the other districts, uh, Roseville is one, and there's others that you're applying to right now? Which We're applying here, certainly. And We're where, other, where other ones are you applying at? Yuba City. Yuba City? Yep. And you said you got uh, approved in Roseville for the high school and, and K through 12? TK 12. T through 12. Did you apply to the elementary, because there are two different districts, there's K through eight and K through 12. You got approved by just the high school and then the elementary had to come along because they approved it? So state law states that you must be able to serve the district grade levels that you're serving and you're allowed to, to serve students outside of that grade level. So you didn't get the K through eight districts approved? It, it's, you can't do that. You can't, you can't be approved by two different districts for the same school. So, but the, the elementary district is held hostage now and has to go. I don't know, I don't know what that means, held hostage. What well, does that mean? The high school district approves it, but the elementary school didn't have a say in it, and they, they have to go along. Uh, I don't know why that's held hostage. That's the well, state law. They, they, state law. They have to go along, but they didn't approve it. Is that correct? 
they did not approve it. We could have gone to the K the K eight first, uh, but we felt like the the intricacies okay. of high school. So the, the K eight is make that the part of choice. it, but they didn't approve it. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, moving on from the next one. Um, you said we're different from uh, our other districts. I mean, our our district programs to one at one site, and you're saying you're providing a higher superior product. Uh, how do you know that? What do you know every program that the district does here that is comparable? And did you do a, a metric of that? And can you share that with the board on that metric and how that yes. by you know data information? Because we don't have that data. We put that in the charter petition. Okay. So we will look at that for yes. next time. Okay. Um, so the last time I think I asked about a cap, you know, your location. So you're gonna you're talking about implementing the first two years and then going up to possibly over 500, 580 folks like that. But you said there was no cap, but you weren't planning on it. Is it still no cap or you staying, you keep advocating small, but there is no cap. Is it, it has that changed? We, uh, our model, there is no cap in the charter petition. Right. So there's still no cap. Okay. And my, and last time I asked, and this would be my last one for right now, because um, I'll let the board talk to more. I might have more later, but, uh, we talked about what's the difference in uh, independent versus dependent. And uh, we asked, you know, why, why wouldn't you consider uh, being a dependent where it'd be under the trustees' uh, governance and we can work together uh, uh, on, and we, with local control and we can all work together in providing a good product together. Why, why do you want to go independent versus independent? Uh, it's, I don't know, I know they call it dependent or independent, but it's actually direct funded or indirect funded. And we want to be direct funded because our board is a fiduciary responsibility for the budget. And therefore my, our board of, of PCI can't share that off authority with your board. So, so you're saying you take the independent money, which is tax money, is that correct? The dollars follow the students. It's been doing that since Jerry Brown's uh, right, change right. with the LCF funding and ILCAP. So yes, that is correct. The money follows the students. So are, is your board elected and are they considered representation of the tax money that's there versus the trustees here? Is that taxation without representation? It's, it, there is representation because the school boards have oversight over the, the school over the charter schools, and through their oversight, they ensure that the budgets are in compliance. We also are in compliance through the uh, annual audits that we're required to submit, as well as our annual budget. So, there is actually multi-layer accountability through the elected process. As a county sitting county board member, I sit and I actually review the budgets of the district that uh, of the county authorized charter schools. So you're going to be overseeing your own charter with that we're overseeing? Is that what you just said? No, I didn't say that. No, it sounded like it. But anyway, so what I'm what I'm asking is, <laughs> really, the, the, the oversight that we had last time was very meniscal, and we don't have really any control in the first five years. We just obligated to take 1% or 2% of our and look it over and just do kind of a cursory review of the audit, but we really don't have any control of the operations or anything like that. Is that correct? You have uh, considerable control because a petition submitted to you. If you approve it, you're holding this charter school accountable to it. And by your accountability of that charter school, you are holding oversight. Uh, you will not hold oversight over the operation because you've approved the charter, which is operating under that guise. Okay, that's all I have right now. Thank you. <coughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Clark, do you mean? Thank you, hi, Paul. How are you? Congratulations uh, on your you. uh, election. You. Um, Ed took like one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six of my questions. So I think I have like six other, maybe seven, maybe eight um, that I will ask. So first one, um, I know last time we talked a little bit about transportation and how our students would be getting to wherever the site is going to be. Um, do we have any change in that? Will there be transportation offered, or how will these students get this? We, we won't be offering transportation, but we'll work with families to make sure they know the viable transportation. Uh, uh, I also, uh, it's amazing since that last board meeting, there's a lot of research to make sure that we're 
uh, meeting all the needs of what the district might want uh, in regards to the charter petition and also stay within what we're trying to achieve. And it turns out there's no middle school or high school south of 50. And so there are students going back and forth across the, the light rail tracks. And I remember that was a real bone of contention for the board six weeks, six months ago. And so uh, I think uh, by us purposely being south of 50, uh, we'll at least take care of that piece because when we serve high school and middle school students, those students won't have to cross the 50 and the light rail to go to school. Okay, I'm a little lost on that. So you're saying that our students south of 50, let's say, I'm gonna say like maybe the navigator area, they don't have transportation to our middle schools? What I'm saying, your middle school students have to go across 50 to go to school, correct? No, that's not what I'm asking. I'm talking about our elementary schools that are in our district let's say Navigator, uh, once they leave Navigator, do they have transportation to, say, a Mills? No, it would be Mitchell. I think, I think uh, our goal is to make sure families can get there. Our research with the focus groups tells us the families will find a way to get there, which is terrific. And uh, beyond that, uh, we will work with the families the best we can to make sure they're able to attend the school. I okay. mean, I, I guess the, the and, and, question and, is reflective. I'd like to learn how the district does transportation and make sure it's free for all students and they're all able to get transported. Fine, and then we fine. certainly can... I uh, recall correctly, uh, see, I believe that we do have uh, buses, don't we? I mean, I, I think that's the way they get there, right? Well, is it... I mean, not unless I'm yeah. missing something. I mean, Well, the question me. is, this is a small school, and as I said last time, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that students can get to school that enroll. Okay. And I mean, you know, it's great that I think you said in your presentation that we, that you have parents from Rancho that are driving their kids to, was it Rockland, Roseville? Mm -hmm. Okay, are those like working, I'm just curious when I'm asking this question, are, are they working families or are they? I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for okay. me to disclose Single what type of families, families are enrolling. I mean, is it dual? I mean, I don't know, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know if we're sorting understanding the demographics in, Raff, in Rancho Cordova, and we've talked about this before, uh, some of our families were working like two jobs. They're, you know, just trying to figure out how to make ends meet, but all of a sudden... I think we're going really to really try to mirror the work that's being done at the Riverview and how... And when it comes to making sure students can get to that school, oh, they're a making, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think you know it'd be good for us to know how it's done there, so that those families know there could be another opportunity for them. All right, all right. I, I, I promise this time around, I won't give you a hard time like the first time. So I'm just going to move on to um, some similarities uh, that we have in our district. Uh, you mentioned pro project-based learning. Um, now maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this, but I'm pretty sure staff uh, could probably chime in. What's the difference between our project lead the way and your project-based learning? Well, they're two different products. Project lead the way is a scripted program and project-based learning that we'll be implementing will be student-centered, which means we'll be able to adapt to student interest. Project lead the way has a finite project number. Project-based learning or project lead the way? Project I mean, lead the way has a, finite, learning. has a finite number of of finite number of programs that students can do, and also the training requirements are extensive, okay. and it's limiting, and not all students want to do that. Our goal is to make sure every student is able to engage in a project, and therefore we're being uh, much more uh, out of the box, creative on, on the project-based learning. Hmm. Okay, I thought our district was kind of doing that too, so we'll go on to the next one. Uh, your MTSS. How does that compare to our MTSS? Is it the same as Project Lead the Way and Project Based Learning? Is it two different products? Oh, I think, I'm sure many of the same strategies are happening for both. Okay. But that's not, that's not the core. Those are like, we have to do that in order to make sure students learn. That's the reason why it's in place. Okay. But we do do that. Yeah, but that wasn't, right. that's not what we're referring to. What okay. we're referring to directly are the combination of all the programs that we plan to put forward for the students. All right. So, um, next question, how would you deal with the um, suspensions of our students? Is there like something in place for suspending students? I'm just kind of curious because, you know, we've always had, you know, we have brought it down significantly as far as suspension rates, but um, is there a plan in place for you to deal with like 
suspensions of our students? Yeah, it's in the charter petition. Okay, awesome. But you can't relay that now. I I I can get a charter petition and read it okay. to you. But right. I think I I'd right. not extrapolate because I know it's going to be a long evening. <laughs> That's but right. if you would like me to continue. Well, we have time. I, I, I'll tell you so, history. We've been known to be here pretty much sometimes past 12 p.m. So, or 12 a.m. So suspensions so are we, in we the, have time, okay. you know. So suspensions are in, the, are in the charter, and they, are, they follow all state law, uh -huh. and they ensure that the students have uh, all the appropriate rights, it's including right. restorative justice, and the tools and mechanisms to make sure the students are able to stay in school. Awesome. Will you be working with any outside groups such as... Uh, when you talk restorative justice, maybe Black Child Legacy Campaign? We'll be using Leader and Me, which uh, in itself has its own restorative processes. And so we'll be, uh, all staff will be trained with that. Okay. With the goal of making sure the students have every, uh, every possible chance to remain in school. Small school environments typically don't have suspensions. Pacific Charter Institute has had, I think, uh, a handful of suspensions, and it was during COVID. So uh, that's thousands of students being educated every year, and uh, we don't suspend students because students are first and foremost in, the, in our model. Is it possible to get that data on your suspension rates? I believe it's, uh, uh, it is okay. certainly, it's certainly available, and I believe it's also online with the uh, state of California. Okay. All right, but I was asking you personally if you could send it. Sure. But, I mean, if you... I mean, I, mean, I, I imagine time. there's going to be a list that's provided and... to us, and I would imagine we will uh, we'll add that to it. I'm sure that we've taken notes on All that. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, I had two more questions. On page 13, you mentioned about um, the health and wellness of our teachers, and I want to make sure, um, I want you to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more as far as health and wellness, as far as what are you providing uh, for your teachers. Uh, we make sure the teachers are part of the decision-making process, and we make sure that they have the ability to uh, manage the, the, the curriculum and the educational uh, outcomes for the students within the guardrails of what we're expected to demonstrate on the uh, dashboard and also with the, uh, the CCI and also the uh, academic dashboard. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we know that, uh, that through collaboration, through empowerment, our teachers drive our model, and therefore that's a first step in health and wellness. In the last year, year and a half, we put together a health and wellness hotline, which students and staff can use. So we've put in the pieces in place so the students and teachers and families have a, an outlet. Uh, we connect uh, teachers and students with services if needed. Uh, and we have a high satisfaction rate. Every year we do an annual uh, staff satisfaction uh, survey and it always is it's always very high on on how they feel about working at pci okay and so we'll continue that work with new pacific what's great about new pacific is the teachers and the principal form a and and the paraprofessionals they all form a a unit to make sure that the hundred the first hundred students have exactly what they need and they all work in tandem to make sure that happens and so some of the things that i've been asked about today those those we settled with, with staff and students and parents on opening day through home visits to make sure that we have a, a soft touch so we meet the families. They know that uh, it's, it's always in a positive, a positive, uh, uh, let's always positive. I've run out of words. That's okay. Which is rare for me, so. Well, that's all right. I mean, you, you hit on a, a, a word, home visits. How, how would you do that? Do you have teachers that go out through the day and do So this visits? is our first year, and uh, we, we, we visit a school in Chula Vista that uses Leader and Me. It's over 1,000 students serving community uh, neighborhood students. And so we, we learned quite a few important uh, tools they use and methods they use to ensure that they have families uh, really engaged in the school. And so it's a very positive environment. And they actually do, for all over 1,000 students, they do home visits at the beginning of the school year. And so it's something that we want to do. And I look forward to doing some of those home visits myself. Okay. Uh, well, I'll ask this question again. Will you have staff to do home visits? Who, who's going to be doing your home visits? Uh, the teachers, paraprofessionals, the principal, the, uh, uh, the team will, will do those home visits because it's important work. Okay, so... You're obviously teaching classes. This would be in the evening. And 
Oh, okay. That's, well, okay, that's dedication. I like that. Um, all right, so uh, the other question I had, and I think, and this might be for our district st staff, um, you said that no other district offers, and maybe I heard it wrong, offers uh, student internships? How are you? No, we didn't say that. We know okay, that, I, we know I, that like I said, yeah, I, sure, I we, might have heard it wrong. So We, we might have misspoke but, as well. But you guys do have student internships, and who would you be working with uh, to develop those student internships? So I, I, right now we do a lot of dual enrollment. That's really our bread and butter. And so with the internships based on the student's interest, we'll be working with those industries. I have a, a friend who's a rocket scientist in Lincoln, so he's always looking for students to be able to work in his location. I belong to Rotary Club of Sacramento, which has some of the... Uh, profoundly successful people in the region. And so they certainly would support this effort. Um, so it's, I, I think that uh, that's, it, it'll be the question is who wants to do it for our students? It'll be, you know, they'll have that, that, that privilege and the honor to work with upcoming students. And we look forward to that. Okay. Two more questions. Um, the school that you just opened in Roseville, is that gonna be a in-person? Yes, this school we're talking about here is in person. That school is going to be in person as well with daily attendance. Okay. All right. Good to know about that. Um, and here's kind of a question that I may be asking the other uh, representative too. If you are in Rancho Cordova, would you be eligible for concentrated grants? A uh, concentrated grant is. No, it's based on the district. Okay. It's based on this district. Perfect. Okay. No, it's based on the authorizing district. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had to ask. So anyway, um, those are all the questions. See, it wasn't that bad. Oh, uh, Chris, I'm sweating up here. Yeah, I bet my you are. My mouth is dry. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to visiting your club one day. Thank Just you. don't put too much pressure on me. Oh, uh, very good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hoover? Um, I don't have a lot. Just... Um, can you remind me again, because it's just been a little while, the priority you'll use for the um, for students for uh, enrollment? We use it, the, the neighborhood itself, uh, and we will be targeting uh, students that are free and reduced lunch. Okay. Income. So those are the, the two? Yeah, and I... Okay. And staff. I think staff... Oh, staff, in, sure. Yeah, so yeah. staff okay. with... Okay. Uh, that's it for now. Of, yeah. yeah, and siblings. Okay. Yeah, and siblings. <laughs> so, so those are pretty standard, you know, staff siblings. Oh, thank you. Um, 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 and so, not Rancho specifically, but uh, the neighborhood. How is it? Sorry, just one more. How is it? Would the neighborhood be defined? Just the same? Is it a certain geographic boundary or? Yeah, that would that would that would be the priority. Okay. Uh, and so. The question then is, will we attract the most number of students in need? Uh, we'll do our best to make sure, but it, it's a school of choice, right. A, and it's a, and it's a school that's focused on uh, a different modality of, of instruction. Right. And as always, uh, I always ask this question, but uh, enrollment is voluntary, correct? Exactly. If yeah. we are, on a, exactly, yes. Thank you. Yes. That's it for now. We're present. Sorry, totally oh, just a couple sure. quick ones. <laughs> yeah. This page, Ryan, says that a uh, paraprofessional will be in each classroom, and that's K through 12? TK 12. TK 12. Uh, it, maybe this changes depending on the grade, but it, I think we went over this six months ago. F forgive me for forgetting, but what would be the average class size? So our class size will be 30 students with one teacher, one paraprofessional. So okay. 1 to 15 student-teacher ratio. Okay. St adult Ratio. And then last thing, just to follow up on uh, what Mr. Short was mentioning about the locations, uh, is that something you could email to the board, the locations that you are looking at? Yes. Or so to the district? I'll work with my team, and we'll see what's the best way to, to give you that information. You will, I, after our meeting with the city, would probably be best, because then we'll have a clear idea of what they're thinking as well, so that we're all walking in tandem. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I just have a couple questions. Um, 
I just want to confirm. So uh, your new uh, Roseville campus, which opens in August of this year, um, you, you did mention already that it's going to be in person. That is your first in-person school, right? Uh, that is, that's our first daily ADA uh, program. We have resource centers, right. so we have in-person, and we've, we've done that. This will be our first ADA uh, attendance, which is average daily attendance, in-person, in-seat instruction. Okay. Uh, and I, I know you had mentioned it uh, the last time you were here, and uh, I'm sure it's in the application. Remind me, um, you, you're proposing to phase it in, right? You're not opening all 12 grades at the same time, correct? It'll, year one will be TK5. TK5, and then each year you add a, uh, a grade? Or? We're, we're going to add middle school, and then uh, it's year two, and then year three we would add high school. That's our, that's our goal. Okay. And let's see, um, kind of curious, um, we've heard uh, uh, from the public tonight about um, uh, resignations among teachers. What, what is the retention rate at New Pacific? Do you have a number? I do have a number with me, but I will certainly provide it to you. We will, we'll provide you that. Okay, no, I appreciate that, thank you. All right, um, question, uh, you said uh, a priority would be for s students who reside in the neighborhood. Would you be open to uh, expanding that to residents that reside in the city of Rancho Cordova? That is, that'll be a priority. Okay. Yes. And um, all the teachers are, will be credentialed? Yes. And uh, how, what are you doing to ensure uh, diversity? Um, I mean, obviously, it's, it's blind admission, so you, you can't you know, hand pick. But uh, are you marketing? What are you doing to um, help ensure that you get a diverse population? So as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, we were at the Air National Festival. We've, uh, we do all of our materials in Spanish and English, uh, also Russian and Ukrainian. We, uh, we have walked in those areas. We've. I, I, so we're doing a lot of work that's directed that way. We also think it's going to be important that uh, our program uh, shows that we can welcome these students, that it, they, will, they can do this kind of work. And I think that's a big thing. There's no mystery about doing project-based learning. And that'll be what we have to let parents see in their language, watching students doing the work. So that when we, once we're up and operating in, in a, a month, we're going to actually have real data and real information to show parents. And right now, we, you know, obviously, we're, um, we have parents who are fully committed, and they believe it, and we believe it. And so, we will, we will attract. It, it will. The goal will be it will represent Sacramento. Okay. And uh, finally, I'm, I'm actually shocked that Mr. Clark didn't ask uh, if you're going to have sports teams. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is student driven. And so it, it, based on density of students that want what we are talking about when it comes to sports teams, but it's a student driven program. And so they will drive what it is they want to use and do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that's all the questions I have. So let's go to the public. Uh, uh, Mr. Prescott, just do one follow on to yeah, your question please, please go. on sports. And location, would you be enacting Prop 39 for using the existing Foster Conservative School District uh, play fields? No, we would not sports? enact Prop 39. Okay. Uh, but if there's an opportunity to do an MOU with the district to use a field, we would look forward to doing that okay. if, if the students have a need. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's see, New Pacific. Uh, we will start uh, again, uh, two minutes on the clock. Uh, we will start with uh, Chris Bertelli, uh, followed by Kristen Connor. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a parent in Folsom Cordova <clears throat> Unified School District. Uh, I was here six months ago uh, uh, in support of, of New Pacific School. I, I'm here today in support of New, New Pacific School. Um, my daughter, who used to attend Folsom High School, is currently attending one of the PCI schools um, because uh, of the <clears throat> excellent personalized learning um, environment that they have. Uh, she's thriving. Uh, as a junior next year, she'll be taking at least two community college classes as part of her curriculum. Um, her entire education is being tailored to her interest and her needs. Um, 
the petition that they've submitted now after six months of, of kind of going of hearing what you guys said is different. They've responded to your concerns from six months ago. And since then, they've also been um, unanimously approved um, in a neighboring district. Um, over their entire existence, they've been approved and reapproved and, and authorized and reauthorized a number of times. Um, this is a high quality, this is a school that delivers a high quality education, a high touch education with students in a very personal environment. And I really hope that the district um, uh, rethinks its decision from six months ago uh, and uh, supports uh, students in Rancho Cordova who, and their families uh, who desperately need school choice. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Kristen Connor, followed by Angela uh, Binkelman. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Kristen Connor, and I'm a school psychologist with Pacific Charter Institute, as well as a resident of Rancho Cordova. And I'm here tonight to speak in support of New Pacific School. I've been a school psychologist for 10 years, and the past five have been with PCI. In that time, I've been fortunate to work with a fantastic group of people, led by Dr. Kiefer, who are passionate and dedicated to student achievement. And one of those wonderful people is Nancy Bean, who you just met a few minutes ago and who would be the principal of New Pacific School. Pacific Charter Institute specializes in providing students and families with unique and personalized learning opportunities that frankly, I had no idea existed back when I worked in a traditional district environment. In these last few years, I've seen firsthand how students who have experienced different types of challenges in a typical classroom setting are able to truly thrive when they get a chance to be part of learning programs that are flexible and tailored to their individual interests and needs. This is the case for students with disabilities who we do fully support through special education and accommodation plans, um, as well as just students who need a, something a little bit different um, to spark their curiosity and help them to develop a lifelong passion for learning. I am proud to be a member of this community and I encourage you to vote in favor of New Pacific School so that the great families here can have another choice when it comes to their children's educational experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Angela, Angela Vinkelman followed by Stacy Boydell. Hi, uh, I have two young boys. Sometimes it feels like three, at least. Um, and I'm here to express my enthusiasm for New Pacific as both a parent and a teacher. I'm most excited about the goal of personalization with hands-on small group learning. My children each have clearly unique strengths and challenges, as do my husband and I in parenting them. And I believe that children learn best when they are given just right challenges in a safe and supportive environment. We work on this at home, but full-time home learning isn't sustainable for us. In a traditional classroom, too often teachers are pressured to stay on pace lesson by lesson with their curriculum even when their students are not ready. As a math intervention teacher in a nearby district, uh, this whole class education model keeps me employed for my pullout, but I think a better system for kids is to create a curriculum around personalization and small group learning. I'm also very excited about project-based learning. As a veteran teacher in project-based learning schools um, in a different county, where yes, we've done home visits on the nights and weekends, um, because I see the connection it builds with families early on that we can then capitalize on in the classroom. I've seen firsthand how project-based learning improves engagement, attendance, family school connections, and students' feelings about school. There's a lot of research to back up this claim, but I'll share just one example from experience. During distance learning, it was notoriously difficult to fully engage children in their learning, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the most excited I saw my kids in our PBL school was when my fifth graders did their Genius Hour projects. They investigated their own questions based on an interest. Students were connected with a professional mentor who provided startup advice on their project. They created a product and a presentation to demonstrate new learning. And I saw some of the best writing and the most growth on this project because children had voice and choice in their work. The adult connections, public audience, and student-centered creation products, process made their work important. I want my sons in a school where project-based learning and personalization are the expectations every day and not the cool exceptions. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, uh, let's see. The next speaker is Stacy Boydell, followed by Celeste uh, Marguez. Well, good evening. I'm Stacy Boydell, and I do live in Rancho Cordova. I do own a home there with my husband and my daughter, and I want to support New Pacific School, and I'll give you my reasons why. We all think about life and how we hope it goes a certain way. Well, almost nine years ago, I gave birth to my daughter at 26 and a half weeks. Totally unexpected. She wasn't supposed to live. Thankfully, she did. She pulled through after 101 days in the hospital. She ended up having brain bleeds on both sides of her brain and she uses a wheelchair. But she also thinks differently. She's brilliant. She could tell you all the sounds of all her letters before she was three. She could spell her name before she was three. She knew all the you know, big letters, small letters, because she's a sponge and she loves to learn. We want her to have an opportunity just like any other child to thrive in the right school environment. You've been given the responsibility to make sure that every child in your district has the opportunity to have the best experience and the best outcome. We have tried going to school here in Folsom Cordova, and at first it went wonderfully. She was in kindergarten, it was a very small classroom because it was a half a day, so it was maybe 15 kids, and then the rest of the kids came for an hour, and then the other 15 stayed. That small environment worked well for her. She also did first grade, but it was during the pandemic. She went half a day. Again, wonderful experience. Second grade, disastrous. We need her to have this opportunity where she is in a small school environment. She has opportunity to have hands-on um, project-based learning because that's the way she learns. Her brain works that way. That's the way she thrives. She was very scared to go back to school when I told her she was going to go to New Pacific. But she got to see the coffee with the principal. She got to see people. She got some stickers in the mail. And she's excited. She's excited that tests aren't the way the tests are supposed to be done. She's excited to be in a small classroom. And I think that she needs this opportunity because your goal is to make sure that every child has opportunity. And this is the place that would make her be the best person she can be. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Celeste Marquez, followed by Anna Rohrbaugh. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so one of, um, we currently actually go to El Dorado Hills. My son attends um, Mandarin Immersion in El Dorado Hills. And we have several, several families that go to, to El Dorado Hills for a charter school, to Sacramento, and to Orangeville. And a lot of them um, are going because they're smaller classrooms where their children get that one-on-one -on -one time with the teachers and they get to know them. And then, um, so, we fully support New Pacific School coming to Rancho Cordova. At this point, I am committed to driving 40 minutes to Roseville to take my eight-year-old son to school in August. So um, we're hoping that the more one-on-one -on -one learning environment, the smaller classrooms, the safety, safety keeps getting brought up um, in Rancho Cordova. And um, I want all of our children to be safe and secure and learning and thriving. I think having a really good charter school is a great opportunity to, to attract existing families within Rancho Cordova and other families outside of our city to just help Rancho Cordova in general. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Anna Rohrbauer, uh, followed by Casey Shingera. Hi, nice to see you guys again. I was here six months ago too. It just seems like it was yesterday almost. Um, first, I wanna thank you for the service that you all serve this community. Um, as stated in the, by the California School Board Association, you were elected to make decisions that will best serve all, stu all students in the community you serve. As a homeowner, taxpayer, and parent in this district, amongst many others are here, our input should absolutely be taken into consideration of, of those decisions that you make. I believe it is obvious that no child is the same. They are all special and they all learn a little differently. The same, the, just the way, and, and they want, and parents want opportunities for their kids in education and they deserve alternate opportunities. So we just heard from the previous speaker. In, Novo, in November, you debated, considered, and made a decision that proposed, that the proposed mission of this charter school did not fit your agenda. I don't understand that. 
Pacific Charter has shown they are eager and willing to work with you, and they've been doing that all along the way. It's a, something to consider. I believe it is always a more efficient and better practice to take action than wait for perfection. Those that take action and adjust through any obstacles they may face will always end up further ahead with more experience and wisdom than those that waited until everything is perfect. The truth is you can't perfect something in, t in theory, only through what you learn in doing something. This is something you can take action on immediately. And I wanna address something that came up last time and uh, just got brought up. Um, you were, someone spoke about, um, this is a, these, are, these are opportunities for parents that work two jobs. Um, these are hardworking people that overcome many more obstacles than getting their kids to school. But when they have an opportunity to get a kid into a school when their kid is lagging, you're, you're underestimating their determination to provide a quality education for these kids. So please don't underestimate the parents just because you don't know how they're gonna get to school. They will get there. Thank you. Thank you, um, Casey Shungert. All righty. Hello, um, I'm gonna do more of like a bullet point approach here. So um, in learning about PCI, Roseville is not Rancho. I grew up in the Roseville School District, K through 12. I promise you, not the same demographics. Both are wonderful, but they're wildly, wildly different. Um, currently, PCI, only 11% of their student population is SPED, which has me concerned about adequate support and adequate planning. IEPs, accommodations, what have you. Additionally, when they say that they have a 15 to one ratio of teachers to students because they have a paraprofessional in the classroom, paraprofessionals, IAs, you're badasses, you really are. But that is not a credentialed teacher, so that ratio is, is inappropriate, it's not accurate. Um, let's see, um, project-based learning is not project lead the way. Project-based learning can occur in every single subject matter. I'm dual credentialed in English and social science. I've taught English for the last 10 years uh, here in Folsom, but I taught social science before in San Juan. I've done project-based learning the whole way through. You can do it in math, you can do it in science. Um, you don't need a dedicated school to do it. The home visit component has me very concerned. Um, teachers, yes, are mandated reporters. That This is asking a, a good deal. I also wonder about the appropriateness and are all families gonna be open to, to having visitors in their home. Is that something they are comfortable with? Um, additionally, with transportation, when they say it won't be provided, that, that scares me. Um, my parents both work nights all my life, three nights a week. I spent nights at my grandparents' houses. I would not be able to go to school if I went to these schools. My parents did not have the ability to drive 40 minutes one way after working a 12-hour night shift in a hospital. That would be dangerous. Um, what I hear here is, they have a lot of internship interests, um, but it sounds like it's all about who you know and they don't actually have a program and a pathway designed. So it sounds like a lot of good generalizations, but no true concrete plans that are reflective and celebratory of the Rancho community. Thank you. <laughs> and that's uh, the last written uh, um, notes of people wanting to yeah, that's definitely uh, online. Yes, we have Debbie. Debbie, welcome. Uh, good evening, board and Dr. Kaligi, and thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'm Debbie Krikorian. I'm here to talk a little bit about um, the petition. Um, I went through the petition about the only thing that I saw that was really different was um, Doc, uh, the President Reed had suggested that if they were to open a school south of 50, you would take off the high absentee um, uh, goal as far as getting kids in. And um, the, the charter did that. They took off the high absentee goal of um, attracting kids in their school. But I don't really see much difference other than that. I do have a concern that they're opening three um, brick and mortar schools within a couple of years um, when they've never had a brick and mortar school. And talking to the uh, Department of Education, um, I have a friend that works for the charter schools overseeing them. She said 50% of the charter schools fail, if, especially if they expand too quickly. Um, I've had friends that have gone to work and found their doors chained up because 
um, all of a sudden uh, not enough revenue was there because they expanded too quickly. So this concerns me. Another concern is the fact that New Pacific Charter has um, continually compared us saying that we're not offering these um, programs and that we're not doing diligence with our students, when in fact we have project-based um, learning through Project Lead the Way, through History Day, through our math programs. We have it throughout the whole district. If you go to our students and talk to them, um, you're, you can see that the project based it is good and is what excites them, um, but we're doing that. When you talk to the students about internships, we you listen on Saturday um, to uh, Leisha Cadell. We're doing fabulous <laughs> programs when it comes to internships with our students. Thank you. Next we have Rob. Rob, welcome. Good evening, school board, Dr. Kaligian. Um, I'm back. Um, I'm confused about the new, new Pacific Charter petition. There's still no student transportation. There's still no campus location. There's still no plan for outreach to rancho students with high needs or attendance issues. And New Pacific apparently plans to look to Riverview as a model. How does that enhance our district offerings? Why don't we see how New Pacific actually performs as a brick and mortar school in Roseville? Once we have that data, the board will be in a better position to make a good decision. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Claire. Welcome, Claire. Uh, hello, it's Claire Crawford within the public interest. Um, I would uh, just like to express similar reservations to the reservations that I expressed in public comment the last time this petition was before you. Um, the PCI network has significantly under-enrolled under English learners and other high needs students and their academic track record indicates that they would not serve the interests of the entire community. Um, I think that the concerns that the staff raised with the previous petition around the impact on the, the entire, on the interests of the entire community continue to exist and we're not able to be addressed by this new petition. And I'd like to just also echo what another speaker previously mentioned that uh, for a, a charter management organization with only four schools, all of which are non-classroom based, to open three new schools that are all classroom based within you know about two years is a very big stretch um, and seems unwise. So I would, uh, you know, suggest denial of this petition. Thank you. Thank you. No more. That's it. All right. Uh, back to the board. Any final questions? This uh, will be back on the agenda in August. Correct. The second meeting in August. Yes. Se second, second meeting in yes, August. Yes, August 25th. Okay, August 25th. All right, uh, then uh, I will gavel out uh, uh, by unanimous consent unless there's uh, objection. Okay, all right, and then that starts our next public hearing. Uh, uh, item C, special education local plan area, uh, SELPA local plan, section D, annual budget plan, section E, annual service plan, attachments one through seven, 22 uh, through 23. Superintendent. Yes, this is our annual SELPA plan. Um, as you described in the title, it describes the services for our special education students, related services, as well as bu budget and expenditures. Um, following on the agenda tonight after the public hearing is closed, there'll be action to approve this for 22-23. Uh, Ms. Wessinger is joining us virtually if the board has any questions. Questions from the board? Any? No? Uh, we do, we'll go up for public comment. We do have uh, one, uh, Chelsea uh, Bagan. She's out here, I'm gonna grab her. Okay, we'll just wait one second. She left, oh. Uh, it, Chelsea, are you there? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, oh, there she please is. proceed. Okay. Hi, 
sorry. Um, I'm in my car now. We had to leave. My kids were being too loud. <laughs> I'm actually speaking for somebody else that was unable to make the board meeting tonight. Jen Landeros, she is an education specialist at Folsom Middle School. Uh, she says, I have worked with FCUSD for over 10 years. This career has been rewarding, but also taxing. I am sure you all can understand why I feel like this career is so rewarding. However, I am not sure people have a clear understanding of how and why it is taxing. It, why it is so taxing to be a special education teacher. I hope to explain why this is a fact in this letter by listing what the job entails beyond general education teacher duties. The IEP obligations themselves take up many hours a week. First, I conduct observations on individuals to monitor goals, accommodations, modifications, class placement, behavior, etc. Second, I talk with general education teachers, parents, specialists, and IAs regularly to assist students in many forms. Third, I manage IAs daily who work in my classroom. Fourth, I write, prepare, and conduct at least 35 IEPs for students with disabilities. Meetings are a minimum of one hour and can sometimes take place more than once per student and over two hours. Fifth, I schedule meetings, make sure parents, administration, service providers, and general education teachers attend within the deadline. Sixth, I complete the IEP with the understanding, uh, 20 to 30 pages of the legal document, with the understanding I am responsible by law for making sure that every part of the IEP is accurately carried out on time and agreed upon with the entire team. Uh, seven, my classes are filled with students who have either learning disabilities, behavioral difficulties, or both. My lessons are modified to accommodate learning for these students. Therefore, many lessons are differentiated in multiple ways. Eight, I assess students with a test that takes a minimum of two hours to just conduct. And then the test needs to be carefully scored and used to properly write up everything the IEP entails. And finally, nine, I purchased my own printer to save time on printing IEPs, lessons, et cetera, so I don't have to take an extra five to 10 minutes to walk back and forth to the library. The list of extra duties continues. I don't know where I am on time, but Debrie Kerkorian uh, said she would give up her time for me to finish this. Am I out or going? Go ahead. 50 seconds. 50 okay. seconds, Chelsea. The list of extra, yeah, that's probably all I need. The list of extra duties continues in order for me to meet the needs of my students I arrive at school an hour early. I say that I am an early bird, but truthfully, I have no other choice if I want to meet the needs of my students. I also stay after school and work during my lunch. This does take away from my family obligation. Because of this, my husband carries the burden of doing most of the work parents do for their children. I have five kids, and of these five, three are young and living at home. My 10-year-old twin girls and 12-year-old son are in middle school and active with sports. Two of these children have reading difficulties and need my time daily to help with homework. Trying to make dinner, get each of these kids to softball lessons or practice, soccer practice, tag, or whatever else they involve then takes hours. All of my extra duties I listed to you as a special ed teacher are done with no extra pay. This is also the reason I am considering another position in a district closer to my home. I am torn with the decision because I have a great principal and wonderful students. I am deciding if I should take the chance to have this at another school or stick with where I am at and continue to try to make things work where I am now. Thank you again for taking the time to hear this. I hope this helps with understanding that education specialists should have some sort of compensation for the many extra duties we carry. Sincerely, Jen Lamparos. Thank you. Anybody else mm, online? No, it dropped. Okay, all right. Uh, back to the board, any final questions? Nope, all right. Uh, uh, by unanimous consent, uh, we will gavel out of that public hearing. And we are uh, going into our third and final public hearing on a charter school petition to establish design tech high school um, and staff report. Um, as I mentioned before, we will start um, with the staff report followed by a uh, presentation uh, by uh, design tech, followed by board questions of both staff and design tech. Then we will take public comment and then back to the board. Uh, superintendent. Yes, uh, this is the second public hearing for Design Tech High School and uh, our staff has uh, a report of facts, factual findings from our analysis of the elements required for a charter petition. I'm gonna welcome Ms. Wessinger virtually to join us to share uh, the presentation from staff tonight. Good evening. <laughs> Do we have the presentation up yet? They're working on it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Kaligian, President Reed, members of the board, colleagues, and community. Tonight, I'm bringing to you a summary of the Folsom Cordova staff report 
on the Design Tech High School Charter Petition. I want to acknowledge and thank the team of 20 plus district staff representing various areas of expertise who participated in the review of the petition, including fiscal services, human resources, facilities, curriculum, instruction, site leaders, to name a few. District also sought legal guidance in the preparation of this report. Next slide, please. Design Tech High School submitted a petition to establish a new charter school on April 22nd, 2022. While not targeting any one subgroup of the population, Design Tech High School states in their petition, they will actively recruit and prepare to serve a student population that is representative of the local community. Components of the program include a competency-based curriculum, variable and flexible schedules, an A through G approved design thinking class for every student, an innovation diploma program, industry-based intercession program, and access to high and low tech tools. Next slide, please. California Education Code 47605C sets forth the guidelines to consider in reviewing charter petitions. Findings are divided into three categories, including areas considered met, areas considered deficient, areas considered significantly deficient. Note that these items support the staff findings and recommendations for denial of the petition. Next slide, please. Summary of the findings. Following a comprehensive review and analysis of the petition by Folsom Cordova Unified School District, denial of the petition is recommended based on the following recommended findings of fact. One, granting the design tech charter is not consistent with sound educational practice and with the interests of the community in which the school is proposed to locate. Number two, Design Tech High School is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. Number three, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of the required elements of a charter petition. Number four, Design Tech High School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Analysis of this finding includes consideration of the fiscal impact of the proposed charter school. Next slide, please. Design Tech High School staff report. This is the uh, first of the areas that we considered. These are areas considered met. This is a, a, includes a description of vision, mission, and educational program, measurable pupil outcomes, student progress measurement, and governance structure to name 15 areas are considered met. Next slide, please. While these areas are considered deficient, they do not form the basis for our recommendation for denial as we feel these areas can be remediated. Next slide, please. Areas considered significantly deficient, qualifications of individuals, community impact, unsound educational program. These items support the staff findings and recommendations for denial of the petition and the analysis will be provided under the findings. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, finding number one, Design Tech High School presents an unsound educational program for pupils to be enrolled in the charter school. Design Tech High School is not targeting any one subgroup of the population, although they, although they are aware of the demographic makeup of Rancho Cordova. The assumption is that Design Tech High School would draw the same demographic of students as the community. Design Tech High School states in their petition, they will primarily aim to serve families in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District residing in Rancho Cordova and the surrounding area. Since most of their students would come from Cordova High School, comparisons are made with Cordova High School. Next slide, please. Demographics of the communities. As demonstrated in this slide, the racial and ethnic makeup of the student population at Design Tech High School is predominantly white and Asian. Hispanics or Latinos, Blacks or African Americans, and females are underrepresented at Design Tech High School. Historically marginalized students, including Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, and females make up a much larger percentage of the student population at Cordova High School. Next slide, please. Additional other demographic data. 
While Redwood City has a higher rate of other languages in the home, the rate of English language learners at Design Tech High School is less than 1%. Although the rate of socioeconomically disadvantaged students is representative of the community, it is a very small group of students. Cordova High School has a much more diverse and representative group of students than Design Tech High School. Design Tech High School asserts their program is designed for all students, including those from historically marginalized groups, and that it will provide extra support to students who qualify for free reduced meals and English learners. It appears Design Tech High School has made minimal effort to recruit, enroll, or retain these students in their current program. All students benefit from heterogeneous grouping. The enrollment of mostly white and Asian students and a smaller percentage of Hispanic students to Design Tech will create more homogeneous groupings of students at Cordova High School and at Design Tech High School. Our neediest students, including English learner, learners, socioeconomically disadvantaged students, homeless and foster students, and students in special education with the most intensive needs will not have access or opportunity to a high quality program that supports their needs at Design Tech High School. African American students and female students are underrepresented at Design Tech High School. These homogeneous groupings at both schools may result in de facto segregation. De facto segregation is a segregation of racial groups that arises as a result of economic, social, or other factors rather than by operation or enforcement of laws or other official state action. Next slide, please. The California Code of Regulations provides guidance regarding factors to be taken into consideration in determining whether charter petitioners are demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program. Those consider is include petitioner past history involvement in charter schools. Section 5, California Code 11967. As represented in the chart below, socioeconomically disadvantaged students at Design Tech High School, Redwood City, are performing significantly lower than their counterparts in both Folsom Cordova Unified School District and Cordova High School in English and poor to slightly better in math. And these numbers, the negative numbers, represent the, dist the, dis the distance from standard or the number of points below standard. Next slide, please. Graduation rate comparison. Design Tech High School states they are uniquely positioned to provide a responsive learning environment that addresses the diverse needs of learners and prepares them to flex, adapt, and succeed in high school and beyond. Two measures of success in high school and beyond are the high school graduation rate and college and career readiness. Design Tech High School Redwood City has not demonstrated their program meets or exceeds Folsom Cordova Unified School District or Cordova High School. Next slide, please. The 2017 to 2021 graduation rates in both Folsom Cordova Unified School District and at Cordova High School exceeded Design Tech High School three of the past five years. Cordova High School graduation rates are comparable to district graduation rates. It is notice, notable that socioeconomically disadvantaged students at Cordova High compared much more closely to the high school graduation rate than Design Tech High School students. Socioeconomically disadvantaged students at Design Tech High School performed much lower than their peers. Next slide, please. College and career readiness data was inconsistent over two years at Design Tech High School. Students in Folsom Cordova Unified School District and at Cordova High School were more prepared for college or a career at graduation than Design Tech High School students. Notably, socioeconomically disadvantaged students were nearly as well prepared as their peers. Next slide, please. Thank you. Design Tech High School, this is finding number two. Design Tech High School is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition, special education. Two areas of concern are the charter petition lacks clarity on SELPA membership and staffing concerns. Uh, I do want to note that the staff, district staff did receive responses to questions submitted to Design Tech High School but not in time to address them in the staff report. Design Tech did clarify their intent to join El Dorado SELPA. Uh, they have not had communication with them. However, this does not alleviate the budget concerns entirely for the following reasons. Design Tech only budgeted one teacher 
at $4,000 less than general education teacher. In their response to questions, they indicated they would take $4,000 from the $20,000 for additional expenses. This leaves only $16,000 in year one for related services like speech, occupational therapy, and specialized equipment and other things. Design Tech notes a teacher to student ratio of 20 to one for special education, which would cover all students regardless of disability or need. Olson Cordova Unified School District staffs at a district average of 14 to one, which is a 20 to one RSP ratio and an eight to six, 8.6 to one SDC ratio. Design Tech High School states they served 81 students in 21-22 with a staffing ratio of 20.25 to one teacher and only one instructional aid, whereas FCUSD staffs every special education teacher with instructional aid support plus one-to-one -one IAs. This would indicate that Design Tech is not serving students with intensive needs. Next slide, please. The next issue under, uh, or the next issue is finding three, and this is uh, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of all required elements. This is related to qualifications of individuals and credentialing requirements. The petition states teachers employed by a charter school during the 23-24 school year shall have until July 1, 2025 to obtain the certificate required for the teacher certificated assignment. Once again, on this uh, related to this area, we did hear from Design Tech High School, but it was before, um, it wasn't in time to address it in the report. Um, so uh, they have indicated they will affirm compliance with AB 1505. However, it is unclear if Design Tech is in agreement with the district's interpretation of AB 15.05, but this is an area we feel we, uh, could be remediated. Design Tech High School staff report finding four, and this is community impact. Design Tech High School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entirety entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. And this analysis under of community impact will include fiscal impact, duplicity and proposed program and capacity. The summary of the fiscal impact. This is a summary of the fiscal impact. The fiscal impact does take into consideration the cost savings that would come from a loss of enrollment. Before the cost savings, the fiscal impact from the enrollment loss is $29,414,570. We calculated the net loss after taking into account the savings four ways, with between 70 to 100% of design tech students coming from Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Next slide, please. The summary of the, of the fiscal imp impact of the loss of enrollment, the estimated cumulative net loss is between 15,254,184 and $21,703,396 over five years. These estimates in ADA loss include potential savings from a reduction in FCUSD staff to adjust for a reduction in enrollment. Before the cost savings, the fiscal impact from the enrollment loss is 29,414.570. The total teacher loss ranges from 16.24 FTE to 23.20 FTE. The 2021 staffing ratio represents a staffing ratio of one to 11. I'm sorry, the 2021-2022 staffing re represents a staffing ratio of 11 to one, one to 11 staff to students. Design Tech High School proposes small class sizes, but with their proposed budget and staffing, they are not able to provide the, the support or uh, same staffing ratio of 11, one to 11 that FCUSD provides. The financial impact to Folsom Cordova Unified School District is substantial. The total net loss of 580 students over five years equal $21,703,396. This is the equivalent of a reduction in staff of about 24 certificated and 40 classified staff over four years. 
services and programs in Rancho Cordova would be substantially impacted. Due to the impact on enrollment, the district would have to examine the viability of programs at Cordova High School on an annual basis. These programs include junior ROTC, electives, academic support periods, and the International Baccalaureate Program. Design thinking, which is the program Design Tech High School proposes to operate in Rancho Cordova, is embedded throughout the International Baccalaureate Program. Duplicity and proposed program. Design Tech has high school lists six elements that create a unique high school experience. One, a competency-based curriculum. Two, variable and flexible schedules based on student need. Three, an A through G approved design thinking class for every student. Four, innovation diploma program. Five, industry partner-based intercession program. And six, access to low-tech and high-tech tools. Each of these six elements currently exist within Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Many of the experiences design tech high school outlines as unique to design tech high school as reasons to open the charter or experience that are offered throughout Folsom Cordova Unified School District. It is unclear whether Design Tech High School is offering any additional educational services or programs beyond what already exists within Folsom Cordova Unified School District and are available to the parents and students for which Design Tech School proposes to serve. Also, there are no data points to show that Design Tech High School will be more successful than schools and programs already provided by Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Folsom Cordova Unified School District is responsive to the needs of the community, whether it be innovative programs such as International Baccalaureate and Career Technical Education, quickly moving students and faculty into distance learning through one-to-one -one computer distribution and hundreds of hours of technology training for teachers, moving their instruction to online learning, being the first district to bring students back to in-person learning in Sacramento County, or opening a brand new K through 12 online academy for students who thrive in that environment, Folsom Cordova Unified School District has a long history of ex executing and supporting innovative educational programs. Next slide, please. Capacity, thank you. FCUSD completed an analysis of analysis of capacity at all district high schools and all three have more than enough capacity for enrollment as follows Cordova High School enrollment of 1,902 with a capacity of 2,510 Folsom High School enrollment of 2,616 with a capacity of 2,966 and Vista Del Lago enrollment 1,727 with a capacity of 2,000 and nine staff finds that approval of design tech high school would substantially impact exist existing services academic offerings and or programmatic offerings currently within the Folsom Cordova Unified School District moreover design tech high school would duplicate programs currently offered within the Folsom Cordova Unified School District and Folsom Cordova Unified School District has sufficient capacity for students Design Tech High School proposes to serve. As such, the Design Tech High School petition is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Uh, lastly, in accordance with California Education Code 47605, Design Tech High School will be afforded equivalent time to respond to the staff report and recommended findings of fact. Any member of the public will have an opportunity to voice their input or opinion regarding the petition to establish Design Tech High School. If the Board of Education denies the Design Tech High School charter petition, the proposed charter school may appeal the decision to the Sacramento County Board of Education within 30 days of the denial determination. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Now, uh, Design Tech. Welcome. Good evening. Um, thank you to the district and the board for your time this evening. Um, my name is Dr. Wendy Little, and um, I will be kicking off our response to the staff findings tonight. 
Um, so an overview, we're going to give a review of our core program, response to staff findings, and finally some conclusions and um, time for questions. We have several links in the presentation that show further data to support the conclusions that we will share with you. And we are um, happy to click into any of these that the board wants to examine further. So first of all, our mission. <laughs> Again, we believe the world can be a better place and that we are the ones to make it happen, our students, our staff, our whole learning community. And our program summary, just to remind you that we have an academic curriculum that is rooted in competency-based learning and assessment, and we pair that with a deep problem-solving curriculum that is rooted in empathy and design thinking. And when we put these two things together, we really unlock students' potential so they see themselves as active change makers, active agents in their communities while they're in high school. And then next, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kim Montgomery to go over our response to staff findings. Great. Um, thank you, Superintendent Klee and President Reed and Board of Trustees and District Staff. So we're going to move through these pretty quickly. Um, so we have this extensive list where we agree that um, we met the evaluation criteria set forth in the California Education Code. Because as you know, with charter schools, there are specific reasons that you have to deny. And we agree that this criteria, that we met these as well. There were a couple of just points for clarification that item K um, was listed in the staff report. It was identified as deficient, but it didn't have any analysis and it was also identified as met. So we're assuming it's met. And item E, employee qualifications, which um, Betty Jo already covered, um, it wasn't cited as an area meeting the requirements and it wasn't listed as the area considered deficient on page five, but it was, as she said, um, part of the significant deficiencies. So we'll treat it as deficient. All right, so these, like I already mentioned, item K, and then um, these item K, item M, and item N, they are all areas that are identified as areas considered deficient, but the district staff provided no analysis. So we'll agree with the district staff that they can either be fixed with remediation. But we do want to note that identifying an area as deficient with no analysis as impermissible as a basis for denial of the petition. So. These were areas identified as not meeting the evaluation criteria. And again, these were things I believe Betty Joe said that we can work with the district on to um, work them out. But we do want to point out that the analysis provided in the, by the district for items F, G, and the facilities are factually and legally in inaccurate. And therefore, it's impermissible basis for denial of the petition. And I should also point out if you have any questions, our legal counsel, um, Janelle, is over on Zoom. So if you have any questions on, um, the legal and the impermissibility of some of these things, Janelle will be happy to raise her hand and explain them. All right, so these were the areas considered to have significant deficiencies. So the first one, it sounds like we have this resolved. Like we agree that the language that the district cited on page 89, it was an inadvertent typo. And so the charter school is aware of, we agree, we will follow the guidelines of AB 1505. And it sounds like we have a very similar interpretation of it. The next one is special ed. So there are three reasons for this. First, the reason in the district analysis that there's no documentation that charter schools consulted with the SELPA. Uh, we provided an email where we were in contact with the El Dorado SELPA on April 22. We cannot make this as a grounds for denial because the timelines for membership has not commenced, but we are in communication already. We started in April. The next one, it was unclear, the district said it was unclear whether the charter school will follow districts or the SELPA's guidelines. It depends. If we are accepted into El Dorado SELPA, we'll follow the SELPA's guideline. If we become a school of the district, then we'll follow the district's guidelines. Um, in our first school, our very first year, we operated as a school of the district. That was one of the things that the board did at the meeting with the vote. They passed us, um, but then they directed dif district staff to work on an MOU to resolve some things that they had concerns about. One of them was special ed. So at the meeting, the board voted to pass, and directed district staff to work with the school to solve these things. And um, special ed was one of them. So we became a school of the district for our very first year. The next one is, is the staffing does not seem to be sufficient. So one part of this is depending on enrollment and student need, we'll adjust our staff accordingly. That's what we do. That's what all schools do. It's also important to note that the CMO, Design Tech Learning, we will provide support to the school site. We have a director of student services who has extensive experience in special education. We also, as it came up tonight, there's a lot of paperwork associated. We have somebody that works remotely that does a lot of the paperwork for IEPs. So what you see as the staffing model 
for design tech at Rancho, that's not all the special ed support that's provided because there's also special ed provided through the district office where our district office is CMO. And it's also, we have a full inclusion model. So it does change some of the things in terms of the special education program. We believe special ed students benefit the most when they're fully included. So that's one of the reasons that our program might look different or the staffing might look different than what you are used to seeing. The next one, community impact. So the district identified four reasons for their findings in this area. The first one, fiscal impact. Basically, the argument was that it'll have this significant fiscal, fiscal impact, it'll undermine the existing services. Um, as the district noted in its published staff report, that the analysis does not account for the potential savings, but I see in the presentation that that analysis has changed, so we did not have time to respond to that piece of it. But also the analysis does not take into account that in 2021, I'm sure you were on the school facility needs, that the district is projected to grow by 5,000 students. So even if 500 students are full enrollment, we are capped. I know that was a question that keeps coming up. We do have an enrollment cap. So even if 500 students come, the district's still gonna grow by 4,500. So we look at it as not causing the problem, actually helping the district alleviate some of the problems that are, can be associated with a growing population and overcrowded schools. So the fiscal impact numbers do not take into account any of this revenue or any of this enrollment group growth, which was the district found in 2021. Um, the next one is the, the duplication of programs. There are two reasons that this finding mischaracterizes the school's program. First off, the analysis does not actually capture our programs. <laughs> like competency-based learning, the students don't progress until they meet the standards. We don't have Ds. You have to like this proficient. And so you could see like some of the data, especially on A through G completion, will look very differently if the district really were grading all their students on a four-point rubric, like we do, like really doing competency-based learning. Same with intercession, the innovation diploma. And again, we during questions, we're happy to talk more about how these really are different, but it just doesn't adequately characterize. Like the innovation diploma, that's something that we created, that we have, we support schools around the world in enacting that. So to say that the same program is offered in the district is really mis a mischaracterization. And it's also important to note that the programs cited by the district as being duplicate, duplications, they're not found in a single school site. They're across the district and they're least accessible to the families in Rancho Cordova. Advisory, every school except for the families in Rancho Cordova. Flex time, not in Rancho Cordova. The CTE pathways, all the CTE pathways that lean very tech heavy, not in Rancho Cordova. So when you're saying that these, these programs were duplicating it, compared across the district, they're mischaracterized, and they're actually least accessible to the families in Rancho Cordova. And the last one, um, this one I didn't fully understand it, but it's basically it's just saying that the existing program, which I assume is a district program, has the capacity to <laughs> support the pupils. There was no analysis provided in this, so we can't be, it can't be a reason for denial for factual and legal reasons. So I'm going to now pass it off to Nicole Sarah, our Director of Learning, to talk about the educational program. Good evening, everyone. Um, so the district uh, report claimed that the school has an unsound educational program based primarily on two reasons. Um, the demographics at Design Tech at Oracle being different from the demographics at Cordova High School and Cordova High School um, having a greater success in educating uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged students. And I'll address uh, these reasons. All of these reasons fall into one of these three categories. They're either legally impermissible, uh, they're a mischaracterization of demographic and achievement data, uh, and or they are data used by the district that does not support the finding that they state. Regarding the legal impermissibility, um, using data on enrollment from another charter school in a different City in a different county um, doesn't provide a factual basis that's needed for a denial of a charter petition. Uh, but even if it um, you know, was to be allowable, it's important to note that the district report mischaracterizes our demographic data. Uh, they compare the school's demographic data to a very uh, large uh, region in the Bay Area. But when you compare our uh, enrollment data to our closest local comprehensive high school, it's actually very similar. So we are attracting a similar uh, demographic. 
uh, and also our staff demographics, um, while we'd like them to align even more with our student body demographics, they do align more closely to our student body than the um, FCUSD student and staff demographics. Uh, also, the achievement data um, is maybe not as thorough as it could be and uh, therefore mischaracterizes uh, the achievements that we have made. Um, so they claim that we don't do as well as Cordova High School in educating uh, particularly socioeconomically disadvantaged students. But in fact, three out of our four recent CAST tests show that um, the DTEC proficiency rates are either similar or better uh, than Cordova High School for SED student populations. Uh, also, the uh, career and college indicator rate um, in our most recent year in 2021 significantly outperforms Cordova High School, um, and that includes four SED students. Um, and then two uh, data sets are not acknowledged in the district report, the college cohort acceptance rate uh, and also the A to G completion rate, both of which exceed um, the data at CHS and um, the A to G completion rate exceeds every school in uh, FCUSD, which we think shows actually a very strong and sound educational program. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Montgomery. So we understand that the district's attempt to show that the educational program outlined in our petition is unsound. We understand that attempt, but the way the district goes about it, it does not actually directly analyze our school program. Instead, they compare our demographic data. Comparing the demographic data of one school to the demographic data of another school is not the basis for finding that the educational program is unsound. And again, comparing the achievement data, these are schools that are, they're not, <laughs> they're 100 miles apart. It doesn't provide any insight into the soundness of the educational program. It doesn't say that competency-based learning doesn't work. It doesn't say that design thinking doesn't raise student achievement. It doesn't say that design thinking and in innovation to program does not help kids get into school, get into college. But even when you compare the achievement data, it's marginally better than doing the demographic data, but we compare favorably on the metrics used by the districts. And when you consider the college acceptance rate to the UC system, then our outcomes are strikingly better. I know they use the graduation rate. It's, it's a little confusing to us when we talk about the mischaracterization. I'm sure it's an honest mistake, but there was a graduation. It said our graduation rate in 2017 was 80 some percent. We had zero graduates in 2017. Our very first graduating class was 2018. So as it is confusing to us to understand like how this data is presenting an unsound educational program. The same with the college and career indicators. It says 2.5% our first year. The college and career indicator data is based on once your seniors graduate. So we didn't, again, we didn't have any seniors graduating. So, and the, the data that they showed, it was from 2019, they showed one year. When you look at the full picture of the data of our CAS scores, we're actually doing pretty well. And especially when you talk about college acceptance and our focus on the outcomes that matter the most for kids, which we believe is them finding their path in life and having all the opportunities open to them at the, when they leave our school, we feel that we're, our educational program is very sound. So, in conclusion, that we really believe that if a vote to deny on this would be removing some new opportunities for Rancho Cordova students. We believe that our responses provide ample evidence for a vote to support the Design Tech Charter petition and for us to successfully serve students in Rancho Cordova beginning in fall in 2023. I and mean, we've heard, I mean, not just, just from us, but also obviously New Pacific, that it's really about serving the students and providing new opportunities. Even when we're comparing the data with the schools, we don't wanna get into this like, well, our school is better than yours. Like the big comprehensive high school, it is the right fit for quite a few kids. A smaller model focused on the things that we're focused on, that's the right fit for a lot of kids. It's not like, a, there's not a one size fit all, fits all kid. So there's not like a one size a fits all educational program. And so that's why we're really just asking for your support and giving the opportunities for the families of the district to choose. Because like I said, it's not, we know that um, all of us thrive more when we're in an environment that is better suited, is better, a better fit for us as individuals. So let's give the families a choice. So thank you. For, I know we still have a little bit of time, but we're open to questions now. And again, we can click down on any of the data. So thank you. 
All right, uh, let's uh, go to uh, board questions for um, either design tech or staff. We'll start with uh, Mr. Uh, Hui, do you have any? Yeah, uh, let's start with uh, some questions for the staff. Uh, if we can bring that presentation back up. <clears throat> um, and maybe start on page 18. It was just mentioned in the last presentation, um, but we are expecting the district to grow over the next five years, um, which is what this last col or second to last column shows the total loss over five years. Um, according to the presentation we just saw, that growth is going to be about 4,500 uh, high school students uh, or students altogether. Mr. Martin, can you maybe? Yeah, yeah, that would be. Um, I, I think that's factually inaccurate. The report that they're referring to, the number 5,000 was not students, but homes. Um, and so the factor would be less than that. How um, many, sorry to interrupt, I mean, how many students do we expect to grow by in the next for five For that years? purpose, for that document was 3,000. Okay. Um, but that calculation is used for uh, developer fee justification right. and OPSC. It's not for what I use for budgetary purposes. Okay. Um, our, our current budget uh, that we presented to the board that was approved um, actually saw increase over the next few years of about 200 because the number of new students is offset by the decline that we're having as a district with 12th grade going out and kindergarten coming in. As we discussed, if we didn't have the new home construction, we'd actually be a declining enrollment district. Um, in the 24-25 year, based off of the enrollment numbers that um, would be potentially, assuming about 80% of the students that would be going to design tech come from Folsom Cordova, uh, that would actually put us in a declining enrollment situation for 24-25. Okay, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit lost. I apologize. I know we had that report, and that was uh, based on uh, developer fees, I think, at our last board meeting, uh, which showed an increase of, you said, 5,000 5, or 3,000 uh, homes? 5,000 homes, 5, and then homes. where our, our, what we call our yield factor is calculated in that. So it, it's, I believe we're somewhere around a 0.6, and that's for all, all grade levels. That's not high school. That's right. for the entire district of 3,000 students. But again, we're, we're our... Uh, 12th grade going out and then the kindergarten coming in and that's also that 3,000 is over I believe a five-year period so that you know and then additionally again we're losing kids in other grades but again that number is used for the purposes of OPSC and developer fees and not for the purposes of budget and um, actual calculation when we're dealing with numbers for financing. Okay, so the number that we're looking at on this page is the number that you use for the actual budget, not the anticipated uh, students that might be moving in from new development. So, yeah, so the numbers on this particular page are only associated with the assumption of somewhere between 100 to 70% uh, of the students that would be going to the new school, uh, design, uh, I'm sorry, design tech, um, would be coming from the district. So we're giving a range there of the lost revenue associated with those students. And that's a net loss. So what we want to recognize is that includes uh, this, the, there's an additional cost above and beyond what we're showing here because we're already assuming in, in the scenario that at 100% a loss of 23 teachers, right? So we're assuming a loss of 23 teachers and associated costs for students on that. And then on top of it, we are, we're potentially losing $21 million over the five-year period um, that would, would impact it. So. Yeah, I think that might be reflected on page 20 of this presentation as well, if we can go there. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be clear, because we are, we are calling this a revenue loss, uh, I believe, uh, total, the total net loss. Um, I know it was mentioned in the previous presentation, but to be clear, the funding follows the student. That's not... That's not the district's money. That is the student, the money that comes with the student, correct? Definitely. It, it is associated with the student, but the, the assumptions we normally build is those students would be here in our programs. Uh, with the students moving to another program, it obviously would reduce yeah. what we have in the budget. Certainly. Right? Yeah. I guess the other way we could say that is that, uh, you know, the, the schools that Folsom Cordova runs, that money wouldn't be going to those schools, but the students residing within our district that went to design tech, that money would be with them. Correct, yeah, and it, it, it's, you know, it's one of these things where obviously you're seeing that there, there are gonna be staff 
above and beyond just the teachers and all of those pieces. And so all of those dollars, that additional 21 million would be filling those, those needs for their school. Right, right. So. right. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 22 states that uh, the staff finds that approval of Design Tech High School would substantially impact existing services. I won't read the rest of that sentence, but I think we understand what that says. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Kligan, maybe this one's for you, but did our district speak with the, the high school that's located closest to Design Tech at Oracle about the impact the, to their programs once Design Tech moved in? <clears throat> Dr. Huber, did you, um, can you answer that question, please? No, we, we didn't speak to any of the schools around Design Tech High School. I, I can speak a little bit to that. The, the district that, that that school is housed in is a basic aid school district. Um, meaning they receive more dollars in local property tax than they would get through LCFF. So they're not harmed financially by that school. In fact, they actually end up getting more money per pupil because those students that would go and take from the existing basic aid funding would instead be allocated to their program. Okay. Uh, to, to be clear, though, we the, the dis, FCUSD did not speak with that school to find out if there was any impact on their programs. That's correct. Uh, I mean, they're, they're receiving a certain amount per student, and regardless if several students leave the school, that would have an impact on their program, I would imagine. Uh, whether that's positive or negative, I don't know. Uh, did the district speak to the, uh, the district that is currently chartering Design Tech at Oracle to find out the impact on any of their programs? No, we did not talk to the district either. Okay, and did the district speak with the district in which Design Tech Oracle is located within to see if there was any impact on their programs? No, we did not. Okay. We are saying that we think that this would substantially impact our existing programs. Was that based on like some scientific research or studies that we've looked at? In terms of what was just shared by Mr. Martin, in terms of the fiscal impact, the fact that they're coming from the San Mateo School District, again, you know, to the point in terms of as the funding streams are different, you know, you could lose a, a significant amount of students and it and not impact your program. Um, the loss of students might mean you wouldn't have to reduce teaching staff or support staff because you have other funding sources. They have under, uh, other funding sources that we don't have access to. So that, that, that was the main reason in terms of the difference we saw between their district and our district and uh, the impact would have on our district compared to theirs. So the, 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 that first sentence there, that we're talking entirely based on what we anticipate the financial impact being of Design Tech moving into our district, if it's approved. In terms of this consideration, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just a few more questions for uh, uh, Design Tech, if we can move over to their presentation. You mentioned you had some, some data connected with some of these. I did want to give you a chance to kind of go through some of that. If we can go to page 10, um, you touched a bit here on the racial and ethnic balance. Um, I'd love to just hear you speak a little bit more to that. What, what, okay, yeah, if you could click on the link, please. And also, do we have a chance to respond to some, some of the things that were just said? I mean, yeah. just because like we have this, I mean, I may, maybe we're misunderstanding this, but the report where we got that 5,000 number it says um, the school facility program capacity is 21,527, and it projects to be 27,220 by the 25-26 school year, leaving 5,693 pupils unhoused. That's where we got the number, and that was a district document. So that's okay. So I apologize if we right. Yeah, no, that. for sure. It's that's part of the OPSC section of the document. That is a different calculation. On page 10 of the document, it talks about the actual housing and the number of pupils. So I think that that's an exhibit in a different section for a specific um, purpose for the OPSC calculations, I believe, so. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we were just saying there's 21,000 and that's, that's where we got it. And then also the basic aid, the basic aid districts, they pay us, they pay the charter school. So they do lose the revenue. Right. So like when a student, the closest school to us is Carl Mott High School, it's a basic aid district. When that's Sequoia Union High School district, when a student from Carl Mont comes to our school, Sequoia pays us the money for that student. So and, that's, I mean, it's, and sorry, their programs have not been impacted. Okay, and do you, are you aware if they have CTE programs? Um, they do have CTE, but it's, just, it's very different than from what we're doing. Like CTE tends to be, um, focuses very tightly on a specific career pathway, and it's all in-house, where our model is really bring the students out into the community. So it's really, it's just not a comparison, so it doesn't, 
it's not like that we're we're not looking to use the same resources. Okay. So um, item G, please. Yes. Can you click on that. So the the first part is the district's claim under that was just that the recruitment plan is vague and doesn't address cultural responsiveness. And this is just quoting from the the district um, what was in their staff report. So the conclusion that a recru recruitment plan is vague, that does it, that's just based on speculation, it's not on facts, and that's not a permissible basis for denial of the charter to say that our plan is vague. And we do agree, disagree with the staff's assessment that the legal requirements for this is to provide a reasonably comprehensive description. And we believe that we have a reasonably comprehensive description and there's no legal requirement to include benchmarks, so we cannot lawfully be denied for a lack of benchmarks of certain um, demographic groups in our petition. And then if you do, I mean, I know you all have access to this. If you look at the demographic data, when you compare it, I know like the district compared it to Redwood City. We're actually not in Redwood City. We're in Redwood Shores, which is an annexed um, portion of Redwood City. And when you compare it to our closest high school, Carlmont High School, which is about two and a half miles away, we compare favorably. And we also feel that it's the the thing, we, we don't have control over the demographic makeup. Of course, we will do a lot of outreach, as we outlined in here, but we do have even more control about what the staff makeup. We feel the diversity of our staff. There's work to do, just like there's work to do in this district, but we feel like it's on the, we're on the right path. I think, yeah, that's actually was my next question. On page 24, it sounds, looks like we're, there's some information about demographics and staff demographics. Would that speak to what you're talking about Yeah, right exactly. Okay. Would you mind showing us that data? Um, could you go to page 24, please? And then um, just click on the staff demographics link. So this is just looking at the county that's our authorizer and then comparing our students and their change compared to the county and um, to the students. So as you can see that um, we, we compare favorably to the district because I think if you go to the next slide, that's a district comparison. So yes, it's like we're not 100% matching up representative. It's not like a one-to-one -one matchup but we are moving in that direction. And then when you compare compare us like to the demographic makeups, like you like if you look at um, you know black or African American, 2.8% of the county, but our staff is 4.8%. And then if you click on the next slide, like this is comparing in um, in the Folsom Cordova Union School District. So it's one of those things I think like we all have a lot of work to do on. Yeah. But but we we're not markedly underrepresented, and that, that what we just saw there was the staff demographics. If we think we go back, oh to yeah, if you go back, click student. up like three more, I think, okay. uh, down one more. Sorry, yeah. So that's our closest high school. So if you compare us, which we feel again, I want to emphasize comparing the demographics of two schools that are very far apart, that's not a reasonable way to analyze the soundness of the educational program. Like imagine if there were a charter school coming in front of you that's in, um, you know, that's in a totally different state. That's, 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 not, that's not the way to make the analysis. But even if we do look at the demographic, you can see that we compare, we compare favorably. Like we're, we're not that different from the local high school. And that's, so when you're saying, when you're comparing us to the Redwood City community, which is, in their census data, yeah, it's not going to look the same. Redwood City's big. Like I said, we're not in Redwood City, but we compare us to the neighborhood high school. It's not. It's not substantially different. Great. Uh, so last last one on page twenty five. Uh, you know, after that disclaimer that we are kind of comparing apples to oranges here. Um, you know, we did the, the staff report did include a lot of this data. Um, so I, I would actually love for you to go through each four of these to. Um, to show us, because in in the petition, some of those numbers were a little bit confusing, the two and a half percent. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it helped clear it up as well as to see what. The yeah. So uh, Nicole, like. our director of learning, will, will talk, talk about this. Okay. So first, I'll review um, the CASP data. Oh, sorry. Actually, I can't click on that. <laughs> Um, so this data here shows test scores from 2019 and 2017. In 2018, we had a testing irregularity due to a technical issue where students uh, 
like finish the test before it was over. And so we weren't able to submit data for that year, which did impact obviously the um, you know indicators that you're seeing, including the college and career indicator that we'll look at um, later. But the CAST data from 2017 and 19, that's our very first year that we had 11th graders, 2017, 2019 was the next year that we had um, test data that was, uh, you know, regular. And then uh, after that was COVID, so we don't have test data from 20 or 21. Um, but you can see for English language arts, when we compare to Cordova High School um, in 2019, we're pretty similar. Uh, well, we're, for all students, we, um, you know, more of our students were proficient in English language arts. Among um, socioeconomically disadvantaged students, we were pretty similar. Among students with disabilities, we um, surpassed uh, Cordova High School in terms of percentage that were proficient in ELA. Um, and then in math, we see um, some similar trends. Um, you know, all students, uh, we had more students proficient. Uh, among SED students, more students proficient in math. And for students with disabilities, again, more students at DTEC proficient in math. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. Those are not great numbers, but we're not significantly worse at educating um, SED students than Cordova High School. Uh, and then in 2017, you see um, one test was significantly better at Cordova High School, the ELA exam that year. Um, more students were proficient, um, but I think that we made some adjustments and improved in our program, and you can see that reflected in the data. I, I think that maybe with the I don't know if these are in order. There were about four different sections on that page 25 showing some Oh, yeah, data. so maybe back to 25. Um, then there's the college and career indicator. Um, so you can see that in 2017, we didn't have uh, a cohort, a four-year cohort by then, um, because we hadn't been around long enough. So there's no data there, um, even though the district report did include data there. I don't, I'm not really sure where that data came from. Um, in 2018, we had a 61% of our student um, body were college and career um, ready, 50% uh, among socioeconomically disadvantaged and not enough students in our um, students with disabilities category. In 2019, you can see it's very low, and that's, again, because of that testing irregularity. The CASP exam is one of the two things that we use to um, generate our college and career indicator. So because we had no test data for that year, we have a very low college and career indicator. But you can see in 2020, um, once that cohort graduated, uh, our numbers were very um, similar and much improved, in, especially in the um, students with disabilities category. Um, and then the college cohort acceptance rate. Um, so this is just out of our total graduating student body, uh, what percent were accepted at the University of California? Um, so you can see um, we've improved in this too over the years, uh, originally around 30%. Now um, in the most recent year, we have data 35, um, which is significantly better than Cordova High School. And then our A to G completion rate, 100% um, of our graduates do um, complete all the A to G requirements. And that's part of the program. Yeah, because our graduation requirements are exceed the A to G requirements. So everyone who graduates earns that. Okay, thanks. That's it for me. All right, uh, Mr. Short. Does that sound better? Yes. Oh, the other one had looked like something ate the, ate the mic off. <laughs> uh, we're talking about location again. Um, I know we've heard even from Pacific that location is not required by law, but um, do you have a location that you can at least say it's within this area? Last time you said it was going to be in the Cordova Vela area. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And do you have a building, you know, because... I'm in the kind of in the building industry, and 
I, a lot of, I deal with a lot of commercial folks. They have tentative leases. You can, you can pinpoint a place. You can get everything lined up. You can get everything all ready with the city. And, and now even sign a contract yet, but you can line it all up. Do you have something like that? Because you're going to be opening up when? Um, August 2023, so over That's, a year. You know, two months, not even? No, 2023. Oh, 2023. 2023. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I thought... Everybody was saying this, as I want it clear, because that doesn't give you any time to no, do that. No, that would not work at all. So, so do you have a location now a little bit better to tell the, the uh, board? We definitely, again, we want to be in that um, area for reimbursement for the SB 740 program. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that, we also, and Wendy can talk about this more, because she was meeting with somebody from the city today who will go through and help us um, make sure everything's up to code and give us like the okay on all the properties. I mean, the... The, I know you're not supposed to do real estate negotiations in open session, <laughs> well, <laughs> but well. I can say, I mean, the, for example, like, um, and I, I, I'm hesitant to even throw this out because I don't want everybody like looking at stuff and saying that's not going to work because of this, this, and this. But like, for example, on White Rock, White Rock Road, there's a property. We're working with the commercial real estate brokers, um, CBRE, to help us find find it. So it's like, like one zero five four zero White White. Rock Road. It's a place, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a place that might work. <laughs> oh, that gives us an idea. Yeah. I just want to know that. Okay, great. And it's a commercial building, yes. warehouse or? No, it's more office. More office than warehouse. All right, thank you for that. And then I think the last time I asked why, you know, you know, you said we didn't have a discussion about dependent versus independent. And, and when I first interviewed you, you, were, you said you would be open to probably dependent where we can run through the governance to the governing board and, and work together and partner with community and the city and everybody else and have a win-win-win situation. Are you still having that discussion or is there a reason why you want to go independent just because you want to have the money to follow you and all that kind of stuff? Um, it's the, I mean, we've never been approached by district staff to have that discussion, so, so we weren't going to initiate it. The, um, we went down a similar road with the district of San Mateo the first time talking about it and there are certain autonomies that we that we need um, like staffing autonomies location and when we were looking with the district um, last time we were just looking at like the way that we run our bell schedule for example and the district looked at their collective bargaining agreement and said well if you're going to be part of this then we'd have to like make this a special exception in the CBA and it just both the teachers union and the district staff agreed the only way for us to make our program work was to be independent so it's not, I'm not saying it's impossible, but we would def, there are definitely some autonomies that we would need to have full control of to implement our program. Right, so, so being independent, the governing board doesn't have any control over the operations? or No, but stuff. you have the ultimate control that in year five, you cannot renew us. Year five, <laughs> so the first five years, you have total autonomy. Exactly. Okay. I mean, it's not total autonomy. I mean, there's definitely because the authorizer... Um, there's a fee built into our budget for this. The authorizer has oversight responsibilities. Like a 1% or something like that? Um, it depends on whether it's 1% to 3%. Just it's kind of like a little oversight thing. But yeah, we can't, and so they can, we can't, like, we can't stop you, though. But Oh, uh, yeah, you can. Like So, for example, there are certain things that if we're doing it at the moment <laughs> that the authorizer can, during the, like, we do this with our district, like, um, like San Mateo, they come in and they review, they look at all the credentials of our staff. And so as a, that's one of their duties as the authorizer to provide oversight. Okay. And so if they came in and we did not have credential teachers, they could effectively shut us down right there. Oh, okay. So it, it's an instant shutdown or do we have to go well, through Well, not like that day. <laughs> yeah. I, there's got to <laughs> no, be some process like, that won't take like, a long time. They don't turn out the time, lights yeah. and tell everybody to leave. Just like the county oversighting us, it, it takes a while. We get that letter. Yeah. So there are so definitely there's some, some similarities. Yeah. Right. There are definitely some extreme examples. Or right. not examples. There's some extreme, extreme incidents. Okay. Without uh, well, that'd be good to know how that works a little bit better. The other thing is, um, you know, we we're talking about your denial of the staff report. Isn't it incumbent upon the petitioner to really do the analysis and really show? Because it really is subjective. A lot of this is subjective. And I didn't hear any prescriptive law saying what our staff did was illegal and impermissible. You just use those words. But there's always interpretation and gray areas of law. You know, I, I deal a lot with law, too, and I'm sure our, our president is, too. Is interpretation gray, or is it, if it doesn't say it, doesn't mean you can't use it. So I'm, I think it's subjective at this point. So, uh, If you'd like the answer, Janelle can raise her hand and answer that on Zoom. I mean, the, the, I know that the charter code said there are certain reasons you can and cannot decide. Well, well I, I don't want to get in a pissing contest right now with two attorneys because... 
they they can you can put two attorneys in a room and argue all day long. It's like yeah. So well, I, if I you want to do that, that, well, I'll step outside. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah they'll step outside. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Not an it, it's just again, it's a matter of opinion. So so anyway, I just want the board to understand that's it's an interpretation, and we we're just gonna have to agree to disagree on that one. Um, where where are the CTE programs that you're saying? A matrix, if you will, of all the programs you're saying that we're not providing that are not equal or duplicative. I mean, you just say it, but we have a lot of CTE programs and a lot of quality programs in Rancho Cordova that we just had a workshop on that we provide, pro provide to the public that are huge. And we've been doing it for years and they provide a lot. You just say it, but I, don't, I didn't see a matrix of each program you're, that well, says we that. Don't, oh, we don't do CTE. Like we don't do CT programs. So that's why I'm saying it's not a straight comparison. Academies, project, what all the things you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we, we believe that um, the world is changing quickly and unpredictably, and that the best we can do for kids is to give them a transferable skill set as opposed to teaching them to really go into a certain career, then in 10 years that career disappears. So instead we teach them design thinking, we have them explore a lot of different careers like through Oracle coding classes, Oracle data analysis classes, um, Dr. Little can talk more about the intercession programs. CTE is more, we're teaching well, you. I'm not just talking CTE or academies. We have a, a whole menu, a different kind of design also, and projects and everything. We have a, a, a big menu, mm -hmm. and it's a list that the staff has. But I just wanted to know, did you do a comparison? You just said it, but I don't see that comparison. It's just a, a words you're using. Well, yeah, we're, words. we have a table. You do have a table, so maybe you want to share that uh, okay. to the to the board and say how you compared them. Um, and the yeah. big thing that we, well, I mean, the big thing that we, I think, but I think what you say is like a table of all of ours yeah. compared to theirs. And in the last question I have, um, you know, we, the last time on the when your first hearing, I asked, you know, what why was it competition? In the definition, you came in, we're not in competition. We dovetailed with the, the community in San Mateo, but the reason why, you, and I. If I heard this, you said they really enjoyed you guys there because it's a built-out city that hadn't having room to expand facilities, and that they were pretty happy because they wouldn't be able to. They were growing in density because they're probably doing high-density building, and so students are coming in. They felt good because they had a pop-up relief valve to handle those kids. That's what I heard you say last time. We here don't have that. We have the city of Ranch Cordova has literally large rooms out here to, uh, to grow. We have schools designated. We have a lot of growth that we can do. We're not a built-out city. We're not a built-out area. So I don't know how we can compare the two. They're totally different concepts, a development built-out city versus an expanding city. So that's where I was, I was going to ask about those numbers. And those numbers really are yield numbers, and you've seen those in the facility designs. Those are changing. So how did you take those numbers in the Rancho Cordova area, when you're looking at a facility or growth for a whole district, Folsom's growing bonkers right now. They're growing more permits per year than the city of Rancho Cordova. Rancho Cordova is moving a lot slower because we have uh, the certain areas out there, they have a 13-year delay, like Elliott Homes out there just starting their models in that area. They're going to take 10 years to build. So they're just starting. Folsom's booming because they have multiple builders. So that was numbers. So how how did you come up with the numbers in Rancho Cordova and not going to maybe Folsom uh, area to put your business? Why? There's where the growth is. Uh, we were more focused on student need and opportunities than, so, than targeting the growth area. The district that we were in before, we did they did enjoy us because we did help like alleviate like yeah. growth. But yeah. even more so, if you go back, I don't the probably wasn't recorded, but the board it was a district full of high schools that were basically all the same. They were all traditional comprehensive high schools. And they really felt it was great for their families to have an opportunity to send their kids to a small school that provided a different way of doing things. That was how they, that was really the driving reason that they felt like, wow, this is a great add on to our district. Okay. Because it gave more choice to their families. Well, those are all the questions I have right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark. <clears throat> All right. Um, for staff, I had one question, or well, I needed an explanation because reading on page twenty, 
Reading this really gives me pause on a couple of things. So I'm going to ask this question. Um, when you're talking about the financial impact and the possibility of losing 580 students over five years, um, this is equivalent to a reduction of 24 of certificated and 40 classified staff over four years. So I want you to be real with me. Does that mean that the possibilities are there of closing of school in Rancho Cordova if that happens, or are we just going to? I, I, I couldn't speak to that specific. I, I think what we would be doing is uh, building in the discussion of where the priorities lie because reduction of $20 million in the budget would have to occur, right? That's so true, too. I don't know if a school would have to be closed or boundaries would have to be looked at or redevelopment would have to be, uh, or you know, design would be necessary. Uh, there would definitely have to be a discussion of services that we currently pay for, we would not be able to pay for. So. Gotcha. And the other thing that really, and I think my colleagues would know how I am that gives me pause, is uh, the viability of our programs at Cordova High on an annual basis. And the first one that jumped out to me was the Junior ROTC. Um, the second one that jumped out to me is the International Baccalaureate Program. Are you to say that maybe in a few years those might go away? I, I wouldn't want to say that. I would say that we would have to have this, anytime we have a structural situation where we lose revenue or don't have sufficient dollars, we have to prioritize all programs and needs. We try to keep it away from students as much as possible. You know, okay. we would try to, but potentially, yes, programs would be impacted. There would be potentially a, a quarter of the student population at, at Ranch Cordova would not be there. And when you have less students, you have uh, on a comprehensive school, you have the ability to offer as, as robust programs, right? You have less right. programs. Right. So would that have any effect on the MYP program that we had at uh, Mitchell or those students that are going into the IB program? It, well, it's a feeder program to IB. So yes, it could, it could roll down and impact other programs as well. Yes. Great. Thank you. That's all I needed. So let's uh, dive into uh, design tech or um yeah design tech um my colleague asked about the start date and we do know that it's 2023 and i know that you all are in the process of uh recruiting teachers and obviously students uh in our, our ranch cordova schools um the questions that i have is uh, how do you support our english learners and their parents and the reason why i'm asking that is because we just don't have Spanish. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, it might have dipped. I learned this in Leadership Ranch of Cordova. I think about, uh, 20 to 30. no, more than that. Uh, I think about maybe 73 different languages. Thank you, sir. So I, I'm just wondering if those students like say, okay, this may be a good option for us. How do you support those families? And yeah. the students. Yeah. I mean, for the students, for their educational program, we have to provide both the designated and the integrated instruction, the mm -hmm. ELD instruction, and follow all of the, uh, the testing requirements, you know, at both uh, parts of the year and upon entry and exit. Um, and, you know, we provide that program to them. Um, they have the instruction they need. And the PD happens for both not just our ELD staff members, but also all staff members for the integrated instruction so that all kids are getting the benefit of um, the ELD support in every class, not just in the designated instruction course. So that's for supporting the students when they're you know, on campus all day and getting the academic support they need. In terms of the families, I think we have um, some ideas about how we might support them. Yeah, and in terms of the outreach to the families, like um, I contacted three different like translation services to help like review our marketing materials, put them in languages that are representative in the city. Um, two of those meetings I had today. So it, it is something that we need to do more work in. I don't have something to present to you today, but it's, right. you know, when you say that we're enrolling students, we're, we're, we need to get approved as a as well, a school before we can do that part. So we definitely yeah. have plans to um, make those outreaches into the community so that so the community is aware 
um, if we put everything out in English, we are just going to miss a, a, a huge demographic that could benefit from our program. Okay, because especially when you're talking in that area and other areas in Rancho Cordova, I mean, you're not just, and I'm just honing in on the Spanish because it seems like that was the only foreign language that you all taught, but I'm talking about your Farsi, your uh, Armenian, your Russian, um, your Taglu. Um, I mean, we would support students. How? I'm, a, I'm asking how. I mean, okay, I'm saying we would support like all the multilingual learners in our program, regardless of what their native language is. We wouldn't offer all those languages. No, as, I'm, no, like, but I'm, I'm just saying, how teaching. would you? Would you have translators yeah. on staff? Yeah. Well, we'd probably contract with translators rather than have them on staff. I don't know that we would have a translator on staff for every single one of those fifty. So you would obviously have contractual employees then. <laughs> Um, working with you students, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, my board president got on me because I didn't ask this question to Mr. Kiefer, but I'm going to get this question out the way to you. Uh, so it's probably uh, two. Uh, athletics. And I know I asked last time about your VAPA programs, and it was kind of vague to me on what you guys plan on doing with your visual and performing arts. So could you expand on both of those for me? Sure. Yeah, do you want to? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so for athletics, um, really what we did with our first cohort that came in in 2014 is we worked with our students to develop what athletics programs were they were most interested. Because you have to remember when we're starting, we're starting with about 150 students. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be offering every athletic program, but we definitely engaged our students in creating athletic programs. And I think for the first year, we ran um, uh, men's and women's basketball and then we added volleyball, and then we um, added, oh yeah, we also ran cross country, um, swimming, I believe we also did our first year. Um, so basically, if a student had interest, um, they worked with our staff to, to develop that. We found, we found field space within the district to do practices. Um, our, our, our coaches, our staff, our whole community came together to really support students doing athletics. Um, and um, I do have... I can bring up a slide of all the athletics that we're currently offering at our um, school in Redwood Shores, but really the athletics that we'll offer here in Rancho Cordova are going to come from the student community that comes to our school. Right, and, and that's what we'll you start. said that you would find field space within the district? Um, we or worked or we you... worked with the district and local parks and recreation to find field space, and we did have to be flexible. We were definitely not like priority number one in scheduling mm -hmm. practice time. So um, my own daughter, um, when she attended DTAC her freshman year, she was on the soccer team. And yeah, we had to pract we practiced um, kind of all over. Like there's just like a little text stream and here's where we're going to go. And we, um, different parents drove different kids because not every parent could be that flexible. Um, but we did, we were able to make a girls soccer team go. Okay. Um, I didn't hear anything on your visual and performing arts. It's coming. Okay. Oh, so brilliant. yeah, for our visual performing arts, we've um, run it um, two different ways. Um, at, when we first launched... Um, our school, we ran our visual and performing arts program during intercession. And the time really equated, intercession happened four times a year for our first few years. So it really kind of equated to like a quarter. We basically did um, four quarters a year. And our students had um, rock band, they had dance, they had um, fine arts, they had theater. Um, why am I blanking on the rest of them? Um, ceramics. Um, yeah, we had a bunch of different visual, um, different types of visual arts, illustration and drawing, um, photography, comic book design, film, video production. Yes. So we, we offered um, a, a whole lot of that during intercession. What we noticed was that you know, basically doing visual or doing your VAPA classes every six weeks, you had kind of a six weeks pause and not all of our students really enjoyed that. So we actually started um, using some of our flex time to offer more um, VAPA type experiences. And then we eventually offered um, a photography class during the school year for students that wanted to have more of that daily touch point with um, a visual and performing arts. 
So if they wanted to do music or drama, it was like every six weeks. And how um, long is that in For our first couple of years, actually, that, that is how it was. And we realized like that actually wasn't the best for our students. So we were able to flex our model. And if you recall, in our flex time, we have over 90 minutes a day of flex time. And um, our, our, our rock band classes meet, our singing classes meet, um, illustration classes meet. Um, and sometimes they meet with their instructor and sometimes they're meeting, they're being self-directed. They're meeting on their own and, and they're working on a mural. Um, we have several murals in our school that have been um, designed and painted by our students. And they, they use, uh, we have such a deep commitment to that flex time so that the students can um, follow those pathways that are most engaging to them. Okay. Uh, thank you on that. I won't uh, I'll cross that off. Uh, board member Short talked about location and transportation. I'll cross that off. Um, so I know last time I, I asked you all about the homeless population and how you plan on supporting them. Um, could you kind of like tell me what you told me? I, that my memory is going. And how you're going to service the homeless um, population? Or was there any resources how you're going to tap into that? Um, well, so one resource I've already tapped into is um, I've met with the Alliance. I'm not sure you're familiar with them. They're a nonprofit organization that serves, I think, about seven surrounding counties. Here in Rancho? Uh, they're not based out of here in Rancho, but they definitely um, have contacts. They, they basically are almost like a chamber of commerce, but for nonprofits that serve um, at-risk youth. So it can be homeless, foster. Um, adoption, it can be transitional youth. And so I have reached out to them because they are networked with so many different nonprofits. Um, I had an initial meeting. I told them about our school that we were trying to launch and like what sort of support. I myself went through um, some training with them just to educate myself more on how to support um, students from hard places. And um, so I will continue to do that outreach. And especially if we're approved here, we'll do that specifically with organizations in Rancho Cordova. And it's called Alliance? It's called The Alliance. The yeah. Alliance. Oh, I must be slipping on my job because I work with, and I don't like the word at risk. I like the word at promise. At, you, I like that too. Okay. Um, and yeah, I never heard of it so i, I gotta look that up I, i'd be happy to connect you with their director yeah i'll look yeah. it up but okay thank you um for right well actually no um i i believe that you guys uh said that you're working with the city uh was it planning on some office space um i so i did reach out to a couple contacts in the city um, and I have a meeting scheduled with them next week. And one of the things they told me was they said, hey, if you have any properties that you are considering, please come talk to us first because we are connected with all the people and all the organizations that you need to have signed off, whether it's fire or building code, um, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that you are looking at areas that can feasibly and productively be used as a school. So we are going to have, I have to look at my calendar, but it's early next and week. Just out of curiosity, because um, I'm pretty familiar with that city staff, do you yeah. know who you're meeting with? You don't have to tell me if you don't want to divulge that information, but I'm just curious. Um, I'm meeting with Micah Renner and Laura Fickle. Oh, okay. Is that, <laughs> I hope that's okay to say. <laughs> no, you know, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk to the gentleman. He was talking about, you know, some of the CTE programs going away in about 10 years. Um, I just had a few questions for you. Um, one of the questions would be, so do you think that um, engineering is going to be going away in 10 years? I think the skills you need as an engineer now is going to be, will be very different than the skills you need as an engineer in 10 you years. You think construction will go away in 10 years? I don't know. I mean, if I knew, <laughs> then I would be out there. There's like, a method to my madness, that. but I'll say it in closing. I mean, are you sincerely asking me or are these rhetorical? 
Do you uh, want an answer? I'm, I'm asking, yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody knows. If you would have said, do you think in well, three I mean, years we're going to have a that pandemic that shuts down the whole world? Most of these CTE programs may no. go away in 10 years. I, I just no, I didn't say the CTE it. programs. I said some careers will disappear. Some that, careers. That, dear, okay, the, that deal that we used to have with kids of go to high school, get good grades, go to college, get good grades, graduate, and there's a 40-year career out there waiting for you. If we keep telling kids that that is the deal, that's the world that they're going to be in, then we're not doing that. So the then right we're thing. saying like, Engineering, that's a career. Do you think that'll go away? It's going to look very different. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's a thing that needs to get done. Construction is a career. Do you think it'll go away? It can be heavily automated. Okay. I, mean, if we, I mean, if you would have said, do you think... In, like, in the world of business, cars, do you think that'll go away? Oh, most of, a lot of the finance is being automated. It's AI making most of the decisions on what stocks to trade. Like most of those mutual funds are managed by AI now. Oh, so well, yes. There's more to that in business, but you know, it's not just about stocks and making those predictions. Um, well, okay. do, do you think they'll look the same? No, I don't think it'll look the same, but I think the training will still be there and the education will still be there to learn, don't you think? Oh yeah, that's why we think the best then, thing we can do then is... Then why would we say that it would... I mean, these careers would go away. Because I mean, the best like, thing you can do is give kids the transferable skills so when a career does go away, they have the skills I to create I understand the transferable themselves. skills, but I think that's what we're probably teaching our students too is transferable skills, right? I mean, even with us in the district, I know you guys are, I think we are too. I don't but think I was we're, just, we're probably not saying fundamentally different things. I understand. Well, maybe I understand, we are. I understand maybe your, we are. I understand your point. I do think that like some of the career pathways, and this is what we're saying, like, to get into this comparison of what you're doing versus what are doing, what we're doing, I don't know if that's beneficial to any of us. What we're saying is, it's not one size fits all. Give the families a choice. Give them an opportunity to make the decision. Especially those families that basically, well, that area, Cordova Villa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Why, why would you not give them an opportunity to you don't have know control that over their education? Um, anyway, um, tell me a little bit about this innovation. Diploma, kind of. I mean, something that you said that you made up, or I mean, we've created it that over you the last created several years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you tell me more about it? Yeah, it's a um, it's a two year program, and um, students take two classes. The first one is a foundations and design thinking class, where they learn what design thinking is. They work several challenges. They're all really different, so they build up that design thinking toolkit. Mm -hmm. And then in the second year, they take a class called Design for Impact. Um, and this is where they select an issue to work on in the community, something they care about, something that's meaningful for them. Um, and they use that design thinking skill set to work on that project. Over the course of that year, they have to defend their work in three design reviews and then a defense at the end. And those are externally validated and assessed design reviews and defenses. Um, and then students have to defend against 11 different rubrics. Um, and if they can do that, then they earn the innovation diploma, which is a credential they get in addition to their high school diploma that just says, hey, I'm a person that also has skills in um, creative problem solving and leadership. Um, I know how to take initiative. I know how to start things. Um, and it's helped our students with their college admissions process. I was going to ask, does that their, make a difference in their college admission? I mean, they look at that and say, oh, innovation diploma. I has mean, set you apart. Really? And that's what our experience was this year. Okay. All right. Awesome. Especially because colleges are relying less on the SAT than they once did. Absolutely. And so this is one way for students to distinguish themselves. Yeah. That's, but it's created. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all that I have right now. Um, you know, the CCI data that you came up with and... Um, gosh, I think that was different from what we saw last time, but I guess if it was We never works, presented it, that data. This is the first It was never presented? I thought it was. I stand corrected. I think the, it was in the district report. It was. But okay, we but found you some had errors another, in the report. another report that, I mean. Well, the district report included the year 2017 in the CCI data, which we didn't have a cohort in 2017, mm -hmm. and it did not include the year 2021, which we did have, so we just made those adjustments. Uh, Betty Jo, can I get some uh, clarity on that? Oh, maybe I lost her. Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. 
on the CCI data, if um, if we're not, pardon yeah. me. Yes, I think um, I corrected it in the presentation tonight because the uh, the percent in the first in that first year was incorrect. There was actually okay. only two years of data, not three. But there are three years of data. The year that wasn't included was the most recent year, 2021. So our table included that year. All right, yes. I, stand, I stand corrected. Thank you, ma'am. Um, those are all the questions I have right now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hoover. Okay. <clears throat> all right, let's see here. Uh, let's start with staff, I guess. Uh, since that seems to be the order we're going. Um, so uh, can someone on district staff uh, clarify for me, because I'm trying to understand these findings, so the four findings. Is it accurate to say that finding two and three have been resolved or they're easy to resolve? I guess I'm trying to understand where we stand on two and three, because it seems like you know, there's been some conversations on those two points and they seem to have been somewhat resolved. Yes, findings, finding two and three could be remediated. Okay. Our recommendation would be that we would um, um, do something along the lines of a conditional approval with an MOU to clarify okay. the Got remaining it. concerns on those issues, but we feel they could be remediated. But, you, but that's not your opinion of finding one and four? Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to pick on Betty Joe all night, so please, anyone else, feel free to chime in. <laughs> um, um, based based on this analysis, the district's analysis, um, would would any district staff would like to answer this question? Um, say that it's our opinion or your opinion that FCUSD has a better educational program for students than Design Tech. I don't, I don't think that's a fair statement to make. Our analysis was whether or not um, the, the program was uh, constituted. A, I have to pull up the finding and look at the language exactly, but it wouldn't the, be. The unsound, be, yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't be that we have a better program than Design Tech High School. Okay. And if I could add, that would be more subjective in nature and our role as a district and our due diligence is to make sure that it's meeting the elements that Ed Code requires of the authorizing agency when you're reviewing a Correct. petition. Yeah. So it's it's more objective based. Okay. But I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, we obviously, and, and I actually appreciated, um, you know, Dr. Montgomery not kind of trying to stay away from this comparison mindset, but you know, we obviously do believe that we have some fantastic programs. I don't think anyone is here up here would say otherwise. Um, so I guess with, with that being the case, I mean, I, I mean, I'll say it myself, I think we do have some fantastic programs uh, in Rancho Cordova and in Folsom. Um, but, you know, if that is the case, um, I think w what is the, the driving factor behind us losing students to design tech? Like what, what is the, I guess, base assumption that we're making there? What, is, what would the reason that a student would choose design tech over Folsom Cordova Unified? Well, that the the assumption is in in looking at the petition that uh, the student the target student population is students in Rancho Cordova. Could you restate that, Betty Jo, please? Yes, the assumption is that that. Well, the petition doesn't say this is our target student population. The petition does talk about that that uh, they would uh, they're planning on serving students who are coming from Rancho Cordova. So then the assumption would be that uh, they're primarily targeting students from Cordova High School. Okay. Um, so so essentially, they they'd be recruiting within our community. Therefore, the assumption is that we will lose students. I, yes. I, yeah. Okay. Um, and that's why we did that. You know, we looked right. at whether it was seventy percent, eighty percent, ninety percent, or a hundred percent, because based on where they're 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 locating, um, there may be students who are coming from 
Sac City, for instance. Sure. Yeah, right. So they could also get students from other. Um, so do, do our numbers assume that all 580 students are going to come from Folsom Cordova or is or uh, are we building in some of that that they may come from other districts as well? That's why when you look at that, um, the final number of that fiscal impact, it ranges between uh, 15 million to 21 million. So if um, okay. we make an Got assumption it. that all 100% of the students are coming from Folsom Cordova, the financial impact is 21 million 700,000. If you make the assumption that 70% of the students are coming from Folsom Cordova, then, then the impact is 15 Got it. million. Understood. And that's why we said somewhere between 15 million and 21 million. So on this topic of losing enrollment, because I know this continue, you know, obviously is a concern for the district. It's something that has been brought up quite a few times tonight. Um, so, you know, it's been mentioned, I think Sean, maybe you can take this one, but you, uh, you know, that we will essentially lose services. I think you mentioned something about teachers and, and other positions that would potentially go away. What is the driving force for those services or positions going away? So it would be the loss of students, which corresponding would lose the funding. Um, it, there is not a direct correlation between the loss of the students and just the classroom um, funding, right? The, we discussed before that when you lose a class um, of students um, and you, even if you remove the teacher associated with that, there is also additional revenues that come that support all the additional pieces, the supplemental uh, supports, the counselors, the administrative team, the sports, all of those pieces. And so the, that's what that additional $20 million would be. And right. so that, that is a negative impact. It's just like declining enrollment or anything. When you lose students, that's what occurs. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, we're losing students. So we're obviously paying for fewer students to educate fewer students. But your point is, is that our programs are not, you know, designed in a way where you can take one kid out of a classroom and yeah, and then, they, that's know, true. They don't come out in even numbers as well. Yeah, We've okay. talked about that before. I mean, you can just see by the fact that they can open up a whole school with those 500 mm -hmm. students. There are dollars beyond just the cost of the classroom, right? Sure. Because they're obviously going to be adding administration and adding programs and yeah. that are supports and those kind of things. So, um, but it, but in concept, I mean, the way our education system is funded. Uh, it's based on students. It's based on enrollment, right? I mean, that's why we fight so hard to make sure our kids are, are coming to school, right? Because attendance, yes. Attendance, sure. right? Because yeah. if they're not at school, we're also not getting funding. So I guess the point being is that it seems that we as a state have decided that funding you know, should be attached to the student. Um, but I, I guess my biggest question on this topic is on balance with the growth that we're projecting, because I was a little unclear earlier on the answer to this question, with the growth that we're projecting, will our net change in students, it, it won't be negative though, correct? It, it that... would based off of what we're projecting for the next few years. Now, for the next how many years? Sorry. Uh, I, well, we only go out three years in our budget. Okay, right? so you're so saying, okay. Over the three year process in our budget, Got it. Um, in the first year of the program, which would be what, 23, 24, in that year we are projecting a, gain, a net gain of like 200 and something students and they're only gaining like 150 or something like that. So in that year, we, we would still have a gain, very obviously much smaller than what we would be projecting. In the second year, we were only projecting a 23 student gain, even though we were projecting new homes and a, a, right. a yield factor on that. The offsetting, again, we talked about the offsetting loss of 12th grade going out as a district and kindergarten coming in was a decline for us. And okay. so we were only projecting a 20 something gain and we would be losing and remember, that's cumulative, so we would be losing about 300 kids, I think, or something like that in the second year. And so that would create a deficit, a yeah. decline in enrollment, and which okay. would then obviously um, decrease the revenues we would receive as a district. But eventually, right, on, uh, which is going to be along eventually, right, 20, 30 years, sure, build sure. out. Yeah, when the, all the, when, when in 20, 30 years, definitely we will, I mean, that the assumption is we will have more kids because of all the new growth south of 50. Okay. Correct. Um, <clears throat> What, you know, I, I, I always ask this question and I, I just, I really am honestly trying to figure this out. What would a charter petition need to show in order to not receive a dial, denial recommendation in the school district? Because that's honestly, you know, I, 
I'm still trying to figure that out because I, I, I'll be honest. I mean, I think, you know, I reading the report, um, you know, there were a number of findings that uh, didn't really have analysis attached to them. And so I'm, 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 you know, and, you know, honestly, the first version of this report actually had New Pacific School in it, you know, in some areas where it was actually copied and pasted from the other petition. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out what, what would a charter petition need to show um, in order to not receive a denial recommendation? Or is that even possible? I would say probably the biggest piece of that is really knowing the community that you're going into and that you have data or evidence to support that that program would be successful in the community that they would be entering into. Um, we, we haven't seen that in, in the um, petition that was submitted to us. That is really the petitioner's uh, role to be able to share that with the authorizing agency. And, and it's our due diligence to see if that exists or not. Um, but would we agree, and I think we do agree on this, but would we all agree that students learn differently and that some students can benefit from programs outside of the traditional public school system? I would say yes, students definitely benefit in different ways and in need different options, which is why our district has been very innovative in offering many options as early as last year with starting our Absolutely. own small school setting with Innovations Academy offering Walnut Wood, offering our charter school. Um, you know, we believe in that. We all believe in Absolutely. that. We know children don't develop at the same rate or with the same options. So we've, we've been very innovative in that respect. Um, and I think the board, you know, should be, um, you know, applauded for that because it was the foresight of the, the board board's previous boards that started the IB program at Cordova High School. And the main reason was we were losing students. Yeah. We were losing students yeah, to another absolutely. district that had a program that we didn't have. So, and we created a program. And when we think about the number of students that were participating um, in International Black Baccalaureate and how do we grow the capacity of students participating wall to wall, meaning you know, it's not a school within a school, at least at the middle school, the middle years program, and until the students get to 10th grade, all students at Mitchell and Cordova High School now experience those courses. Mm. To the degree now that the, the numbers of students at Cordova High has built up to almost 2,000 students, they definitely had growth. Um, we have more students participating in the seventh through 10th grade program yeah. by the nature of more students. And we've been able to expand opportunities under the IB umbrella for Career Pathway Academies and CTE opportunities. Um, and again, that that came about because the numbers of students and the interest within the community that we are partnering with and the internships that we also do with our business partners, there was a need and we saw that need. Our yeah. you know CTE coordinator has applied for $14 million in CTE grants and has received those for our district. So, you know, in respect of looking at how numbers impact what we can do, I think there's a direct example right there of right. how we've been able to grow that for our students in Folsom, Cordova. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, to be honest, some of that came from uh, the fact that we were being challenged. Sometimes you need to be challenged in order to grow. And um, when this district finds itself at a point when they are losing kids or losing enrollment or losing, you know, whether it's charter schools or other school districts, we step up to the plate and we improve our programs. So, you know, I absolutely agree with that. Um, on this point about duplication, um, you know, we, some of us had the opportunity to go out to the Oracle campus and, and tour it, take a look at it. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm really struggling with this part of the staff report about what th this uh, finding or um, point in the report that says design tech is duplicating uh, programs at FCUSD because there was a lot of things at design tech that, you know, to be honest, are different than what we do at our schools in FCUSD. So if someone would be willing to dive into that a little more, what, when, when you talked about duplication, what were you actually referring to? What programs were you doing a direct uh, kind of, comparison to? I think it would be helpful for Jim to talk about the international 
program, the International Baccalaureate program, and all of the components that are uh, design thinking that are um, embedded in that program. Yeah, that, that is basically what we were talking about because okay. design um, is built into our science classes. It's built um, throughout, um, especially in terms of Rancho Cordova because of IB. Um, the MYP program is starting in sixth grade all the way through, you know, a 12th grade has design programmatic thinking built all the way through. So uh, again, in terms of definitely a different approach in terms of the difference in terms like of CTE and um, the design tech in terms of the, their push out to the community. So there's some, there's some differences in terms of like nuance there, but a lot of the experiences kids have or have access to, um, there is duplication, at least in, in our view, there is duplication across those programs. Okay. So, but, but in terms of like the schedule, for example, or the intercession program, or the uh, you know uh, diploma program. I mean, you know, there's things that we do, and like for example, Dr. Kaliga mentioned internships and things like that. But I've you know I'm in this district, and, and a lot of those things we we don't offer, right? So I guess that's where I was a little bit confused in the report about, um, especially being able to see it firsthand. Um, there are does seem that there's certainly things that. Uh, are, are different in some ways. Yeah, I mean, there's differences in terms of scheduling. There's differences in terms of ways you might approach different experiences or how kids might have those experiences. But it's, you know, it's the experiences that kids are having. It's just which, what modality are they experiencing those through. And all schools, you know, take a, a, a somewhat different approach um, to providing those experiences totally. for kids. But I, I think that is the duplication that we were talking about is, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing that. Um, but you're right, I mean, we don't have an intercession in terms of the, the program that um, Design Tech has. And so okay. we look for other opportunities, um, like yeah. the summer percept preceptorship and things like that, that um, our district does. Okay. Um, and my last question for staff, actually it's really for our legal counsel, if I may. Um, you know, I, obviously there are gray areas in law and, and that's, that's very true. I, I, don't, I don't know if I would say they're necessarily um, subjective, but there are a lot of gray areas. So I guess my question is, without going into too much detail, obviously, um, based on case law or other petition denials or any experience you may have in this, um, do, does our district face any potential legal liability for denying a petition? So I'll speak one, we don't want to give too much legal advice in open session, but in terms of is there potential liability? There always is if there's a denial. There's a process by which the charter yeah. charter school can appeal to the um, county board and then it can go up to the State Board of Education. So that's a process that's afforded in the Charter Schools Act. Whether or not they choose to exercise it, that's up to them. Um, and so in answering a response is sure in any scenario, there's always a chance of some sort of litig uh, risk of litigation either way, approval or denial. So um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, so just a few questions for design tech and then I'll um, pass it along to public or to the president. Um, so actually you did kind of already explain some of so I was kind of confused about some of the data presented in the staff report. So I think you've mostly cleared that up. Um, just like some of those years that didn't look right. Um, so I think that's we can pass over that one, but this is kind of a simple one and I know it's a softball and I don't, I'm just trying to, I, I really ask this question, I ask it all the time because I want people to understand how this works. How does charter school enrollment work and do or can you cherry pick students in any way? That's kind of uh, just a basic charter school question, but. So no, you cannot, you can put preferences in your lottery, but there are only certain things that are allowed to be preferences. For example, in our current school, we have a preference for children of staff, design tech staff members, a preference for siblings, a preference for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch program, and a preference for students who live within the district. So the state is very clear that you there are only certain things that you can put a preference in your lottery, and even that preference doesn't it doesn't guarantee admission. It just weights the lottery a little bit differently. So we cannot. So the way the enrollment works is that students. Um, it's not even apply. They fill out a form saying, you know, their address and things like that. It's sort of an application, I guess, but it just all does is put them in the lottery. Like we don't read the application. There's there's no like essays or anything like that. So charter schools, any student in the state of California is able to enroll in any charter school in the state of California. So it's just completely open. Okay. 
Um, and with that in mind, what are the preferences that you would, would, would see for Rancho Cordova? So the preferences that we have in our petition are similar. The staff members, siblings, we want to keep families together, um, families, students that qualify for free and reduced lunch, and students that live within the district. This is one of the things, though, that um, we're open to working with the district. The, this is what we worked with San Mateo last time. They passed it and said, we want you to work with district staff so we can get to some preferences we agree on. Okay. Actually, glad you mentioned that because that was my next question. What has what your experience been with your current authorizer? Oh, it's been great. Okay. It has been, um, like I said, they really, they, I mean, it's been great that they've been very supportive of our program and we, we learn from each other. Like we'll pilot different programs, we'll, especially like in technology and HR that I talk about, like they give us support on some of the credentialing. Like it's very much like if we have a question on something, like they'll, they'll answer it for us. So it's very much, um, our authorizer was very clear that they're all our kids and they treat us like that, that they're all our kids. So it seems more collaborative than competitive in some ways. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, like I said, the, the basis for their decision was really like, let's give families a choice. Let's give them an option. We've approached uh, it that way. Um, kind of on that same point, and this will be a lot, my last question. Uh, what, if I may ask, what was their recommendation when you submitted a petition <laughs> to their district? Neutral. Okay. Got it. <laughs> That's it for me. Thanks. All right. Um, Actually, uh, a number of the questions I was going to ask has been a uh, asked. So, well, I guess one of the downsides of being board president, you yeah. go you go last. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but a couple, couple quick questions. Uh, I guess the first one is for design tech. Um, how would you describe your typical student that, a design, that attends design tech? And I'm not asking about a race or ethnicity or anything like that. I mean, what, what motivates them? What are they looking for uh, in an education versus um, a typical student that might attend uh, a comprehensive high school? Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things. And Nicole, if there's anything that you want to add. Um, what we find very much is one is students that want an active education, but even more it's students who feel that the traditional system is not serving them for whatever reason. I mean, I remember when we first opened, there were students who said, you know, I did not do well in any of my middle school classes. If I go into a traditional high school, I don't see myself, why would my outcomes be any different? So those were the students enrolled. We also had students who were very much, you know, the traditional system is holding me back. The school puts a lot of artificial barriers on my potential. And you could say the same thing was happening for the students who are not achieving as well academically. And so they saw it, that the flexibility of our program and the fact that we're anchored on design thinking and that we're always trying to understand the people in our community and design the program that will meet their needs just gave them the hope that, that would, you know, we'd be able to serve them. We feel we've been able to do that. And that's like one of the key things. Um, if you look at our staffing model, you know, our first year we have a school designer or developer position. And so the school designer, you know, Wendy Little has been functioning at this. And so we're going into this saying like, as designers, we need to design a program that is gonna serve this community. That if we just come in and say, we're doing this, this, and this, that's not the way to go about it. So our very first year, as, as soon as actually it's already started, but hopefully if we are approved, our school designer is gonna go in, get to really know the community. And then we have a system that's flexible to like to adapt to it. I noticed that when the district, when you're talking about the fiscal impact about like, we'll examine these via program viability every year. Like we do that anyway, because we know that everything has an expiration date and whatever we're doing at one moment may not be the right thing to do two years from now. So that's why we attracted those kinds of students who really felt like I'm not succeeding in traditional school. <laughs> if I go right in traditional high school, it's going to be the same. And then the students are like, the traditional system's holding me back. I don't know, Nicole, is there anything else? Want to add to that? All right, so I'm just, you know, this whole trying to compare different demographics, it, it does, you know, make your head spin at some point. Um, but I do understand your point about it's difficult to compare different communities that are separated by great distance. Um, so if the traditional, stu or if, if your typical student is one who potentially, potentially struggles uh, at traditional school, I would assume that that's the same student that probably wouldn't necessarily excel in traditional testing. Right. Including CASP testing. In the traditional testing, yes. 
because a lot of times those students, a lot of the students that um, that might struggle in the traditional ses- system, the main thing they they have the skills. Sometimes they just lack diplomacy, and so they'll look at those tests and say, like, "Well, there's no benefit in it for me," and so they're not going to do their best on them. So what we put all our resources and all our energy toward is getting them a diploma, getting them eligible to participate in the public school, the university system in California, and making sure they have the skills to achieve there. So then, I mean, would it be fair to say if you want to try to compare design tech to Cordova High, you would have to identify a subset of population at Cordova High that that would fit the typical um, student that would attend design tech rather than compare it to the entire population of a comprehensive high school? Um, you could do it that way. I mean, this is one of the things that I did. Um, I did my, my doctor in education studying under Linda Darling Hammond, who is one of the, well, she's the president of the California Board of Education, but she's also the um, probably the best policy analysis expert in the country. One of the things that's um, really difficult with education to comparing data, if you want that, like, gold standard answer to your question, you have to have a control group. Yeah. And we don't have a control group. And so you could do that. And even if you did that, you're not, it's, 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 I don't, I'm afraid it wouldn't rise to the level of what you're hoping to see. Okay. Um, I, I guess this question is perhaps to staff regarding uh, finding number one. Um, couldn't an aggressive marketing campaign focused on diverse populations help ensure applications from those populations? Yes, and, and um, similar to what we talked about in, uh, in regard to findings two and three, there are probably some things that we could do in terms of um, working out um, the concerns that we have with finding number one. Okay. Um, I don't believe that we would feel the same way about finding number four, but we would feel, I, I think we could do that with finding number one. All right. Uh, and as it relates to finding number four, um, so it, it, I, I get the sense that the loss of revenue is viewed as highly problematic for a district um, uh, and a reason not to approve a charter, and yet the state of California created the charter school law. So if every single charter school in the state of California takes money away from their uh, parent or home district, then, and that was a basis for not approving a charter school, we wouldn't have any charter schools in California. Well, it couldn't be made on that that uh, piece only. It would have to be, and, and it has to be more than a f- uh, fiscal impact. Impact. It has to be a significant fiscal impact, and then you, it also has to uh, be a duplicity in program. And the, the um, school has to have capacity in their program. So it has to meet all of those requirements, not just the fiscal impact. The, and this was already, I think, uh, delved into the 580 students wouldn't necessarily all be from Folsom, Cordova. Um, but I guess uh, kind of a tangential question here. Um, how does Folsom, Cordova uh, compare to SAC Unified? Um, I mean, generally speaking, our testing scores and our um, the metrics, I believe, are, are, are stronger than SAC Unified. Is that Dr. Hugh Um, I don't have the data in front of me. I'd have, I'd have to look it up. But you know, uh, anecdotally or you know, from recollection, we tend to do better than SAC Unified um, as a district. So, if this school is literally within a couple of miles of SAC Unified, which SAC Unified does represent one third of the city of Rancho Cordova, um, it's fair to say that students that are looking for a stronger educational option could potentially come be coming from SAC Unified and not Folsom Cordova. Yeah, again, that was the reason that for the chart of the different numbers is because we're, we're unsure of how many students would come from outside of Folsom Cordova, but certainly students could be coming from other districts. 
And if the first preference was for, or one of the top preferences is for students from the city of Rancho Cordova, that would include one third of the population of the SAC Unified. It could. Um, and as for, I guess, the other part of the city of Rancho Cordova, which is represented by the Elk Grove School District, uh, I had to look this up, but the closest high school to Anatolia appears to be Pleasant, Pleasant Grove. Grove, which is a, at this time of night is a 20 minute drive um, versus um, a, roughly a six minute drive from Anatolia to City Hall, which is give or take, I guess that's where somewhere around there you're looking at um, a school, um, which driving from Anatolia to Pleasant Grove uh, accounts for 120 hours of driving in um, a school year, 180 days of school, versus 36 hours if they were driving to City Hall in, in Ranch Cordova. So would it not be fair to say that a potential large number of students from Anatolia in the Elk Grove School District could potentially opt to go to um, a high school that um, is only six minutes away versus 20 minutes away. I mean, I guess it's speculative. I mean, I guess they're rhetorical, rhetorical questions. So no one has to answer that question. All right. Um, um, all right. Uh, capacity, you know, I mean, yes, we potentially stand to lose students. Uh, I think it's, it's already been addressed that uh, it could also, you know, over time we will increase students as well uh, based on uh, growing uh, and developing the areas of the city. Um, um, you know, the rest of the questions have already been answered or asked and answered. Uh, let's take it to the public for public comment. Uh, let's start with uh, Chris Bertelli, followed by Casey Shingera. Uh, good evening again. Uh, now I'm back up here to support uh, Design Tech's petition uh, to open <clears throat> a charter school in Rancho Cordova. I think from what we've heard tonight, it's abundantly clear that there is not a school like Design Tech anywhere in Folsom, <laughs> Cordova. <clears throat> attempting to deconstruct this school into discrete pieces for the sole purpose of trying to claim that it duplicates what is already happening is cynical and disingenuous, and it reduces a school to a sum of its programs and parts. Culture matters. Leadership matters. So when I hear the claim that Rancho Cordova students already have access to schools that are doing the same thing that Design Tech proposes, then I have to wonder, why does Design Tech have 100% A through G completion rate while Cordova's is 21%. Why are 35% of Design Tech's graduates accepted at a UC compared to only 7% of Cordova's if the same programs are already available? Perhaps it is because, because there is a culture, an ethos at Design Tech that starts with the proposition that they will do whatever it takes to make certain all students complete the work that ensures college is at least an option upon graduation. Maybe the better question for this board to consider better questions for this board to consider are, is it okay that only one out of three Cordova graduates is, graduates is considered prepared for life after high school? Is it acceptable that four out of five Cordova graduates do not meet the minimum requirements to even apply for admission to a UC or a CSU? If not, then how could you justify turning away a school that has shown it can achieve better results? How would you be helping students by giving them less options? What percentage of under, unprepared graduates do you find acceptable? The passage of LCFF in 2013 made it clear, abundantly clear that money follows the student regardless of the public school choice that student makes. Approving design tech does not take any money away from Folsom Cordova because it does not belong to Folsom Cordova. It simply doesn't pass through this building before it gets to the school. I encourage you to support the rights of Rancho Cordova families to choose a better option for their students by voting to approve design tech. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Casey Shingara, followed by uh, Garrett Gatewood. All righty. 
So I am in favor of the denial of the petition. Um, I sat through the presentation two weeks ago and I'd like to reiterate some of those points. Uh, they do not have a concrete plan for Rancho Cordova that is reflective of, inclusive of, supportive of, and empowering of Rancho Cordova kids and families. It's not Rancho specific. It's not tailored to Rancho. Um, to compare some Cordova High data to design tech data, most recently Cordova High had a, 1,100 students who were socio socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, and there were only 40 at Design Tech. Cordova High has currently 102 students experiencing homelessness. Design Tech has none. Cordova High has 327 English learners. Design Tech had two in 2019 and four in 2020. What this shows me is that their lottery preferences seem problematic, and they don't have the infrastructure, the support, the experience to support these students that we have. In their presentation two weeks ago, they spoke about transportation and encouraged the use of bike trails for our students. That was the extent of their plan. No updates to this plan at this time. Um, our high priority needs of our students are not addressed in specifics. They have zero bilingual support, zero ELD instruction, zero instructional aids, no mod severe support. Does that mean there's no mod severe students at this school? No ILS program. A loss in funding to Cordova High, because the money goes with the kids, will cut the people who make our amazing programs, which does limit the opportunities and the options for our current students. Look at all the great programs we have at Cordova High. Look at the IB program. Look at CTE. Look at these partnerships we have that go beyond core curriculum. Look at our ELD, our IB, our, J, our junior ROTC, our VAPA program. Those will suffer. They will diminish, and they will domino and cannibalize each other. Um, VAPA two weeks out of the year, I don't know how you're A through G compliant when you need a year of VAPA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Garrett Gatewood, followed by Katan Patel. This is weird. Ugh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to being on that side. Uh, my name is Garrett Gatewood. I'm the city councilman of the Rancho Cordova. Um, First of all, I uh, want to say thank you for what you guys do. It's a terrible job and you get paid nothing. So I want people to understand that. Nothing. Um, if you were to accept uh, two charter schools, you are getting the luckiest acceptance ever. You're coming into the most diverse, most substantial, most competitive city in the region by far. That being said, my problem isn't the fact that the charter schools are trying to come in. My problem is my representation of Rancho Cordova that represents 90% does not seem like they're positively supporting this. My problem is, is that I am here to present my own charter school. I would like to call it the Rancho Cordova Charter School. And I would like all my schools that are now failing to come into us. Because $20 million walked away from Rancho Cordova. And I see teachers crying in this room right now. So is the right decision to bring another school district or two? because that would put us up to seven, seven in the city of Rancho Cordova. Or is the right fix that maybe our relationship, which has been a great one, we held Folsom when they were just a, a prison up in the middle and Rancho Cordova was the powerhouse. And when we lost our base, then Folsom was nice enough to come alongside and pull us, but this relationship doesn't work. It isn't representative of my city and it's egregious that we're doing this. You have teachers crying at your board meeting, crying. Now, that being said, Oracle, crazy. But wouldn't it wanna to go to somewhere else? We have so many other areas that could use this. Um, once again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Katan Patel. There he is. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ketan Patel, and I'll make it very quick. I live in Stone Creek from last, 20, I think, 10 years. I have two kids. Every day I'm driving to the Folsom's. And what I learned from the Riverview and Mesa High School is, I mean, the elementary schools, that a lot of parents from the Anatolia and Kavala Ranch and from Stone Creek are moving to Folsom or even different school district. So I'm sure that Rancho Cordova needs something like good high schools. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about Rancho Cordova high schools, but what I learned from other parents that we need something better schools. 
and I think I like the syllabus and the flexibility of the schedule, and that's why I vote for this school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Stan Jones, and um, oh my gosh, uh, the following one is uh, maybe Dominic Kakalo. Like Dominic. Well, Dominic something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Welcome, Stan. <laughs> Three of us wearing masks, but uh, anyway. Um, so I've um, started volunteering in public schools when my youngest started, or, or now oldest started uh, preschool in 1976. I was active with schools, school districts, curriculum committees. You all up front know that I've been here for hundreds of meetings, literally over 35 years. Um, within the last three years, I sat approximately right in front of this stage where Tim is right now and uh, for budget hearings where our district is making decisions over trying to avoid impacting student programs at Cordova High School, and that's my primary um, you know, school. So that's part of why this discussion impacts me and my student of Cordova High School. But uh, I've uh, listened to test scores, as uh, Chris knows. I've had discussions and concerns. And but one of the things is that um, the data up here comparing their, um, their success or whatever the speaker here, you know, is correct. It's apples and oranges, kind of, how do you compare to school districts? We are an extremely ethnically diverse community where it appears their school district is not. Um, that's just, you know, fact of life. There is a difference between Folsom and Cordova, which we who live here for 40 years know. And um, we, we have been here, uh, Ed and I have been here at meetings, uh, and I, before Ed and Teresa started, um, and many discussions uh, going back to Granite Center. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. I agree with um, what our uh, staff report uh, talks about with programs. Um, I've had kids with IEPs, and I've had kids with honors. Uh, I have four graduates of Cordova High School, and I have grandchildren, one of whom is a student at Cordova High School. So the decisions you make uh, do affect my child. It also affects my community. And as you all know who have known me, um, I do care about Rancho Cordova community itself and have volunteered for a number of things. And up until COVID, I was an active volunteer on the campus at Mills Middle School feeding uh, Cordova High School. The IB program and things like that that the school district creates on identifications of needs are, are wonderful. And the other thing for my eight seconds, seven seconds left is that when the superintendent talks about creating something in reaction to a need, this district has done that, and I've seen it over 35 years. Um, and uh, part of the superintendent's communication committees and so forth that have met in this room uh, discussing some of those needs, I don't see a need to divide up part, to segment off a portion of our school district Can you, I'll wrap up. for somebody for an outside organization to take a piece of it. Um, and I was also, well, okay, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, Dominic. Dominic. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? It's Dominic Gualco. I'm the labor up with CSEA. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had planned what I uh, was going to say, but I lost it around 9, 9.30. Um, so thank you all for what you do, Superintendent. Uh, I urge you to deny this petition. I'm going to speak specifically to the community aspect because as the petitioner mentioned, uh, they as a school like to respond to the needs of the community. 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, I really don't see that community support here, especially uh, concentrated from Rancho Cordova. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, there's two ways you can qualify a charter school petition to actually be heard. The first is to get half the number of signatures from teachers uh, who would want to work in the school in the first year. The second option is to collect half the number of signatures from parents of students who would enroll the first year. Uh, the way this charter school, and you know, it satisfies the statutory requirement, I'm not saying otherwise, they qualified by submitting, I believe, five signatures from teachers who all live in Redwood City in San Jose. Um, no, no parent signatures. To my knowledge, there's really been no parent engagement, and that is really concerning that we're looking at potentially you know, a, a high school that's a third the enrollment about of Cordova High coming in here, getting established without engaging the community at all. Um, I, uh, it, it was denigrated a bit. I'm a graduate of Sac City Unified. And, you know, we saw what happened to Sacramento High School uh, when they got rid of that, that community school and turned it into a charter. It's really unfortunate. Um, we need schools that reflect our community. We need schools that have support, specifically the classified support like bilingual aids, mod severe paras, transportation that allow a public school district to really meet, uh, you know, what I think we all agree the goal is, which is to provide a great education to every student, um, regardless of their need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is David Little, followed by Tyler Johnston. Hello, um, I'm here to read um, a message from a DTEC uh, student who is not able to, to be here, who's a graduate of DTEC. Good evening, everyone. My name is Taylene Kervanian, and I am an alumni of Design Tech graduating class of 2019, and I am here in support for the new Design Tech. It was because of the school that I was able to achieve so much, and I'm here to speak upon those achievements today, specifically how I got into the university of my dreams, being a first generation college student, navigating my way through the enrollment process was a massive challenge, but thanks to the faculty and resources DTEC provided me with, I was able to overcome these difficulties. I have attended community college for the past two years because it made the most sense for me and my situation. Applying for transfer was nerve wracking to say the least, however, the DTEC faculty and staff made it a point to always support me and remind me they were one email away if, if I ever needed any guidance. It was because of this assistance and motivation that I am proud to say that starting this fall, I will be transferring to UC Berkeley. I'd always wanted to go to Berkeley, but I never thought that I was good enough and convinced myself I didn't have what it takes to become a golden bear. Little did I know that DTEC prepared me for it all. I had the design thinking skills to curate a plan for my application, the problem solving skills to make sure that I could handle whatever comes my way, homework and all, and most of all, I have the necessary empathy and communication skills I needed to start connecting and befriending my new fellow classmates. DTEC allowed me, a first generation college student, to be able to live out my dreams beyond my high school experience, and it showed me that anything is truly possible when I set my mind to it and have the support of so many. It's because of experiences and achievements like mine that I have encouraged the yes vote to approve Design Tech High School because this high school made me truly believe that the world can be a better place and that I, a woman from a graduating class of 2019, can be the one to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Tyler Johnston, followed by Diane Rogers. Good evening. You get more time when you show up, so I drove down. Um, <laughs> Redwood Shores isn't Rancho Cordova. It's not. It's a completely different place. Uh, we talk about A to G as a requirement. This, well, not this board, but the board before this has made it clear that we don't want A to G to be our graduation requirements. We chose not to do that as a community. They chose to do it. It works for them but it doesn't work for us. 68% of Cordova High students go to trade schools and community colleges. That's what the community wants. They don't want to go to a four-year school. A couple kids going to UC is awesome. Cool, I did, lots of students do. That works for them. That's not what works for Rancho Cordova. 
I want to thank Stan. Stan's one of the experts that shows up in this room when we have dinner with an expert. Internships, job shadowing, it's cool. We do it already. We keep talking about how we don't want to compare, and then we compare with programs that they have and we don't have. The statistics are there. We have CTE programs. I'm concerned about the curriculum. 30 days of intercession. Again, it sounds like a fun program. That's 30 school days when the kids aren't in Spanish. Government, economics, they're not doing the core classes. They had to change VAPA to not be an intercession because there's no way that counts as a G requirement. When we meet for six weeks a year, working through this system, you can call it year long. It's not year long, it's six weeks. That's why they switched to having every kid take the same class. The innovative diploma. Yay, it's a made up program. Like we made it up, cool, we, everybody gets it, yay. We have a GPS program. We don't have made up programs. We have Perkins and CTIG that are state and federally recognized that our students go through. We follow up all the way through. We follow post-secondary, we follow reports, state and federal government. They don't do any of that. Um, they, did, they talked about their close being school being Carsdale High and it's very similar. Hillsdale High School. 0.5 miles farther is very different. They didn't show you those statistics. And what happens when this school fails? They get 100 students that sign up, not the 500. Do they open? What happens when it's 80 the next year? Where do those students go back to? They flounder around for a couple of years at, at this school, and then they come back to Cordova High. They go back to the schools, and we're left with, ah, you didn't really learn anything the last couple of years, and we have to teach those kids. They come into Spanish 3 without ever actually taking Spanish 1 and Spanish 2. So that's one of the concerns is what happens when this program fails? It's because those kids come back. And as a teacher, we get a lot of students that come in in January from a school that didn't cut it. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, what happened? Let's, let's get you caught up. And that's our job as teachers. And so let's do what's best for our students and deny this petition. All right. Mr. President. Yes. It's that time. Uh, it's 10.30. I'd like to move that we extend this meeting, good Lord, to uh, 12 a.m. Right. As being on the safe side. That's morning, right? Is that 12 a.m. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Clark, second by Mr. Huey. Um, Superintendent Cleegan, take the vote. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And if the public's wondering why we need to do that, uh, it's in our bylaws that once you get to 10 30. Uh, let's see. Uh, Diane Rogers. Good evening. I'm Diane Rogers and I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the Rancho Cordova Area Chamber of Commerce. And I just wasn't actually planning on speaking tonight, but I heard several comments that I did want to address. Um, first of which is that uh, Design Tech has been involved in our community and they have made an effort to be to reach out, to learn about Rancho Cordova, to be a part of Rancho Cordova. They have joined the chamber, they've participated, and I've personally seen that um, active engagement with the community. So I do take issue with the fact that anyone who's saying that they aren't trying to find out more about Rancho is incorrect because I've personally seen it and experienced it. The other part is if I understand, and I'm not an expert by any chance uh, on the design system, but the way I understand it is they go into a community, they determine what is in their best interest and what kind of programs would work rather than trying to put a square peg into a round hole. So that's what I think would benefit the city of Rancho Cordova, the community and the students in Rancho Cordova is finding out what would work best and what would best serve our students. We can't, we, we need to know those things. And it could, it's, again, it's not gonna be a perfect situation. We, the, the, the variety needs to be out there and choice needs to be out there. So just on behalf of the chamber, we do support this program and we, I urge you to consider approving it. So thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the uh, end of the cards I have online. Yes, we have several. Okay. We'll start with Deborah. Welcome, Deborah. Good evening, President Reed, Dr. Cleghan, and school board members. Um, I'm Debbie Krikorian from FCEA. I'm speaking to you about the future of our students. In Design Tech presentation, several students' success stories were told last board meeting. We have our own success stories at Cordova High. We have students who've gone on to become professional athletes, such as Seneca Wallace, well-known media, media and entertainment professionals, such as Lester Holt of the NBC Nightly News, many engineers, teachers, business owners, entrepreneurs, carpenters, doctors, nurses, lawyers, bankers, inventors, state workers, carpenters, um, servicemen and women, emergency responders, landscapers, 
farmers, wine and beer makers, and more. Cordova High has the Mentors of Cordova High program to support students through their, pro through their journey called um, M-O-C-H is, is the acronym. The staff and community depend on each other in the school. Cordova students have achieved greatness through their discovery of asteroids officially recognized by the Small Planet Center of Harvard University, award-winning films recognized by SIVA, service to our community through the Air Force Academy, culinary wins and CTE competitions, History Day competition award for outstanding use of academic English by English language learners, engineering design competition through ACE, Samsung contest, Skills USA, business achievement awards for students design business, multiple future, um, future Farmers of America contest winners and state winners in agriculture and art and more with our medical programs developing. Each of these CTE and academy schools are small schools within a large school, giving students a one-to-one -one education that students desire. On Saturday, June 4th, the board was given an outstanding presentation by our CTE coordinator, Alicia Cadell. We have approximately 600 students in our academies and they are supported by the state dollars. If we lose students, the programs will be in jeopardy. This will hurt other students. She showed how Cordova High is growing in CTE programs and expanding in middle and elementary schools to prepare students for CTE. As Tyler Johnston talked about. Thank you. Next we have M. Easton. Oh, welcome. I'm guessing Monica. Yeah. Can I give my um, my two minutes to Deb so she can finish? Okay. De Debbie, are you there? Um, I need to find her. Give me a second. Debbie, are you there? Thank you, Monica. I appreciate that. Um, design thinking is central to all grade levels. And we know that the value given to students who use problem solving skills. Um, oops, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, oh, more of our programs are developing. Um, design is central to all grade levels. Okay, we have genius hour in many classrooms where students study and work on their own projects modeled after Google and 3M where 20% of the time, students' time is focused on uh, the needs that they decide and they want just like your individual um, preparation at the design deck. We have money granted from our budget to continue to grow our glows. On Thursday, June 9th, the board listened to the presentation of design tech who focus on GLOWS, but they need to grow their reach to students who speak second, second languages, mod severe special education students, low economic resilience students, one special education teacher, and 20,000 to an Eldorado charter cell, but will not meet the needs of 18% of the community special ed students. The California Department of Education ranks their high school as medium performing with the clientele that they serve, they should be rated as high performing. The school has no plan for bilingual supports and many Cordova High students earn state recognized bilingual program diplomas. They have zero students receiving this honor. The support systems are not built in into the plan to serve the needs of the students in our community. Our community is close so many students who go to the school and CHS to get local jobs and serve the community where they grow up. The financial impact will be devastating to the programs and will not help it. FCUSD achieve goals. A wise man told me once, the greatest competition is internal competition for growth. I challenge you, if you wanna make a change, make it internally for all of our students to benefit where you have the control and the say on how they learn. Thank you. Thank you. Next, um, next we have Zachary. Zachary, welcome. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Zachary Kaur. I'm actually uh, born and raised in Sacramento. I went to SCUSD and uh, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit of a story. So uh, when I first went to high school, my freshman year, I went to CK McClatchy. And to be honest, it really was not working out well for me. Uh, I was failing several classes. I was in the HISP program and it just wasn't good. Uh, my sophomore year, my parents transferred me to the Met Sacramento, which is a charter school. And things were vastly different. You know, I got bullied a little bit at McClatchy at the Met. People were nicer to me. Uh, the teachers were amazing. They actually cared about the students. 
in addition to that, their internship program provided valuable knowledge and skills that I actually currently use in my, in my job as an insurance broker. And uh, another noticeable change for me is I actually had a 2.4 GPA um, over there at McClatchy. And I went to the Met, I started doing better academically, and they helped me fulfill my A through G requirements and go to San Jose State University, where I graduated with a 3.3 and a degree in economics. Uh, in addition to this, I started up a, uh, a business of my own, which is called Collectible Coffee. And I've taken a lot of the skills I learned in high school, such as public speaking, you know, creativity, ingenuity, hard work, uh, entrepreneurship, all that good stuff. And I've been applying that to both my job, my career, my startup. And uh, I also learned the value of community service. Uh, recently, you know, I've been just dropping off water bottles to homeless people and doing all kinds of stuff like that. And to be honest, as a freshman at McClatchy, I really wasn't that into that. But once I went to the Met and they taught me about those important things, I was able to learn the value of that. And I love to help my local community. And so I saw this charter school up for, uh, you know, up on the chopping block here. And I said, you guys should definitely approve it. It's just a great thing for kids like me who really just don't fit in with a traditional high school. And uh, this kind of school would be really, really helpful. Anyway, have a great day. Thank you. Next, we have Meg. Welcome, Meg. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, I actually was going to do donate my time to Deb, but I don't think she needs it. So I just want to reference a comment that Mr. Hoover made um, just a little bit ago that, um, um, when he said that um, when we, FCUSD, finds that we're losing students to other schools or programs, we step up to the plate to meet that challenge. I am hopeful that this board will do the same and apply that, that, that thought process to our teachers' compensation and keeping our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next we have Rob. Welcome, Rob. Uh, good evening, President Reed, Dr. Collegian, and school board members. Um, like the 218 people who signed the, uh, the denial petition, which I believe uh, you have access to, I believe that Design Tech has um, unimpressive academic outcomes for low-income students, a poor track record for enrolling English learners, low-income and female students, fewer supports for vulnerable students, and, that, and I just particularly have to emphasize the diversity of needs in, in Rancho Cordova and, and how those supports are critical to the success of those students. And um, that there's a there will be a negative impact on our IB and CTE programs. Additionally, um, I know you are all committed to improving our district and strengthening our IB and CTE programs. So how do we do that? Um, well, we, we don't get better by reducing our resources, decreasing our student body, or having others provide redundant services. We get better like our students get better, by working smarter, harder, and doing it for ourselves. So let's focus on using our resources to build our competencies and our IB and CTE programs. CT, uh, CSEA asks that you deny the design tech petition. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Next, we have Claire. Welcome, Claire. Hi, um, Claire Crawford within the public interest. And in addition to the numerous and uh, well-detailed reasons for denial based on uh, fiscal impact, et cetera, that the staff report laid out, I do wanna um, clarify something about the educational outcomes data. Design Tech presented just the percentage of students that had gotten threes and fours on the CASP. So that's why their numbers look closer for socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Whereas the district presented the dashboard, which is a real snapshot of the whole school. And there's a 35 point difference between Rancho Cordova, between Cordova High School and Design Tech. Um, that's because almost 60% of socioeconomically disadvantaged students at Design Tech are at a level one, standards not met. These are 11th graders who have been at the school for three years and they're still at level one, standards not met. And this is with um, almost a million dollars a year going to the school in addition to their regular funding. 
it is absolutely the case that they're not serving as diverse and needy a population as Rancho Cordova. They made it clear why they want to locate in the Rancho Cordova community. It's because they want access to SB 740 funding and they need to be located in a low in the jurisdiction of a low in, predominantly low income elementary school. That's state law. Um, there's a high school three miles away from them that they keep referring to saying they're similar in diversity. There's another high school four miles away from them, almost the same distance, Redwood City High, with 81% low income students and 35% English learners. They're supposed to be engaged in design thinking and they cannot figure out how to enroll any of those students in their existing schools. They are not designing their schools to serve the students in Rancho Cordova that need the support. They have zero moderate severe disability students. They're not looking to serve these students that Rancho Cordova needs support for. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next we have Sumit. Welcome Sumit. Hi there, uh, my name is Sumit Jain. Um, I'm part of the engineering leadership team at Stripe. Uh, I also founded and ran a post-secondary school for engineers in Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm from San Diego. So I have learned some things about needing to know a community if you want to serve its students. I'm also a DTEC board member. I'm not a DTEC parent yet, I hope to be, but my daughter is a long way from that still. Uh, I wanted to comment because it sounds to me like perhaps the district staff and DTEC might have a path forward if they can work together to resolve some of their outstanding concerns. I would encourage them to do that, not to argue over whose school is better. Approaches to education are as diverse as the communities that they serve. If you've met the students from DTEC, you'll know that they have a joy, not just for learning, but for building, for changing enabling for challenging. I've seen students attend the school's board meetings to argue directly with Dr. Montgomery about a school policy and the ensuing conversation was a model of intelligent debate and respect. I would remind the board that the International Baccalaureate Program wasn't always the household name that it is today. Once upon a time, it began. DTEC and its Innovation Diploma Program are building something new to help young people and their families navigate a changing world. They're doing this with humility and agility. It's important work, and they're trying to do it as part of your community, not from outside of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, next we have Natalie. Welcome, Natalie. Hi, um, I've already sent an email to the board outlining all the reasons why I believe you should deny the petition for Design Tech. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to point out there's been some comments about the differences in demographics between Rancho Cordova and Redwood City, and I understand that. I agree that to a certain point we're talking about apples and oranges, but I would urge you not to dismiss those demographic differences because they really do matter. Um, somebody brought up earlier the A through G requirements and how many students at CHS are meeting A through G requirements. Um, and I wanna point out that 16.7% of our students are English learners, many of whom are newcomers to our country and therefore are still learning English when they are at our schools. We are a magnet for refugees. We provide services to um, all sorts of immigrant communities. And you know those go into our numbers too. And that's just something that um, Design Tech is not prepared to provide for our students. Um, and that's a huge gap in the services they have to offer our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Rush Kumar. I'm so sorry. Welcome. Uh, welcome Rush Kumar. Uh, um, uh, good evening. Um, so some DTEC students have asked me to relay a, a prepared statement on their behalf. Um, and my apologies if there's any uh, background noise. Um, they did not want to present it themselves because they had a fear of being uh, targeted, um, which is un unfortunately a real fear that um, people might have in this education system. But uh, uh, alas, um, I'll, I'll, I'll relay the, the statement now. DTEC is a poorly managed school that is severely lacking in multiple critical aspects. In regards to the quality of the school's education, it focuses little on teaching, and its grades uh, show this. Um, here are some statistics from uh, niche.com. 
DTAC has a 67% reading proficiency and a 47% mathematics proficiency. Only 78% of the school feels safe in the school environment. Only 61% are satisfied and feel happy in the school environment. In regards to the school policy, particularly when school is not in session. For example, multiple students have faced severe repercussions for social media posts that they made outside of class, despite these posts not breaking school rules and against legal precedent. For a school that preaches empathy, it doesn't really show any when it suspends people on a whim. This year alone, there have been at least six suspensions, all of which are overreactions to relatively mild issues. It should also be noted that many of these suspensions were left off the record of students. In regards to the administration, DTEC is an awful example of effective school management. The school consistently makes policy changes that are unpopular among students, misrepresents students, and overstep its authority on both school and non-school related matters. This is all done without the necessary research and over. Next we have Jennifer. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello. Um, I was there earlier, but sorry, my 14 year old and needed to go home. So um, as a parent of two future CHS students, I wonder what will happen to the IB program and the multiple academies at that site. I am one of those parents that shopped around for the best school for my kids. I had the choice to send my kid to Mather Heights or to our homeschool to Mather Heights or to Riverview because it was the first year Riverview was open when my daughter was going in. I ended up choosing the academy at Mather Heights and both of my kids tested in and got into that program. And um, we have continued with that high quality of education with my daughter completing the MYP program at Mitchell, attending zero period after the board removed the seven period day. And my daughter is looking forward to joining the agricultural program at Cordova High. My son is looking forward to going into the MYP program as he goes into the sixth grade and hopes to someday work in uh, get into the technology and business uh, program at Cordova High. This charter may destroy the hard work that has been put into the CHS programs. As a former CHS student myself, go class of 99, I want my alma mater to remain strong. Please vote no and keep CHS strong. Thank you. Next we have... Sorry. Next we have Sarah. Um, may I ask how many people we have? Uh, three after, two after Sarah. Two, okay. All right. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Good evening. I want to start again by saying once a Lancer, always a Lancer. Um, I grew up in Rancho Cordova, attended Cordova High School. Um, and I want to thank Deb and Tyler for everything that you said, because that's what I was going to say as well. Um, we're putting the fate of Rancho Cordova and Cordova High School students in the hands of board members who do not represent Rancho Cordova schools. You may represent the whole district, but your area is in Folsom. On the Saturday board meeting, there was a presentation about the amazing things that are currently happening at Cordova High School, Mills, Riverview, and all the other Rancho Cordova schools. Please remember that all the amazing things that you said about the Rancho Cordova schools, like their sports programs, um, Cordova High School, baseball, soccer, volleyball, basketball, swim, golf. Now they're wanting to start a water polo club. Um, we have culinary, the medical programs, the CPE programs, and do not forget the big red music machine. We have concert band, band, orchestra, color guard, jazz band, marching band, guitar. These are all amazing programs that we already have. Please remember that you all are making a decision for students that are not in your area. You are making a decision for Rancho Cordova students. We have a traditional school, an online academy, and even a homeschool within our district. With all these amazing programs, please remember your students first and the community that you serve before voting on this charter. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, next we have Courtney. Welcome, Courtney. Hi, thank you. Um, I did not plan on speaking, but after listening to others speak, I felt the need to. I am a teacher in Folsom Cordova. I have been teaching in the district for about six years. Uh, my first year I taught in Twin Rivers and I moved to Folsom Cordova and taught at Cordova Villa for three before I transferred to Natoma Station. 
So I have had the pleasure of working on both sides of the district. And as someone who has worked on both sides of the district, I know the importance of knowing your community and knowing their needs. Um, hearing that the charter does not have experience working with students that are of the needs of our Rancho Cordova students is very concerning. I live in this community. I live in Rancho Cordova. When I have children, my children will be going to these schools. And it is very concerning as a teacher and as an educator of someone who's of schools that I've, um, that are in Rancho Cordova, that these, the school will not be able to provide what our community needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed, we have one more hand go up. I'm sorry, what's that? There was one more hand that was raised after I gave you my final count. Okay. Go ahead and call. What, yeah. 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 Ashley? Welcome, Ashley. I, I just wanted to donate the rest of the time to Raj Kumar if he's still there to finish his letter from the students at DTEC. Mr. Reed? Yeah, if he's there. Okay. Let me find him. Uh, you... Hello, I'm sorry. Was I cut off by any chance? Yes, you have two minutes. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I'll continue the, the statement from the, the, the students. Um, so uh, I believe I left off from the student records. Um, Are, are you still there? Oh, well, no, we lost them. Yeah, that's what I thought. Ashley, do you know what happened? Well, actually, we're going to have, uh, let, let's end the public hearing. We, we have uh, in the discussion item, uh, so um, uh, by uh, unanimous consent, unless there's an objection, we're ending the public hearing. So even though this guy... We have public comment on the next. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. All right. Um, Moving on to item 12 and the agenda discussion action. Uh, item A, approve or deny a design tech high school Rancho Cordova charter petition. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, and in this um, actual agenda item, we have a, a resolution that we are presenting that supports staff's finding on denial of the petition based on the significant um, discrepancies that we found in the petition. So we'd like the board to um, consider that resolution for action. All right, we're gonna take uh, um, comments from the board and then public comment. When we get to public comment, we're just gonna do a minute because we don't have the time. Um, Mr. Hoey. Thank you, I appreciate everybody's time tonight and the work that's been put into this, uh, both from Design Tech and from the district staff. Uh, I'll just say right up front, it's my hope that Design Tech is approved tonight uh, and that this school is seen as a partner and not a threat. Uh, I don't think design tech being successful necessarily means that Cordova High School will fail. Uh, one school succeeding, I think actually may instead be good for all of the schools in our district. Uh, I do think design tech offers our district something we do not have currently and will be beneficial to many students and families. The educational model design tech offers is different than what any one school in FCUFD, FCUSD offers. Design tech would offer a system that has the potential to meet the needs of students that the traditional system might not currently serve. From what we've heard tonight, it sounds like one of our biggest fears would be design tech actually working. Uh, I just wanna say what that would mean is that we would have as many as 600 students excelling at one school, design tech, while we continue to pour into students at Cordova High. Uh, I fundamentally disagree that one school succeeding will necessarily decimate the other. Uh, so I do plan on voting yes tonight. Mr. Short. 
Uh, well, I, I've been on this board for 20 years, and I, I heard a lot, and I've seen a lot. And I'm just kind of disheartened that we're at this stage in the game of looking at charters. Nothing against charters. I, I am for charters. We have charters. I've talked about dependent versus independent. There are charters that will fit into our community as we seek. Um, so I want to, to, to the board to really think about before they make these huge decisions. We had a workshop just recently, and we all agreed that we wanted to expand uh, opportunities in school choice for all our kids with, within uh, expanding our CTE programs, our academies. And we, we had a great presentation and we discovered that most of the community, because of COVID, we've been closed, that most of the folks that were in pro want, charter don't even realize what we have being offered here. So we haven't even had the chance to um, uh, get our word out on a lot of new folks moving into the community that these are the type of school choices we have. And that is a school choice, STEM education school choice, all the academies are school choice, all the schools within a school is a school choice. So we keep hearing school choice, which parents are ones that are gonna make those decisions. I didn't see any community here when Garrett was talking here. He's correct. 90% of the community is not for this. Hey, he represents Rancho Cordova. He is Rancho Cordova. He's telling us directly, it doesn't fit in our community. We have three board members here. We were for local control. We were for area district uh, to do representation of boards being elected. We have three Folsom board members that don't understand our Rancho Cordova schools. They haven't lived and breathed in that area. They don't know our kids. Not like Garrett does, like I do, or Chris Clark knows. If you really support area representation, we have two Rancho Cordova representatives right here that are telling everybody right now, this is not a fit for our kids and for our district at this point. You should respect that. You should listen to that. I, I'm, I'm to telling you. So I'm just getting a little irritated because I, a lot of things that we did over the years, external competition is why we grew it. I was part of that, the STEM education, the academies. We been years doing that and the staff stepped up and did all the work and to make this a great district. We talked for years, we're going good to great. We're a great district right now. Comparing whatever, we have critical thinking, we have design. I'm an engineer, right? I went to UC Davis. I went through all those. I had teach. I learned engineering from Denton Grant. It changes all the time, but you just have to teach critical thinking. Design is critical thinking. It's solving problems. We do that. It's that simple. You know, so having another charter coming here is, is, is it's dichotomous to us even thinking that we're going to expand Rancho Cordova, do all these things for our kids, and then we're over here, oh, let's put a charter in here, two charters, that might take $40 million away, hypothetically in five years, and completely undermine all the work we've taken up for the last two decades. It's appalling. It's appalling to me that we have teachers in here, like Garrett said, crying that we, we need to support them. If we, if we vote on this tonight to approve it, we don't, it's saying a message to our teachers and our staff that we don't value them for all the hard work they've done and for all the things we've done. $14 million in grant money. That was amazing what the staff is doing. We should show that, that we value them, that we want to continue to be innovative and, and, and ourselves become critical thinkers and be the leaders that we should be, not depend on outside charter. That is not even from an elected officials. We are elected. To, to, to represent our areas and represent our parents and our kids. This is about our kids and our kids. If you even look at the area that they're the proposing, Cordova Villa, you're gonna look at Cordova, Cordova, uh, Cordova, Cordova Villa, and Navigator. If you, and, and then uh, uh, just a st stones away is gonna be the next Charter Pacific. That is put there because of SB 40. They're just gonna completely siphon off that whole area and it's gonna happen. It's going to happen. We're going to have school closures, layoffs. We're going to have all this. This is going to happen in two years. There's a fiscal cliff. So why are we even talking about this? You know, if we want to get political about it, yeah, we have GOP. We have Republicans on this thing. I, I don't want to talk about that. But yeah, if you want to talk about school choice, we are a school choice. We, we provide the best we can. And sorry, I'm getting a little bit, but I have more that we should, the board, I question the board not the people here. You know, we have a fiscal responsibility. 
That is our biggest responsibility. We do need to think about that. We, we, we really do. We're going to be on fiscal problems. I've been through hard times and had to make layoffs. At school. That is not a fun thing to happen. Laying off people, giving pink slips to teachers and tell them, sorry. And, and it's horrible to watch that. You're going to be in that position in just a couple of years. Why, did approve, why would the board approve a deficient thing? Are we going to set the bar really low by accepting deficiencies in a petition? It's incumbent upon the applicant to, to fix those. In. They can come back. They can do whatever. But let's see how they fix them. Let's have more information. Let's see the actual community come over here and support it. Garrett can go out there and say, or the chamber, hey, what, what, hey, let's get this people together. And, hey, let's see if this really is for a fit for it. But we're going to have a few people here make that decision. We don't have the people out here. That's insane. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. Why? You know, um, ADA funding. Yeah, we talk about funding. It's taxpayers' money. It's, it, we pay for that. We we're supposed to represent taxpayer. They don't. They have some board members from the Bay Area, from Google or whatever. They don't. They're going to take the money and they're going to spend the money and they're going to represent things. They got five years to do it. We have very little oversight and little control. We lose local control. So, so we talk about family choice. Do we really? They, you know, I hear Diane saying that they, they went out to the community and they, they only been members of the chamber only for four months. They went to iFest, a couple of festivals, had a couple of luncheons. Do you call that really knowing the community? Have you walked that area? Did you go knock on the doors in those apartment complexes? You did? You did. You did. Okay. In the Cordova Villa area? Cordova Villa area? You did? Um, I went to the areas you, felt, you felt safe? I went to the areas with someone else. You, you don't know the area, do you? Okay, I'm just asking if you walked it yes, by yourself. Okay. I, I have point of order. It, it, I, what I'm saying is that this this area, Probably yeah, just this go. area is. I'm, I'm I'm just asking. I'm sorry. I'm not going no, go to. Let's it. not have. It's that. a very poor area that doesn't represent our our kids. It doesn't rep anything they do in our community. So I want the board to understand that the comparison is needs to be done. It is. They don't represent. They're only point nine. It does. And the equity issue on this thing is very difficult. So the board really needs to listen to the Rancho representation and listen to the voices of the people. That's us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark. OK. Um, actually, Mr. Short kind of, I share the same sentiment that he does. But I, you know, I love my kids at Cordova. I go there three times a year. Um, no, Cordova maybe four or five times a year. I hang out with them. I have lunch with them. I go to Cordova Villa probably about three or four times a year. I know that community. Now, you just said that you walked around the middle school. There's no middle school around there. There's not. But I'm just saying, those kids, a, the demographics there are so different. Trust me, I know. I've spent the last six and a half years, I mean, I've been on a streak. I have visited every school at least three times since I've been on this board, a year. So I understand it. And my focus is in Rancho Cordova. As a matter of fact, we talk about areas. Cordova is in my area. And I'm proud of those kids. I love those kids to death. Let me give you some numbers or some programs, career-related program. Career College Ready Program, International Baccalaureate, California State Phil of Biliteracy. We have 64 of them. Nine of them spoke multiple languages, more than just Spanish. They spoke French, Armenian, Russian. Uh, California Scholarship Federation Life members, California State Phil of Civic Engagement. Golden State Merit Diploma. And let's talk about CTE especially those careers that may go away or change due to technology. Agriculture Academy, uh, Engineering Academy, Business Academy, uh, Education Academy. I want my kids to maybe be a teacher and come back and, you know, be a leader in their district and be a teacher in their own right. You know, pay it back. 
Uh, and then career technical construction. You know, we had all that. We still have it. But what got me, what really got me, is when I looked at that and I honed in on that page and they talked about may happen, may not happen, uh, the dissolvement of junior ROTC for those military career-minded kids, the dissolvement of uh, the IB program, which filters down to the MYP program, which I don't understand why we would actually extend a seven period only to know that there's a charter coming in. I mean, what is it worth? What is it worth? And then we had, we had two special board meetings. The first one in January was, oh, we're going to focus on Rancho schools. We're going to put STEAM and STEM programs. We're going to build up these schools. And then we had this great presentation in June. And then I even heard a board member say, yeah, go Cordova, go Rancho. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues what happened to that because now we're entertaining a charter school coming in that one, I don't believe that you are going to take care of my mod severe babies. I believe that you're not going to take care of them. I also believe you're not going to take care of our social economically disadvantaged kids. I don't believe you're going to take care of our homeless kids. That matters to me. That matters to this community. That matters to Rancho Cordova. Will it be taken care of? Absolutely. We've got the staff. We've got the resources. We've got teachers that speak multiple languages to take care of those EL students. I'm going to tell you this, the VAPA program. Every six weeks, I guess that's cool, but what if somebody wanted to go into journalism? Don't tell me it's going to be automated. It's not. It's here to stay. So, I'm, and I'm thinking about those other ones. I mean, these other programs that these kids are focused on. Yeah, they're not going to all go to a four-year college. I mean, I was blessed to go because, you know, the military paid for it. But some of these kids would just want to look for a trade, not something that, in the hearing that, oh, well, you know, it'll be all automated by then or it may go away in 10 years. That's discouraging for a kid to hear. It's discouraging for me to hear. It is. Now, maybe we can work together. And, and for the record, I am not knocking your school. I think it would be a great fit, but not in Area 4, not in Rancho Cordova. I don't think it would be. Maybe up the hill, it might. I mean, there's some programs that you can offer up there. But in Rancho Cordova, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to support the um, staff recommendation on it just for those simple facts that I named. Um, like I said, I was just concerned about the elimination of programs. And what if this program doesn't work out? And these kids kind of got into it, and now they want to go back, and guess what? No IB, no junior ROTC, none of that exists anymore. And I don't want to see it go away. I'm sorry, I have supported those programs. I fought for those programs. And like I said, the challenge for, these, for my colleagues on this board, start visiting schools. Start talking to the students. Visit those communities, especially around Cordova Villa. I know them. And it's not even in my area. But I take the time to get to know them. So moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and uh, support uh, staff's recommendation. Mr. Hoover. Um, just to clarify, uh, this is questions. Questions, comments. Then we have public comment. Public comment. Then we go back to public, or then we go back to board comments. If there's correct? any final comments. I will, I will save my comments for after public comment. And um, oh, do I have a comment now? Oh, that's tempting. Um, I, you know, I didn't do this very gently last time, so I will do better this time. But I just, again, to this concept that, first of all, when we went to district-based elections in this district, um, one of the reasons I didn't like it, and by we were forced to, so I'm not blaming this board. I mean, we were sued, but, uh, and, you know, a lot of the cities around us are, are going that direction too, but um, one of the reasons I didn't like it 
was because at that time I said and I warned that this creates a permanent minority representation for Rancho Cordova. That's why I had a problem with district-based elections. Now, we didn't have a lot of choice uh, because of the situation we were in. But the reality is, is that that was exactly the situation that I wanted to avoid. Because before, when we were in at-large districts, we had the potential of five Folsom board members. We had the potential of five Rancho Cordova board members. So, you know, first of all, <laughs> um, none of us came up with that idea to split the district three, two, like it is now. And I actually agree with you, uh, and with my, my Mr. Short, that that is a problem. Um, but as I did last time, I will nicely this time point out that the voters of Rancho Cordova elected everyone on this board except for one. And uh, that, is, and we, this board, maybe not a future board, but this board fully represents and was elected by the voters of Rancho Cordova. I just want that to be clear. Um, so uh, I will save the rest of my comments for after, uh, um, after public comment, thank you. Um. I'll say my comments as well. Uh, let's get to public comments. Uh, we're going to do just a minute. Uh, yeah, one minute. Uh, we have uh, Tyler Johnstone followed by <laughs> Dominic uh, Council. Count okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you a doctor? No. <laughs> Good evening again. Um, do what's best for the students. The students of Rancho Cordova are asking you this. Uh, we've talked about representation. We've made comments on what we're already doing. Um, it, this is why you're on the school board, to do what's best for the families of Rancho Cordova. We've had students from the school tell you it's not a good fit. We've had the city council representative tell you it's not a good fit. Pacific Charter School brought a lot of representation. That's not here. Mm -hmm. There's not support for this petition right now. And so for you to go ahead and support the petition, I'm not concerned about them winning. Like, yeah, it'd be great again if students succeed. I'm concerned about them failing as they brought up. And so I'm wondering what happens. And there's not a plan for that. And I'm also concerned that there's any way that taking students out of Cordova High doesn't hurt Cordova High. It will. And if you don't understand that, reassess. Dominic, followed by Casey Shingera. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. It came to mind. We had a couple of members of the public today, and I really appreciate their comments. One was from uh, the, the Met High School, which is a dependent uh, school in Sac City Unified. The other, uh, she is a woman, she sends her child to the Mandarin Immersion School, which is a dependent in Buckeye, right? You as a board have the ability to give direction and to create schools that fit uh, different student needs. That's your ability as an elected school board. You have that power. You don't need to give it away to someone else, right? People who aren't accountable to the voters. But Finally, there's the idea of one size doesn't fit all, which I think we all agree with. But we can also look at the petition as presented and see who this size does not fit. It does not fit homeless students. They don't have any homeless students. It doesn't fit mod severe students. It doesn't fit students whose you know parents aren't able to drive them to work. It doesn't fit students who are learning a language uh, and their, their primary language is a language other than Spanish. Right? We know that this size will not fit those students. We don't need to guess, right? Thank you. Thank you. Casey? The fear, as you call it, Mr. Hui, is not that Design Tech will succeed. The fear is a charter that will not serve this community. The fear is they do not fit. The fear is unproven track records with CASP. The fear is our students who are experiencing homelessness, are socioeconomically disadvantaged, are English learners and or have IEPs will be lost in this school. The fear is that our quality investments in Cordova High, its people, its students, its programs will suffer. The fear is that some of you don't know all that we already have and are building at Cordova High. 
I fear your resistance to supporting and celebrating who and what we already are and have. I fear you're not listening to your Rancho Cordova voices. Thank you. Online? Yes, we have Stacy. How, how many how many people online? Who currently, Mr. Reed? Okay. Welcome, Stacy. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so again, once a Lancer, always a Lancer, most spirited class of 2005 here. I am a community member and a parent of students who attend Rancho Cordova schools, unlike board members who are in favor of design tech. Let's not take the money and attention away from CHS. Please listen to the community members and Rancho Cordova board members. Please vote to deny design tech tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Faith. Welcome, Faith. Hello, I've emailed you already, but I wanted to reaffirm that we already have California Partnership Academies. They are a school, could you hear me there? Yes. Sorry. We hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so California Partnership Academies are a school within a school. That means that we have an English, a science, and a social science teacher partnered with a CTE teacher. We get $75,000 per academy to support students. It's based in ed code. We already have the ed code. We have to do an annual report every year that validates that we are doing the work. We're doing the work already. My academy students, when they graduate, can earn up to thir 13 units of college credit. All of my courses are A to G, and they have the opportunity to get all the other A to G courses. I have nine of my seniors. One third of my seniors are currently employed on Sunrise Boulevard in manufacturing internships because I took them there in a van. So don't take that away. Say no. Thank you. Mr. Reed, we have two more hands. All right, and that'll be it. Okay. Right. Sarah? Welcome, Sarah. Welcome. Again, it's a little late, but once an answer, always an answer. Um, the comment that was just made saying that Rancho Cordova vo uh, voters voted for this board, um, you may be correct. So with that being said, 90% of your community is saying no. Please listen to your constituents and vote no on this charter. Next, we have Courtney. Welcome, Courtney. Hello again. I just want to re reiterate the importance that um, as a teacher who's taught on both sides of this district, it is important that you know what your students need. And um, the Cordova side has a vastly different um, need than the Folsom side. And as our, our uh, board members that have um, visited those schools, um, I'm sure that they can agree with me that those needs are very different. And um, I think we need to be considering those things when we are making the decision as to whether or not a charter school that does not have experience with students of um, these needs. Um, so I, I really, would like you guys to take that into consideration. We are your teachers. We are your community members. Thank you. All right. Uh, back to the board. Um, any final comments? Mr. Hoover, you wanted to wait. I mean, yeah, if anyone else has any. Or All right. Any? Yeah, I can go. All right. Doesn't matter. Oh, go ahead. Follow you. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, a lot to say. So, and it's getting late. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate everyone that came and spoke, both in support and in opposition. I appreciate all of the emails that we received on both sides as well. Um, I would certainly say that I've talked to a lot of folks that in Rancho Cordova that are very interested in, in this school. But um, I also understand that there are people in the community that uh, uh, do not support the idea of it uh, being placed in the community. Um, I just want to start my comments um, by reading the first paragraph of the California Charter Schools Act, um, which 
I will point out, had bipartisan support in the early 90s when it passed. It was passed by both Republicans and Democrats, so no, this is not a partisan issue. Um, but the, the California Charter Schools Act, when it was passed, stated uh, that the chartering authority, or the school district, shall be guided by the intent of the legislature that charter schools are and should be an integral part of the California educational system and that establishment of charter schools should be encouraged. Now, of course, it is our job as a school district to make sure that any charter school that ever submitted a petition to this district uh, met the standards that we wanted to see, absolutely. And after having the privilege of actually touring Design Tech, which I, um, I, a lot of us did in this room, and actually getting to walk through the halls of Design Tech, uh, walk into the classrooms of Design Tech, talk to the students that attend Design Tech, talk to the alumni that graduated from Design Tech and went on to do amazing things, which by the way, was one of the most diverse group of students that you would ever see, that alumni group that spoke to us. Um, I, I can tell you, and you can tell by the feeling in the room, and every teacher in this room can attest to this, when your students are thriving, when your students are learning, there is energy and there is energy at Design Tech. Um, and so first of all, I would encourage anyone to really uh, talk to the actual students that have experienced this. Um, what's so amazing about the program as we were shown is that they do tailor, they do tailor the educational model to the student directly. And, and, it, and, and it unlocks the potential of those students. But I wanna address something else tonight that, you know, it kind of just makes me sad um, because, well, first of all, I'm just going to say that the families in Rancho Cordova love their kids. The families in Rancho Cordova want what is best for their kids, whether it's college or career. The families in Rancho Cordova want to see their students succeed. And tonight, there were a lot of things said, um, but there was this implication that we should not approve this charter school because kids in Rancho Cordova don't go to college or because we don't have the kind of kids in this community that can meet A through G requirements. Or this implication that families are not capable enough or do not have the ability to figure out how to get their children to a school that might provide a better opportunity or a better fit for their child. And that implication is sad, it's offensive, and honestly, it severely underestimates the parents in the Rancho community. It is the job of an educator not to tailor an educational program to the expectations that society places on their students, but to unlock the potential that their students didn't even know they had. They do this with high expectations not by writing kids off because of their socioeconomic status or the community that they grew up in. And by the way, earlier tonight, we passed something on consent. And I wanna thank our staff because last meeting, we talked about our mission statement in Folsom Cordova. And I brought up that we had taken out this sentence about high expectations. And I appreciate and thank our staff for putting back in a sentence into our mission statement that we approved earlier tonight mm -hmm. to lead it off that says FCUSD is committed to providing excellence in educational programs that carry high expectations for each student's success. That is why we're on this board. That is why our educators educate. That is the standard that we are held to. We are going to hold all of our students to high expectations. And Rancho Cordova students are no different. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. It was, it was um, is that, are we good? Okay. Um, it's interesting because with that in mind, I think, uh, you know, there, there isn't a lot of data. There aren't a lot of years of data to really look at the comparison between schools. And honestly, I do agree that it's difficult to compare apples and oranges. But it's interesting because if you looked, if Cordova High School 
was applying to be a charter school today, and they had submitted a petition to this board, um, there are absolutely statistics that you could that staff could pull from to determine and show where Cordova High School is falling short, whether it's A and G completion rate, whether it's UC acceptance rate. And those aren't necessarily fair, but the point is, is that there are always going to be things that we can cherry pick and say, we're basically asking for a charter school to be some sort of unicorn that meets all of every student's need and is completely perfect. I can tell you from actually getting to walk through those halls that the students in their school love learning and that their students are succeeding. And I, I also wanna point out that, you know, Mayor Gatewood is absolutely right because Rancho Cordova schools need to be our top priority. And I agree with him that this charter school is not the solution for all of our students. In fact, it couldn't fit all of our students if it wanted to. But here's the reality. Every time we get a charter school petition submitted in this district, our district starts to innovate. I actually agree with uh, uh, one of the final speakers here at the microphone, uh, the CSEA rep, um, it is our, our purview to do that. And the board president here has been advocating since he was elected in 2018 for unique educational models within our district purview, small educational systems that we can send our kids to and where they can get a more tailored educational experience. Not a single thing has been done on those proposals. Not once has district staff ever ever moved forward with any of those ideas. And so you're absolutely right. But the reality is, is that's not happening. And the other reality is, is that innovation comes from being challenged. It doesn't just appear out of thin air. You can look at it as competition, or you can see it as an opportunity for collaboration. If this charter is approved, we don't just throw up our hands and let them take all of our students. That's not what we're gonna do. What are we gonna do? We're gonna innovate, we're gonna improve our programs, and we're gonna make sure that we lose as few students as possible. That's what we need to do. And we may even learn a few things along the way from design tech. Um, just to hit on a few topics to close uh, here, if um, voluntary enrollment, I mean, this is a voluntary enrollment school and it seems like we always, every uh, opposition speaker seems to forget this sometimes. That if, if a student wants programs that Design Tech doesn't offer, their parents aren't gonna send their kids to that school. And this actually kind of reinforces the point that Design Tech is not here to take our students. They're here to offer a targeted program that meets the needs of um, students who may benefit from their model, but they're not trying to be all things to all people, which is precisely what makes them unique. Um, the, uh, the second piece is accountability. No other public educational institution has the same level of accountability as a charter school. That's the reality. If our schools fail in five years, they don't have to come back to this board and ask to keep keep uh, being, stay open. They don't have to do that. They don't have to become reauthorized. A charter school every five years has to come back to this board, go through reauthorization or, re or uh, revocation proceedings, and they have to justify continuing their operation in our district every five years. What other public school in our system has accountability mechanisms like that? None. But accountability also goes both ways. We as a school district also need accountability and there is no better public accountability system than charter public schools. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is school choice. And as, uh, you know, I'll just say it, many of the kids from up the hill, as my colleague from Rancho Cordova put it, many of them have the privilege of school choice because many of them have the income to move to a community that has high performing traditional public schools, or they have the income to send their kids to a private school. The reality is, is that every student or family with means has school choice by default because they have the resources that they need to go to any school that they want. The kids, so many of our kids in Rancho Cordova 
do not have that privilege. And this is an opportunity for them to get a different educational model that might better serve their needs in a free public school. And so I would encourage my colleagues to support this petition tonight. Um, and I'll close with that. All right. Um, you know, given the hour, uh, I could probably talk for a, little, a while. Uh, President, hopefully I will be allowed okay. some time to talk. Go ahead. Um, it won't be long, trust me. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify something. I didn't uh, say that none of our Cordova kids would ever go to college or have an opportunity. If that was the case, I wouldn't offer a scholarship to those kids every year that I do. Um, it's great that board member Hoover has gone to this high school and talked to the students and felt the energy. But the one thing I will ask is, or anybody on the board is, again, have you gone to Cordova and talked to those students and actually felt their energy? That should be the main focus, our Cordova kids, not kids that are down in the Bay Area. I mean, what about our kids here? Something that we need to think about. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's great heck. I wish I could have went down there and, and, and talked to them. Um, I did want to comment on the Alliance, uh, that organization that you said you can connect me with. They're in Oakland. I'm not interested. I looked it up. So if you can send me the link, that's fine. But I was like, okay, I'm going to look for this organization because me knowing nonprofits and been in the nonprofit field for, gosh, probably close to 30 years, I would have heard about this group. And I mean, with me working with that risk youth, especially our African-American men, yeah, I would have heard about it. But send me the link. Email it to me. I mean, I just looked it up online. I, I didn't see anything. I saw a health care facility in Minnesota and, and then the, Alli the Alliance in Oakland. So if there's one closer, please, I mean, let me know. But again, you know, we're trying to struggle to, and God knows I, I want nothing but the best for our teachers. And the last thing that I want to see is if this thing goes south and we start losing funding and students and closing down schools, we lose teachers. And right now, I want to see our teachers taken care of. Yeah, I said that. It's, it's public record now. I want to see our uh, classified staff taken care of. We're not going to be taking care of them, folks. We're going to be closing down a facility. And guess what? Yeah, maybe another charter will come in. And, and this is not the uh, end of charter schools. We are a solvent district with a positive certification. We are an easy target for any charter to come in. And mark my words, in the next two or three years, they'll be here. They'll be here. We'll see them. And hell, you never know. They might, it might be one that I may support because I am not, you know, anti-charter, no matter what you heard. I'm not because I know there's been talk out there. I'm not. I mean, we have a charter in Rancho. Uh, heck, I've got kids on my caseload at work that go to charters. I'm not anti-charter. I just believe that this charter will not work in Rancho, an area that I'm familiar with, that I get to hang out in all the time. So that's my two cents. Yes. Comments. Uh, I just want to follow up with Ms. Clark's comments. I just want to make my final comments. Um, be quick. Uh, you know, I, I just want to respond to Mr. Hoover. I think, you know, everybody can interpret the Charter Act as I've done a lot of research on it. The Act does not talk about what's a good fit for a community. It does state, stipulate in the laws, uh, the guidelines that our attorney gives us that we have findings and deficiencies. We have deficiencies. So if we approve this Charter Act, it's, we're setting the bar really low, you guys. You know, they can come back and fix those deficiencies. And 
maybe answer more of the questions and get more information or maybe make those deficiencies. So I think we should trust the process. Um, but Rancho Cordova has, you know, just like I said, we have different charters out there. I think Rancho Cordova is looking for different charters. I know Garrett, you and I have talked about different charters out there, different schools within schools, different things we can do for those kids out there. This one is just not the fit for what type of kids we have in our area and the community that wants. There's no support right now. I don't see anybody out here supporting it. Matter of fact, we have a petition here of almost 220 folks and uh, teachers and protest against it. We have a, a, a it's on file right now. And it's given to the superintendent. So innovation district, you're talking about challenges when I was on this board, what caused us to improve? I'm going to say it was external charger charters, not putting somebody within in your house that had, creates ex internal competition. Dr. Deming and high quality management, if you read that book on 14 quality management, if you bring in internal competition, it's a kiss of death. That is a fact. That man's famous for helping global economies. So if you want put it that way, but we don't play by the same playing field, the same rules as charters do. They do exempt from everything. We have to apply for a lot of different rules. So it's not a playing, uh, same playing field. It's not fair. Accountability goes to fiscal solvency. We are, the school board here is responsible. We are accountable. We have to be certified, just like Mr. Clark said. If we don't in two years, we can go into receivership and guess what, the state takes over and each one of these board members are gone. They have no power. That's gone. Look at Sac City, what's going through right now. They went through this whole charter thing and they've been struggling ever since and they're at the border going bankrupt. That's, you could just right here, right across me. So with that, I would support that the board really not deny and take the recommendations and let's trust the, the process. They can always come back. That's it, and deny. Thank you. Uh, this is our last board meeting of the school year, and we still have other items on this agenda we have to get through. So while I would love to be able to explain my vote, I'm not going to. Uh, I would be more than happy to sit down uh, over coffee with anybody who would like to chat with me. Um, I apologize, I don't have an opportunity to tell you uh, my thought process right now. Um, but I will say that um, I would be willing to support this charter Provided that we condition it with an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and I would insist on eight elements being included in that Memorandum of Understanding, including a preference uh, to students that reside in Rancho Cordova, um, identifying an acceptable location for the campus, uh, language requiring similar or higher testing scores uh, uh, to Cordova High School, uh, language addressing special education requirements, language requiring a local representative on the design tech board, language requiring all teachers to be credentialed, uh, a requirement, um, a recruitment plan to encourage diversity of applicants, and details related to the reporting and, uh, and FCSD oversight roles. Um, if uh, the applicant isn't interested in those eight uh, uh, items, then I will vote against it. Uh, if they're willing to uh, entertain those eight items, then I'll vote for it, assuming that I have board members that would go along with that. Can we, can we hear from the applicant if they're willing? Well, let's let's take a, they they don't have to sign the MOU, so let's just go forward. Uh, either let's someone make a motion to support or oppose, and uh, I'll make a motion, motion to support uh, with the the eight, with the the eight, eight uh, items on the MOU you mentioned. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. All right. Um, Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? No. Mr. Short? No. Mr. Hooley? Yes. Uh, motion for the eight items on the MOU carries three, two. All right, uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, 
approve special education local plan area SELPA, um, superintendent. Yeah, this is following the public hearing, defining what this SELPA plan is in program and services and budget. And with your approval, we get it in place for the next year. Any discussion? All right, any public comment? Any online? Hearing none, back to the board. Is I'll motion, move it. Motion by second. Mr. Clark, second by Mr. Hoover. Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Hui. Aye. Motion carries, 5 vote. thank you. All right, uh, agenda item uh, 13, discussion, overview of Measure M projects and financing, Superintendent. Yes, this item's coming back to the board as a request to look at our SFID3 projects, which we spent time at our June 4th workshop doing so, and the financing models and mechanisms that we have. And we've got our um, financial advisors from KNN Financial. Um, Danielle Arruda is here in person, and then we've got Joanna Bose virtually with us. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Martin will be tag teaming with uh, Ms. Arruda. Yes, we, we had a, a presentation all planned out for you guys, but uh, to con be concise with time, I think um, I'm actually going to probably take the lead on it. But Danielle is here to answer specific questions. Joanna is also available. But I think at this point, um, we're going to really just get it down to the, to the nuts and bolts of the conversation. Um, at the June 4th meeting, we discussed the projects, outstanding construction projects that had been identified. And so now we just really want to talk about the financing mechanism, one of the three primary ports, uh, I'm sorry, uh, primary items that we, we are financing our projects through. One of the things that we really wanted to do, and it was actually a, a conversation early on in my time here, was that um, we, we wanted to really understand what dollars we have available in conjunction with the state funding and developer fees for the projects that we have uh, identified, at least for the next 10 years. Um, additionally, there was requests uh, from uh, local developers that we want to work as partners with on kind of what were our plans, what do we think the tax rate would be, and we didn't really have a, a great mechanism to do that. And so what we've been doing is working with KNN and Danielle uh, and uh, Joanna have helped us create a more or less a kind of a calculator that will allow us to kind of see where we are and help plan for the future. Now, just like the multi-year projection, this is more of a compass, right? It's giving it because there are so many factors involved and it's much more complicated even than the, the budget when it comes to new home developments and what the assessed value rates will become and uh, how many homes will be sold and all of the things. And then, of course, what will the costs be for the projects that we're developing? And I know Matt spent quite a bit of time with, with the board discussing that on the meeting on the 4th, right? So just, just we have some overviews, but we've already discussed this. This was kind of more for the audience in general. So we're just going to skip through kind of talking about what SFID3 is. But really, it's the area south of 50, the new construction area. And Measure M overlaps with SFID3. Um, there we are, are two other SFIDs, and just just to remember, SFID are specific zoned areas that the district has created for um, going out for individual bonds or debt service. So um, there is some overlap with them, and that's why it looks like a hodgepodge up there on that first uh, um, map there. So, um, <clears throat> so th the next slide here just talks about what Measure M was. It was a proposition that was passed. Uh, 750 million dollars of bonding authority um, and so at this point we have um, I believe we have about 500 yeah 545 million remaining uh, to uh, to issue out and we've issued approximately 200 million a little over 200 million dollars of the dollars so far so that's kind of where we are and then this just has the information related to that um, this is a list of the expenditures that we've we've actually spent to date. So we've spent uh, about 125 million of the work. The big projects that would be identified is the Mangini Ranch project, which was about 65 million, um, and then the Education Service Center, the building, beautiful building you're in now, which was about 35 million dollars. Uh, you can see a list of a lot of a lot of these projects. Believe it or not, are are related to soft costs. Um, it costs a lot to do the preliminary planning, the development, all the designs. And so you see that for, for different projects. It, the, some of it, like the Mather High location and Boris Creek Middle, we don't talk about those sites because that, those were originally, when the bond was originally passed, that was the area that was supposed to be developed out first. 
And so the, those dollars and projects were, were way back in, in the, you know, 2000, what, 12 or, or earlier than that, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was it, 2008? 2005. 2008, yeah. And so the, we started spending money very early on to start building out because we anticipated um, construction happening out there and homes being built and, and that never occurred. And that's a common theme that you'll see with this is there's a, again, with the assumptions, we didn't assume that there was going to be a housing bubble, right? And a recession. We didn't assume that COVID would happen. And so all of those things really impact uh, the planning that we, you know, we, we strategically do with financial advisors and with the developers and, you know, all of those things. And so we have to keep that in mind. Um, Oversight-wise, I uh, just want to speak to the fact that we have all of these uh, annual reviews, disclosures that are, we're required to do. And one of the things that I, I, I'm very proud that was in, and this was obviously in place initially when the bond was passed, is that we actually uh, voluntarily decided to put in an oversight, uh, more or less a, a citizen's bond oversight committee, like you have to do with a Prop 39 bond. Um, this is not a Prop 39 bond, but we still put that in place. And I, I want to recognize that the district decided to do that to make sure that we have as much transparency as possible and oversight of our taxpayers in our community. So, um, The purpose of the model, I, I kind of spoke about it already, is that it allows us to put in the projects that we have, our current debt, what we assume uh, factors for assessed value, and then that will then hopefully allow us to know kind of timeline of when we need the next dollars based off the projects and the matching funds from all those different pots. And then what we hopefully will see as a potential tax rate. And that could help us then determine um, also, you know, foreseen into the future, if we think that we are in a place where maybe we want to hold or we may want to move forward sooner, uh, depending on, on all of those factors, right? Because it's not just one. There's so many different factors that are involved in there. And when we're talking about the timeline on this, we're talking about 30 plus years, right, when we're issuing some of these debt. So there is a lot of different pieces and 1% over 30 years adds up to a lot of different money, one way or the other, either positive, at, you know, increase in uh, assessed value or negatively in when we show what our, our coupon rates are going to, you know, our premiums are going to be, our, our costs are going to be associated with bond issuance and then all of the debt associated with it, right? So it can go in multiple areas. And so it, it, the, it says a, it, on this next slide, it says the model split into three distinct areas. Our funding sources, the money that is coming in. Again, that's those three different areas we talked about. Uh, project expenditures, which we, we have a list of project expenditures. In fact, they're right there. And then the debt service and tax rates. So those, those are all the factors that we're talking about in this. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's actually a, a very weighty document. We worked with, um, I, I want to recognize Jerry and Matt and the team working with um, KNN to, to create this document. And so, you know, we're presenting this out to the board. So, I, Mr. President, I actually have a lot of questions on this, but I, I would like to email them if possible. Of course. Uh, but I would like to go to public comment too, because there's, you know. Yeah, what I was going to suggest is, you know, this is a wealth of information. I think it's worthy of a further dialogue. Um, it was presented. We have uh, two months to read it over, or a month and a half before our next board meeting. I would like to see this back on the agenda, but I want to respect the folks that you know, who want to speak. Um, and so we'll give them two minutes to speak. Uh, uh, Roberto uh, Aragon. Good evening, uh, President Reed, members of the board. Rob Aragon with uh, Westland Capital Partners and Folsom Ranch, um, and uh, Dr. Kligan. Thank you for your for your time. It is late. I, I I literally just have a couple of quick comments for you. One is, you know, the oversight committee that's been highlighted, Measure M Oversight Committee. It really is a tool for you to help with this process. I'd encourage it. I I, I really think. <clears throat> that if you sit down and bring the community together, bring some talent together to help kind of guide this conversation so that it doesn't kind of get kind of unwieldy, it would be really a big thing and would be very helpful. To my knowledge, I don't think that that Measure M Oversight Committee has really kind of been meeting. And to the extent we could get that group meeting, um, I'm happy to participate and help and provide that guidance and absorption and details about how development is occurring. That's That's, you know, a recommendation. One of the things that we also noted that's lacking in this information that would be helpful is um, the the financing pieces. There's really three three legs to this stool, right? You've got the SFID bonds, you've have 
fees coming in from the development community, the builder community, and you have the state component. Those are the three legs. We really need to get those working because right now it feels like there's only one or one of those are working and that's this SFID bond. And plus you have collected, I'm going to speculate close to $40 million in, in fees. We really need to figure out how to get that state piece to work with us together. We've got some $1 billion worth of schools on this list, $340 million in high schools, 250 in middle schools. Candidly, it's unheard of. I'm building in multiple jurisdictions and it's unheard of. Um, finally, one quick one, keep meeting with the BIA. We're a part of this process. We want to work with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody? No. Nope. All right. Um, can, that, can I suggest that we move improve your tomorrow? Do do improve your tomorrow next, so we can hear from our uh, speakers. Or okay, um, is, is that okay? I don't know if the yeah. board objects to that, but all right. Um, all right. So uh, improve improve your tomorrow. Yeah, they've been here all day. Oh. Yes, we'll, we'll invite Michael Lynch and Michael Casper to the podium and thank them for being here tonight. They are uh, the, the two folks from Improve Your Tomorrow that have been working with our uh, middle schools and high schools in Rancho Cordova. Wow. Um, just completed uh, pretty much the first year of implementation because COVID, <laughs> the COVID year didn't really count. So I'm going to turn it over to both Michaels. Welcome. And my sincere apologies. I didn't realize we had um, people in the audience that were waiting to speak on this. I would have probably taken you a long time ago. <laughs> okay. It's part, of, it's part of the job sometimes. Uh, well, look, thank you all so much for hearing about our, our first year and right, the, the work that we've done. Um, I'm Michael Lynch. I serve as the co-founder and CEO of Improve Your Tomorrow. And good evening. My name is uh, Mike Casper. I'm the co-founder and COO. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that I'm... Uh, when it comes to Folsom Cordova Unified, it's a special place in that I went to um, Cordova Middles, um, Cordova Meadows, forgive me, and Mills Middles School as well. So thank you all for um, for the time. I, we have some packets for you all that has all the information that we'll go over today and some additional information as well. Um, uh, but improve your tomorrow. We are a college access, thank you, college access and completion program. Our mission is to help get young men of color to and through college our values are resilient, authenticity, and passionate. And what makes us unique is the long-term commitment. So our brothers are within IYT for up to 12 years, starting as early as seventh um, grade in middle school. They participate in IYT College Academy, and then they matriculate into um, our feeder high school, which is Cordova. Um, and then from there, they go into one of two pathways. Some of our brothers elect to go to a community college right out of high school. Others go straight into a four-year uh, university and we have partnerships with Sac State, UC Davis, also Humboldt State um, to where we have MOUs to where we serve students uh, because we know some of the support mechanisms that they need in order to uh, matriculate through high school, middle school, high school. They also need those same support mechanisms when it comes to uh, higher ed. And then one final thing is we have um, a mentor fellowship program. We're really big on um, teaching our young men about service and the importance of coming back to your community is very similar to me. I was fortunate. I had some people that was able to pour in um, uh, to my life personally, and it brought the best out of me when it came to just the potential that I had, but I just wasn't applying it. Um, so we do that through the Mentor Fellowship. So students that, or brothers that go through um, Cordova, go to a lo local community college, we'll bring them back on, hire them as um, as mentors, and then we also oftentimes place them in the, the schools in which they graduated from, so middle schools and high schools. Um, so a little bit about um, what we do, so our inputs. Uh, this slide outlines the, the seven core services. The first one is, um, is mentorship. So we meet with students um, typically every, twice a month. It's a pull-out method. I'll have another slide that will kind of outline what we do during the day and after school. Um, but during these sessions, we're talking to young people. First, we always do a wellness check-in, followed by um, where the young people are at in respect way? to... Um, Oh, that's okay. In respect to uh, their academic goals, um, the next one is member development. So these take place in the after school space. We're real big on the holistic approach. We want our young men to be sound academically, but we want them just to be well rounded young men. So we talk about toxic masculinity. We talk about the importance of um, 
brotherhood and ensuring that they don't just um, achieve success on their own, but how do they look for opportunities to reach back and bring others along? College advising is a huge component. College trips. We had uh, Mitchell and Cordova. They both went to Stanford this past year. Mills uh, brothers went to Chico. Parent engagement, um, tutoring. Again, that often that off, that all also happens in the after school space. And this kind of gives a high level overview of what's taking place. So during the school, again, that's when we're doing our pull out, the mentorship sessions, uh, the student development, and then after school again, wellness workshops. Um, uh, offering tutoring support, et cetera. And then on the weekends, again, the college trips. We also do community service activities. We weren't able to do it um, this year, but we'll have two opportunities this upcoming year. So what's important too is just our, our target market. We want to be able to allocate the additional resources that, that we're given. Resources is really around people um, for those students that need it the most. So Majority of our students, when they enroll into the program, they have a below a 2.0 GPA. We want the brothers that have behavior and attendance issues, and we you know, want students that aren't on track, as far as high school students aren't on track, to graduate high school and go on um, to college. Because we know it's not because of a lack of uh, potential, but oftentimes it's a lack of motivation or resources, exposure, et cetera. So how do we have students enroll into the program? We work alongside with um, our um, principals at all the different sites and counselors at being able to identify um, students. Uh, we provide them with a list. They then uh, allow us to pull out the students. We pitch them this idea and we ask them if they want college to be a part of their future and, and if they want help in being able to do so. So for this uh, academic year, these are um, the students we were contracted to serve. So 60 students at Cordova, 20 students at um, Mills and 20 students at, at Mitchell, so a total of 100 students. Over the course of the year, we served 127 students. At the conclusion of the year, we ended up with 92 students. We had a 73% um, retention rate, which is common the first year as we're trying to build culture on campus and really trying to redefine what's cool, right? Um, I'm going to pass it over to Mike for these last couple slides. Yeah, so what Casper talking about, you know, we, we focus on young people often like the most disengaged within a school setting. You, you all heard lots of presentations about young people and how young people uh, evolve and react and fresh. And we focus not on young men of color, but young men of color are often at the bottom third of a graduating class. So for us, year one and uh, year one this year, our first year being here within this district was all about like relationships. And we talk about, you know, like what we measure because you can imagine when you get a 15 year old who has a 1.2 uh, not going to school as often or ending up in the principal's office little too often, there's a, there's a series of relationships that have to take place to build the trust that you need between both right, our team and a young person and their family to move them to be A through G ready, to move them right to be prepared for college and want to be doing. So year one is about building relationships and we measure that through, uh, through a survey. Year two is when we focus on attendance and behavior. You know, those are, those are key. If you keep getting kicked out of the class, if you, keep, if you keep leaving math one, then you're probably going to not get the grade you need to go to math two. You know? So for us, it's about helping to change those behaviors in year two. Then year three is academic success. You know, our GPA, and we, we run programming all across Northern California. This year we serve about 3,000 young men of color across about 15 districts now. And our data tells us, so listen, we'll, we'll see the most academic gains after four semesters of participation within IYT. Our program is all about dosage and duration. So we need you not only to attend, but it but IYT works over a long period of time, given just the the the, the type of young people that we that we serve. So real quickly, here is so what we what we do every single year is this member satisfaction survey, and, and this is big for year one because for us it tells us a story about uh, the young people's interactions with both our team, how they feel within school, and their projections on how life. You know, so this is just a brief brief survey. And I won't. This is just a brief uh, demographics on the data, but important questions are you know first one is since taking part in IYT. Uh, 
how since taking part in IYT, my academic confidence has improved. And for us, you know, 74% says that they agree or strongly agreed. Second question was taking part in IYT, attending college has become a reality. That you know, that you know, for young men of color who often don't see it within the classroom, it's not as easy as you know, like I'm going to be there. You know, so for that one, 75% would strongly agree, uh, agree or strongly agree. And there were some other you know, highlights. You know, a big part is you know when you take part in IYT. We make a difference in your community. Casper talking about his story. You know, growing up within this district. You know, my story. Growing up within Sacramento, stock and communities that can be challenged, and we want to implant service. So, and that's a big part for us. And you know, over half of our young people start to think about service differently now because of IYT. And the last slide, and before we close off, and like a big part of before we can get a young person to move into a direction of academic excellence, they have to believe. You know, oftentimes our young people will believe in their athletic abilities more than their ability within the classroom. And we go through a process of changing that, that narrative. And that was a big one for us. You know, that was this year's 73% of our young people took the survey agreed or strongly agreed with that. And that was a big part of getting them to move from just seeing themselves as an athlete or whatever else that society will say that like can or can or could be to being a scholar we want them to be I'll just end with this you know we had uh, we had a phenomenal opportunity every year through uh, right through our brotherhood conference to be able to get young people to attend uh, you know our brotherhood conference at the Golden One Arena so it's a fantastic opportunity where we get to introduce our uh, our Cordova Mills and Meadow brother to the rest of the IYT family and for us you know seeing 400 young people from all across the city and county joining and uh, joining around a common mission of, of, of a college education. And that is not always present within our community. So, you know, we are, um, despite the challenges that we face within this year one, we are appreciative of the opportunity to continue to serve, to continue to get better, and continue to work towards the goals of this board. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Yes. Oh, by the way, congratulations. Oh, thank you. No, you're welcome, sir. I love the program. I, I love what you guys are doing. I just had a couple of questions, especially with the college. Are, are you working with any other organizations, like maybe you can with Dr. Alan Rowe? Yeah, so we don't have any uh, direct partnerships with UCAN, but we do have partnerships on like Sac State's campus. We have a, we have a physical program on campus called IYTU on Sac State and UC Davis. The Sac City is that with Michael Benjamin? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, perfect. It, it, okay. Yes, we do work with Michael Benjamin. Right, great, great guy. And, yeah. And, and we have for our college completion program, and we have a we have a program at Sac State, UC Davis, and Cal Poly Humboldt. And Cal Poly Humboldt is a guaranteed admissions program. So. Oh, okay. You meet uh, these. Bench, you meet. You, you come close to A through G ready, and you have a 2.0 through IYTU. You are guaranteed admissions to uh, to Humboldt State. Okay, I was just wondering if you had worked with any other organizations like, um, I'm thinking Voices of Youth with Barry Axius. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good. I'm glad that you're making that connection, especially for our boys at Cordova. An another question I had to ask is, um, what's our budget? Are we paying, how much are we paying for this? I'm just curious. Yeah, so in year one, it's a, it was $1,000 per student, so... For the 100 students, 100,000. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. All right, that's all I had. I'll be incredibly quick. I appreciate you guys being here, especially so late and waiting for this. Uh, and thanks for the work you're doing on our campuses. Uh, I did notice there are some sixth graders, it looks like. Is that on a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, we've had some, some teachers say, hey, is there any way? And, and we've done it at previous campuses as well. Um, typically, it's just seventh graders, but yeah, we'll we'll always have room if you know teachers are really really adamant and advocate um, to where we'll accept them. Yeah, great. Okay, well, uh, I'll just again make it quick and wrap it up. Saying you know it's it's exciting. Now there's 100 students that are uh, being impacted and mentored. Uh, I'm looking forward next year to seeing kind of what retention there is uh, with the students that you have been working with, um, and it sounds like in year two where. Uh, hopefully we can see some get to that fourth semester and see what we have. So thank you guys. Uh, sorry for the late hour. I uh, love what you guys do. I'd say more, but um, I think it's been said tonight and uh, hope you get that runoff. Me. <laughs> Thanks, 
Yeah, you know, I, I was excited when we when we, um, we first uh, approved this program, I, and I'm really excited to see what happens in the, the second and third year. Um, and uh, I, I assume, Superintendent, that we will have additional follow-ups. Uh, but let's get it early on the agenda. That's a little lighter so that we can get more detail and ask more questions. But um, this, sounds, this is such a wonderful program, and I'm, I'm very excited to see um, the results uh, as we uh, end year two and, and then year three. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we'll... we'll We'll have an open house in the fall, and we you know we'd love yeah. to have you all out to come. I'd love to out, check yeah. out IYT. Thank you. Please be sure to send that my way, and I'll make sure we've got the information out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Thank uh, you guys. Okay. So, uh, just uh, superintendent on item B: status of naming of the new elementary school in Folsom planning area. There wasn't any uh, action on that. Uh, was there any direction that you were looking for? Mm -hmm. It was just uh, coming back with the um, who we wanted to recommend to be on the committee. So we'd be seeking um, membership from the committees there in, a, in addition to the Historical Society from Folsom. I think you had mentioned that at one point. Yeah, I, I, you know, um, when, when we drafted or when I drafted the, the new um, revised policy on that, I, I really was envisioning that we would have at least two members from the Historical, uh, S Historical Society. And since this is being located in Folsom, I would love to see two members from the Folsom Historical Society or um, there may be, I think there's two different um, historical societies. So maybe one from both um, uh, uh, on there, in addition to the, the individuals that you've identified. And we'll go ahead and get that timeline moving then. Mr. Washburn has that mapped out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else on there? No. All right. Uh, and then the dashboard, is that something we can do in August? Actually, this one has to be done before the end of June. Okay, so, all right. Um, let's, Ms. Let's Cabrera is going to do it very quickly. <laughs> I also want to thank the board for approving the LCAP tonight, which was part of the consent agenda. That's, that's a huge <laughs> guiding document. Good evening again. And I'm going to try to say names without messing up um, this, at this late hour. Uh, President Reed, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Kligian, and my esteemed colleagues, thank you for having me. I promise not to take a long time. I know we've, that you have the information before you. It's not that I'm rushing, it's that I know you have it. But for the purposes of uh, the LCAP, this is something that we do need to provide as a discussion option. And so with that, I'm just gonna dive right in um, and um, get started. So. It's the local performance indicators. Those of us who have uh, seen these before, you normally might have seen them around December. So I'm going to explain a little bit of why, why it's different this year and where this point takes us next to. All right, next slide. Uh, oh, I have a clicker. Elena, next slide. <laughs> I'll just give myself directions. How about that? Um, elements informing the LCAP, basically the timeline that you see here, you, as, as was mentioned by Dr. Kaligan, we did adopt the LCAP. We also adopted the federal LCAP. Uh, I, I know that you know this, but as a reminder, the LCAP is um, our state funding, and then the federal LCAP addendum is the federal dollars. So there's two actual LCAPs included in this, and there's other components as well. Um, what we're looking at today is the local indicators, and um, those are the measures that we self measure okay so base uh, just what you see here and i won't read all of it but the state indicators uh, are there are 10 eight of them are uh, the responsibility of the districts four of those are measurements that come on that dashboard now we know that with the pandemic we haven't seen test scores like because of the suspensions of CASP and and all of that but those measures are, those priorities are indicated there. Those are state measures that will be reported by the state. The local indicators are those that we provide measures for, and that's the ones I'm going to be speaking to today. This is another visual so you can see kind of the division of what's state and what's local determined. You'll see that um, the local determined um, indicators are listed to the right column. Again, I'm happy to read more closely, but I think you can see it as well. Um, and you can definitely ask questions, so I'll move on. 
Um, this is the timeline that um, was made reference um, when, when was asked um, if this could be put off for later. There's a time that that's, uh, basically says at the bottom center of that page is that we need to report the local indicator results this year to the local governing board and the body at the same um, public meeting at which the LCAP is adopted, which is today. Um, the timeline basically was uh, was changed. Um, we're trying to align. So basically the dashboard reporting window will open in August and it will close in the end of September, okay? And as you know, that's when we should be getting data. So we do our local um, measures first and we'll get the state. And then the dashboard for 2022 is expected to be published December, 2022. So we should be, we, we won't see the same color grid as before because we don't have two years of comparison, but we will see a more robust dashboard. Most recently, the last two years, you've seen graduation rates um, and CTE completion rates, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to go over these again. Um, one of the priorities we need to respond to is basic services. This is um, making sure that all students in our district and other districts have appropriately credentialed teachers. We have zero misassignments, even with our teacher shortage. Uh, I know HR and schools and our leaders have done a great job recruiting appropriately credentialed teachers. I know we had a, a number of emergency credentialed, but that still is a credentialed teacher. Percent of students with, uh, without access um, to their own copies of standards aligned instructional materials was zero. All of our students have access to material. In fact, some have them at home as well. And then lastly, our facilities um, that, were in, that did not meet good repair None, all of our facilities meet good repair. And there's many components to this, so more details on the report if needed, okay? So next slide. Priority two, and these are some considerations that I do invite you to read more closely. Um, some considerations we had to uh, we had to look at as equity considerations are a big key factor now with the indicators, and ensuring that um, not only our facilities are clean and that our books are available and that our teachers are credential, but they are that we are uh, representing demographic needs that we are partnering. Um, some of these. Uh, considerations are listed here. So I do invite you to re read those and review those and, and, um, and ask questions of us as needed, okay? Priority two is uh, essentially the implementation of the state standards. We measure the state standards with CAS, but we, we're asking ourselves as a district how we are doing with the implementation of these standards. So overall, FCUSD, the summary of progress is that we rated most of our areas at full implementation or higher with the other adoptions rated to be an initial development. And um, there's varying degrees. Um, the f one would be the, um, we are exploring something. That would be normally during a pilot year. We are not in a pilot on any of our content areas in this last year. Two is beginning development. That often happens right after we've begun a not an adoption process. Three is an initial, maybe in the early stages of an initial adoption. And then four is a full implementation. Five is full implementation and sustainability. So as noted here, our summary of progress is at full implementation or higher. Most of our adoptions um, have been around for uh, three to five, even more years. Okay. Next slide. Um, again, there were some equity considerations here. Um, I'll let you uh, ask questions on those as, as you uh, review them. Um, priority three is the parent involvement and family engagement. We, um, not only for the LCAP, but for many things, including, as you can tell, for the requirements of charters, how important it is that we engage our um, educational partners. And a big focus is our parent. Educational partners is our teacher leaders, our classified leaders, our administrative leaders as well. But it's really an emphasis on our parents and being actively um, uh, in engaging not only their efforts, but us connecting, uh, them connecting with us and being available. So we do utilize our school site councils, our ELACs, our DLAC, and our district advisory committee, our CAC, to gather this information. So I will take a minute to review those because that's um, some notes that I have. The very first part um, 
on building relationships, some notes were to continue to provide direct outreach to underrepresented groups, meet them where they are, and build trust, allow authentic feedback, and create a safe space for honest dialogue and exchange for ideas through parent summits, ELAC school site council, DAC, CACs. Create a welcoming learning environment and provide translations and childcare as needed. So that was what was noted in building relationships. Under building partnerships for student outcomes, um, the information was to continue to focus on to continue focused and active participation and those committees noted above and build trust to understand that with the school and families develop ongoing training and build capacity to integrate resources and support and the last one is seeking input which is to again focused outreach and creating affinity group space for dialogue bridge resources and have staff to go staff go to parents provide data and create opportunities to show progress their students have made and lastly identify with families what they they think works and what doesn't and what next steps make sense so that's the feedback on priority three and um, school climate um, a lot of our feedback here comes from our Cal schools you can see the data noted here percentages um, are carrying school um, adults at school those were areas that were looked at and we also we look at data we look at meaning so what does that data need uh, mean to us and then lastly how do we use that data and I think that's that's worthy of me uh, mentioning uh, FCUSD has been using panorama uh, education to monitor overall student well-being so we take that data we also take a closer look at Dr. Ayana Peace has been walking us through that process and then student information is then analyzed in order so that we can take action and improve outcomes so that's our priority six and again equity considerations for that um, take a look at those there's mentions of cultural identity bias empathy and other important features to pay attention to to respond last priority course access um, really uh, intentional here course access is really about not just having courses but having students of all kinds have access to those courses so uh, looked, really taking a deeper dive at grades and schedules, um, things like CTE, um, AP, A through G, IB, the enrollment process and the completion rates are things that we look and measure, um, take a look at. Um, we also um, try to discover ways to remove barriers such as staffing shortages, student mobility, some of those things are not always within our control, but we have to be active in, um, in collecting that information and, and figuring out how those barriers can be removed and then also providing support classes for students such as English learners and those with disabilities um, so that they can fully um, access those classes um, with support and then um, course prerequisites students failings and having the opportunity to re retake classes is important that we um, monitor the this again not the support but also the um, the response to students who need it and lastly how we address barriers we're looking um, not only looking there's active work in equitable grading more inclusive practices uh, we provide uh, frequent support and interventions and increased counseling support and then lastly we are partnerships that support students with college and career readiness activities as you've heard some of them but those have been going on as well so again um, equity considerations and um, basically always asking our supports taking students away from the classroom we want to make sure that those equity considerations and the access keeps them in the classroom as much as possible so they can get that first instruction and that's my presentation thank you for your patience any questions 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 no. just real quick how are we um how do we measure parent engagement like what are some of the things that we we look for there um there's multiple ways i mean obviously one of the things would be participation physical participation they're active um you know uh, with i don't even want to go into the pandemic and how we didn't have volunteers right. but how parents can be involved the other okay. one is surveys um, we by law have to have um, parent surveys <laughs> annually for title one and title three reasons so what i've done and many have done is we survey parents and there are specific questions we ask about the student learning student attendance information they want to know more about so they provide us with those topics okay, so great. those are things that awesome. how we measure thank okay. you mm -hmm. good question all right um public comment 
Oh. On the, the last course access slide there, I um, really want to commend the district that we're doing on CTE and AP and IB for all of our students. Right. All of our students are included in that. Um, we've done a lot with support classes. We've had funding the last couple of years to have more intervention classes. We have English and, and math intervention classes, multiple teachers teaching those. Those are the programs that we have at our schools that serve all our students that smaller schools don't have the resources for. And so when we're thinking about how we go forward, it's important that we keep our funding to keep those things because those are the programs that unfortunately We've been around this district a while um, that we've been laid off and we've laid off teachers that teach our intervention classes and we lose those things when funding goes away. So it's really important that we focus on those and celebrate successes that they are now and see what can we do to keep them going as we go forward. Thank you for that. It's fantastic. I know that we've all had the opportunity to witness students that come in as immigrants or have struggled and they come and share their stories and it's through the access opportunities that we have in our district. We know that we have room to grow and improve, but we have some successes and I really appreciate that. So, yeah. All right. Um, that finishes the discussion items information. You have that there for your reference. Um, Superintendent's report. Uh, Mr. President, yes. we've exceeded the 12 a.m. Uh, threshold. I need to make a motion that we extend the meeting. Uh, under the bylaws, we can't extend oh. more than one time. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we're just rolling along with well, everything. Well, I huh? mean, we got all of the action items were done before midnight. So, um, okay. we're, we're not taking any votes for the. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, superintendent's report. Just very quickly, um, we had our staff attend the Rancho Cordova Business Expo today and did uh, uh, our own Folsom Cordova recruitment effort with HR, communications team, transportation, food service, expanded learning, and student care. And we, we were able to um, put uh, applications in a lot of people's hands today. So hopefully that will help with uh, our recruitment effort. Awesome. Uh, let's see, uh, board member reports, uh, Mr. Hooley, Mr. Short, Mr. Clark. Um, yeah, I want to say congratulations to all of our summer school participants. I had an opportunity to visit Cordova Villa, Ranch Cordova Elementary, Peter J. Shields and Williamson during the uh, course of the program. Very impressed. And uh, with the students and as well as the teachers uh, who, um, you know, actually gave up their time. Well, they didn't give up their time, but they were actually glad to be there and, and work with the students. Uh, looks like in about eight hours from now, I'll be delivering a keynote address at Cordova High's graduation for summer school. And then uh, I'll follow up with the keynote address at Folsom High at 1130, if I make it, right? So that's it for me. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoover? No report tonight. And no report from myself. Uh, item uh, 17, advanced planning. You got the next uh, board meeting is August 11th, 2022. Hope everybody has a nice summer. Mr. Uh, President, if yes. I can make a request on the advanced planning uh, that we uh, get blessings in a backpack in to do a presentation on the families that they're serving in Rancho Cordova and the, uh, I believe, Theodore Judah and, F and Folsom. Um, any other suggested future board items under C? No. Nope. All right. Uh, none from myself. Uh, I hate to do this, but um, we need probably 10 minutes in closed session. There, for the public's benefit, there's no votes or anything going on in closed session. We just have to finish the topic that we started um, at uh, right, um, between five and six. Uh, so we'll be back out in probably 10 minutes uh, to gavel out. So uh, we are adjourned to closed session.
session. Um, uh, Superintendent, anything to report out? No action to report out. Okay. Um, uh, I just simply say, uh, again, I apologize to the public for the late meetings. Uh, two of the agenda items we were statutorily required to, or actually three of the items we were statutorily required to uh, take up tonight. Um, uh, so uh, I guess it is what it is. So um, uh, by uh, unanimous consent, unless there's an objection, we're adjourned. <laughs>